Good morning, my name is Rachel Gowers. I'm Executive Dean of Business, Tourism and Creative Industries. Um, I've been with the university just over three months now and it's uh, it's been a whirlwind. It's been a very interesting three months, um, but very exciting and an amazing team that I've come into. So, so a big thank you to everyone that's welcomed me with open arms into the university and, uh, and thank you for making my first three months so enjoyable. And I'd like to welcome you all now to UCB's sixth annual Institute of Travel and Tourism Future U Conference. Um, as an ITT Centre of Excellence, UCB is proud to host this year's event with the support of ITT and various industry experts. I'd like to especially thank Richard Bain and, Sa and Sabath Shazia for all their hard work in organising this event, as well as our great industry participants. It's now over a year since the world has been thrown into turmoil with lockdowns, travel restrictions and border closures from this global but invisible threat. Many industries have been drastically impacted by COVID-19 and none more so than the travel, tourism, hospitality and events industries. Accordingly, many destinations and industry operators have launched smart and innovative practices to secure more domestic and virtual tourists, whilst working with bodies to shape, shape the destination narratives about the safety of travel and tourism. However, the significant reduction of international travel over the last year by about £1 billion, according to the latest UN World Tourism Organization figures, has invariably led to concerns over the future of these industries. But travel and tourism has faced many crises over the last 20 years. And although COVID-19 may be viewed as one of the most significant crisis events since modern travel began in the 1950s, the industry is resilient and it will return much stronger than ever. Hope is on the horizon with the incredible vaccine rollouts. Not surprisingly, our graduates may feel daunted about their prospects within these uncertain times. That is why, that is why it's so critical to host such events where industry speakers will discuss opportunities for graduates as well as provide them with guidance on getting ahead. As Mar Marcel Prow stated, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. This quote is even more pertinent than ever as we travel through uncertain times, but with hope and opportunities. I'd like now to introduce Claire Steiner from the Institute of Travel and Tourism, who has been a great friend to UCB for a number of years. Claire will host today's event and provide her own expert guidance about navigating your careers through these very uncertain times. Thank you and welcome, Claire. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel. And can I say, we're so pleased that we can still, despite everything, be with you guys at UCB today. So thank you very much to um, Ricky and to Sabath and to you for allowing us to host this today, albeit virtually this time. So um, welcome, everybody. It's great to be here and see you all, um, well, virtually, as they say. And this is, um, this is our second Future You of 2021, um, which we're really pleased um, to be here with you, as I keep saying so. Anyway, what I want to just quickly do is just take you through a little bit about Future You and the ITT. Many of you will have, um, will have been to this event before, but for some of you, this will be your first. So I thought I'd just do a little bit of an introduction in the first place. Can everyone see my screen? No, am I doing that right? I'm hoping you can see that. Yes. It's all good, Claire. It's all good. Perfect. Great. Great. Good. Fine. Phew. Yeah, it's, gone, it's gone off again now. It was on the mute ago. It was, um, it was on, then it was off. That's fine. Don't worry. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I am the um, chairman of the Education and Training Committee for the Institute of Travel and Tourism in the UK, and I also am a director, and I've been doing this now for 16 years, which seems like a hugely long time to most of you, but feels like a flash in the pan to me, and I've loved every minute of it, and I'm hoping to continue doing it for, for many more times. In my day job, I'm actually an HR and training professional, so I actually work with a range of companies across the tourism, aviation, and hospitality space, and also things like the um, tech space as well. And I go in at different levels, helping source people um, 
um, so provide the HR services to all of these companies and help them grow and develop. And it's been a particularly challenging time, obviously, in the last 12 months, and HR has had to deal with so many unusual um, I guess, sort of situations that we never had had before. For, so, for instance, this time last year, who had heard of furlough? Not a single person. I certainly hadn't heard of it in the context that we all now know. And very quickly, I had to learn and adapt, um, as many people have done. So it's been a challenging time for all of us um, in, in the UK and around the world. And 2021 itself, um, we'll, we'll, we will be looking to get a lot better. We are very hopeful now with the vaccine rollout going so incredibly well in the UK, and we need to be very proud of that. And also a huge amount of work is being done behind the scenes to get travel moving again. We'll hear from a number of people this morning about this, but make no doubt to all of you that are worried about the future of this amazing industry that we work in, we will be back and we will be back stronger. If history has taught us anything, thing is that people love to travel be it for business or for leisure or for going to visit friends and families around the world and travel and that enables us to not only understand and get to meet people from different cultures but it it really brings together us as a global community so it's incredibly important to us that we get travel moving as quickly again i for one cannot wait to jump on a plane or on a boat or on a train and get moving because i'm sure like all of you i'm slightly bored with the four walls of my home so ITT Future U, um, we've been going now since 2009, and we are enormously proud of this, um, of this initiative, which started at World Travel Market all those years ago. Since then, we've developed a number of different things. Um, we have our ITT Student Awards, which we've now renamed the ITT Future U Awards, and these are currently live for this year. I do urge all of you that are interested to visit our website, have a look, see, um, learn about the awards and see if any of you want to actually put yourselves forward for it and talk to your, your tutors and your lecturers about it. We obviously in the last 12 months have been doing these roadshows on a virtual basis and we've had some amazing support from the industry. And that's one thing we're really finding is that industry is still really keen to talk to and, and spend time um, promoting themselves with careers and opportunities for you, the next generation of, of the travel and tourism sector. Last year, we held our first International Future You Careers Conference. We did this in line with Travel Massive, <clears throat> which is a huge global platform, and you'll hear a little bit about that later. And we were, again, really, really proud of this. It was the first time we'd done anything at this scale. But during the course of the day, we had over 60 speakers um, on a number of different panels. We had a hugely diverse range of speakers, which is one of our big focuses at Future U. And we covered all sorts of different, um, of different types of um, things that, such as career changes or what graduate skills you would need. So I would really urge you, if you can, to go to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We launched it shortly after the conference and we have all the different sessions from that conference actually on the YouTube channel. But since then, we've also done an awful lot of other video content, including a number of things like Spotlight On, various people in the industry. And you'll also see some, um, uh, some interviews with some senior people and this will continue to grow. So really great, <coughs> excuse me, a really great source for just some bits of information about different types of careers and advice that you can get from the range of people who work in our wonderful sector. And we also have our very own first Future Year Apprentice Ambassador, and she's been responsible for doing some of the video content. So we've really managed to use this year to reset, reevaluate, and grow the Future You, and this will only continue, and we're very excited about the future. So as I said, we started uh, in 2009, it's been now classed as pretty much the annual student travel and tourism conference in the UK. And we've actually taken it global through the relationship we have with the Global Travel and Tourism Partnership, of which I am the UK director. And last year and, and a couple of years ago, we've held events in Kenya, in Moscow, and also in Sao Paulo and Brazil. And we've got some more coming up over the next 12 months, including our first one in Ireland. So again, hugely exciting stuff. The whole idea behind Future You is to give you an insight, <coughs> excuse me, into um, our wonderful industry. 
and hear from a range of different speakers who will give you ideas, maybe about careers you hadn't considered, and hopefully inspire you and encourage you to continue your journey into this amazing industry. You will also get some tips, and I'm sure you'll hear from mistakes that people have made, and we've all done it. And this is all about helping you in your future career in the industry. So if you want to follow us, please do. Um, I do urge you, we are on um, Twitter, we're on uh, Instagram, we're on LinkedIn, um, and we're also on Facebook. Um, and as I said, also the Future You YouTube channel. So today we've got some amazing speakers and we'll also have chances for you to do some Q&A as well. So please feel free to use the chat facility, which I'm sure you're all very used to by now. Um, and I'm delighted to start this morning off with our very first speaker. Uh, Nick Hall is the founder and CEO of the Digital Tourism Think Tank. <coughs> Think Tank. And Nick, I hope you are with us today. Nick? Yes. Uh, hello. Nice to, nice to meet you. <laughs> and good to be here with everybody. It's great to meet you too, Nick. Apologies for the frog in my throat this morning. Oh, not even uh, not even obvious to me. So <laughs> you're sounding you're sounding pretty good. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so I'll kick off. I do believe I should see a share option on the screen, which I don't uh, currently have. Uh, but as soon as I have that, um, I will be happy to share my screen and jump into what I'm going to talk about today. So if it's good for you, I can kick off and we can get started. Hi, Nick. I've just got a new presenter. You should be able to share your screen now. Yes, I can. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Okay, Thank so uh, let me just, uh, well, I will open what I'm going to open in just a minute so I can talk to you face to face first. And just to say, um, well, I'm really pleased to, to be joining you today. I did speak at a separate conference that was organized by UCB uh, last, um, during the summer, uh, the early part of summer before everyone was out of lockdown. And of course, um, you know, it goes without saying that this year has been really, really challenging for everybody. And uh, just to echo what we've heard already, this must be a very daunting uh, moment to be, um, to be studying, uh, to be thinking about graduation and to be thinking about your career. And of course, you know, you may be uh, surely asking yourselves, have I made the right decision? Um, is the industry that I want to go into even going to exist when I'm ready for it? And, you know, what, what does that mean for my opportunities? Um, does it mean there's limitations? Does it mean that things are going to be more challenging? I hope that I'm going to be able to answer uh, some of those questions um, that I'm sure you have. This, today, I decided to put together an interactive mural. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about how we work and how we interact with the global tourism industry. So I've just shared a link here. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about um, what we do, whilst those who want to join interactively and really, really participate in this can click and open it up. Um, so just a quick recommendation, if you are gonna join me on this interactive mural, you don't have to because I will share it on the screen, uh, open that up in Google Chrome, and that's gonna give you the best experience. And then uh, I can see already a lot of people are joining. And then I'm going to uh, share the screen anyway, so if you don't, don't worry. But this is going to be a really great way for us to talk to each other and interact. And it also shows you a little bit about how we work professionally. So maybe you get some of that uh, professional experience and exposure that, um, that I'm going to talk about. Well, I've worked in the travel industry now for more than 15 years. And um, I'm going to talk to you about my journey because it's perhaps an unconventional one. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, in a minute. But I also want to tell you that, um, you know, what's happening right now in the industry is, is extremely challenging. You don't need to, uh, to, to be an expert to see that, you know, companies like EasyJet, British Airways are losing an unimaginable amount of uh, money. You know, the debt that's piling up for these companies is just eye-watering. And this is absolutely going to change how they do business the structure of their business, but obviously also what a career looks like in this industry. But it's not all doom and gloom. There's a huge, huge prediction from every research you can look at that there's going to be a very, very strong rebound. In fact, all the research points to the idea that there's going to be a rebound that's even uh, exaggerated this year. 
um, but one that perhaps softens over the years to come as we still have to work through some economic issues coming from the pandemic. But what this means is that there is still that opportunity, uh, I think the saying is make hay while the sun is shining, to really, really uh, build on what's happened right now. We can't go back, we can only go forward. And if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught uh, pretty much the whole industry, unless you've been in a cave or haven't been watching, is that we need to go through a realignment of the tourism industry. There are certain things in this industry which honestly have not been working. And there have been issues bubbling for many, many years. There's been issues related to um, unmanaged growth of tourism that's impacted society, communities. Um, I don't even need to tell you about the impact on the carbon footprint of this industry. And so this has actually forced the industry to take a step back and say, well, if we're at our bottom right now, we, we need to rebuild stronger. And I hate to use these cliches, but this phrase that's thrown around a lot, build back better, well, maybe for the UK government, it means one thing, but for the travel industry, it means a, a very different thing. It's about addressing those major issues that we simply had difficulty addressing when the industry was booming. And so I'm sure that that speaks to many of your interests and passions about, you know, perhaps some of the things you've been studying or some of the things you've been interested in. But now is the opportunity to be a young leader that steps into this industry and that says, well, I understand what those issues are. And actually, I have ideas about how I can be part of changing the shape and look of the industry going forward. This is a real moment for stepping up, for exercising leadership, and for being part of that new generation of travel industry professionals. So I want you to, to feel really positive about that because you know, every crisis brings an opportunity. Um, of course, we don't want to exploit a crisis and, and nobody does, but within that crisis, there is that opportunity to say, well, now is the time to do things differently. And if we're going to rebuild, let's rebuild by addressing some of the things that were never addressed before. So we're going to perhaps revisit this. If you have any questions during this session, just feel free to drop them in the chat and I will keep looking back to see uh, if I can help you out or answer those questions. But in the meanwhile, thank you to everybody who's already joined. Um, I can see that there's quite a lot of you there. And I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take you through what we're going to cover in today's session. So I thought, so okay, here's um, what we use a tool called Mural. Mural is a design thinking tool that facilitates remote design thinking. So it's really, really cool. Now, what I've done in preparation for today's session is I've built this mural, which will take us through the next hour. And we're going to explore some of the different avenues in which you might be thinking about your career and how to take it forward. So I've titled this Crafting a Career in Tourism. And that's because I believe that the career that you want for yourself is something that you shape for yourself and you craft for yourself. And I want you to get in that uh, frame of mind. So I'm going to zoom into different parts of the mural in just a moment, but there's different elements going on. Um, I'll talk about different ways in which you can consider your path to employment. I'm going to talk about my own journey because, as I said, it's quite unconventional. Um, and I think, you know, it might not be the path for everybody, that's for sure. But for others, it might give you optimism or inspire you to not always feel restricted by what's expected from you, or the preconditioned idea that others might have of you, or even the expectations of you when graduating, that that means you follow a certain path in life. It's certainly not the case for everybody, and everybody's journey is unique, and what everybody needs and wants from their career is completely individual. I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I believe are key to getting ahead, um, no matter what you do, and I'm going to talk about innovation and how we use tools like Mural and why that's so important in, well, not just this industry, but actually every industry. And I'm going to then finish by talking about where we see growth. So where the opportunities do exist um, in this industry that's incredibly disrupted and why those opportunities exist. OK, so if you're on the Mural, I'm going to summon you. And if you're uh, watching my screen on the uh, on canvas you will also see 
uh, what I'm doing here. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to celebrate that we've actually got uh, more than 60, uh, 60 of you on. So that's great. I think that's one of the highest numbers I've ever seen. And you're now going to be following me. Um, I can release you at certain points. But I thought we would start with uh, a little interview because, you know, when we talk about careers, we spend so much time focusing on uh, preparing for interviews. So I thought I would do this a little bit in a group therapy approach. I want everybody on the board to just pick one of those sticky notes there and just complete the sentence. So when I graduate, um, I want to, uh, or I hope to, da da da. So I'm really curious, just double click and you can edit the text and you can finish the sentence. This is a good little test to see how you guys get on with a tool like Mural. I can see a lot of sticky notes moving around. Here we go. Some people are writing. So I'm very curious to know, as um, a very diverse group that I'm sure we have, what graduation, what you hope to, to do with your career, where you hope to go. So um, this will really help us understand where you see yourselves and what your hopes and aspirations are for your career. So I can see, uh, let's have a look. So when I graduate, I hope to be able to have and manage my own hotel accommodation facility. So there we go. That's already really interesting. Um, and that's sustainable. Uh, somebody else is saying, when I graduate, I hope to expand my network and build business from scratch. Someone's done a huge note there. <laughs> Thank you for resizing that. Um, well, when I graduate, I hope to start a career with a DMO tourism company or destination management. So, so far, I'm already seeing completely different um, ideas about what you hope. Um, someone else is saying they hope to work as a receptionist in a hotel, travel agent, or tour guide. Um, somebody else is talking about wanting to be a sustainability manager. So again, that theme and topic of sustainability is, um, is rising up. Um, another one, when I graduate, I hope to work in sustainable tourism. So what I can already say from what you guys are adding, uh, and keep on adding, um, you're definitely, you just need to click on the link that I shared in the chat and you can all jump in and add your ideas. Um, people are saying they want to own their own business, want to be in control of where you're going, um, want to have a good job which gives you a good standard of living. I think that's that's a really sound, uh, sound direction to go in. Um, want to uh, want to be a travel agent or tour guide, yeah, receptionist. So some really interesting uh, ideas that everybody's sharing. Um, somebody else is saying, when I graduate, I hope to be able uh, to get a job related to aviation and tourism. Another is saying in event management. So actually, when I look at this here, um, what everybody wants to do is really, really different and unique and personal. And of course, the information you're sharing with me here somebody's saying that they want to find an occupation that they love and travel a lot and also talk to people so the path you shape for yourself is very very personal and you can really put you can really do what you want to do in life and you should certainly feel confident right now that nothing can hold you back from pursuing your dream if you want stability or a job that gives you a sense of security and a good standard of living, then you can absolutely go after that. And likewise, if you're feeling that you want to really go down the entrepreneurial route and develop your own opportunity, whether that's in your own business, somebody's saying that they want to start their own consultancy or business, um, then that's also up to you to shape that. Anything is possible. And honestly, there are really no limitations to what you can achieve. So. If there's one thing I would say at the very beginning is to believe in yourself and to believe in what you can do and what you can achieve, because you'll be surprised at what is possible. And that's exactly how I started my own career. I really pursued what I wanted to do. And I actually took a break from my studies to do that, because for me, what I wanted to do was more important than following what I had imagined I wanted to do at the start of uh, my, my student career. So, right, thanks very much everyone. Let's uh, stop that exercise, but it's been very interesting. And I think uh, for people who have never used Mural before, you've uh, certainly got very comfortable with that very quickly. I'm just going to move a few of those notes to the left. Now I'm going to do a little voting session uh, before we kick off into me sharing a bit of, about my story. 
So I'm going to um, ask you to give two votes here. And um, you will see something pop up on your screen. So just uh, don't click just yet. I'm going to summon, well, 66 of you. That's, that's definitely a record. We normally get to around 40 or 50. Um, so that means you're already ready for the future. So let's see. Um, let's add a vote, which is uh, what are you looking for from a job? So I'm going to, what are you looking for in a job? You can see my screen probably. I'm going to give you all two votes. And when you vote, you can, um, you can, Click once on each of the uh, dots that mean uh, that are important to you. So if you feel that you're looking for working near home or your place agnostic, click once on that red, icon, uh, red circle. And also choose another one from the line below. So for example, I'm looking to work with a big name employer or I'm employer agnostic or I want to be an independent consultant or start my own business. You can give your second vote. So each click is a different vote. And um, wow, I can see 73 people <laughs> voting. So that's really great to see that. I'm going to just give you a few more seconds. So we're going to go quite fast so we don't hold things back. So if you haven't yet voted, um, do add your votes. Um, and just want to understand generally what people feel they want to see from their job. Um, we've heard a lot during the pandemic about this um, kind of nomadic workers working and traveling and living wherever you want in the world. It sounds like such an incredible dream. And honestly, I share that. I've always dreamed of just going to the Caribbean and being able to um, work from there. But the realities I found were quite different, um, perhaps only from a financial point of view even. Um, but also, you know, we have different ideas about what kind of company we want to be involved with. And some people really, dream and look for those big name uh, businesses that can uh, seemingly give you the right opportunity. Whereas others say, well, I want to shape my own career and I want to uh, pursue what I really want to do. And I want to work for someone else. OK, so I'm going to um, end the voting session now. Let's have a look at what the majority of people say. So there we go. So you can see most people feel they want to work globally. That's very interesting, especially in the context of Brexit. Um, we, you know, we are we are a global society now, and this is an industry in particular where we don't often don't see ourselves um, fixed to a particular place. And this is a great thing, you know, because if we talk about your career, the opportunity for you is anywhere in the whole world. The fact that you can work digitally and that you can do your work and join this conference online is demonstrating just what is possible from anywhere. And that is uh, honestly, when I was uh, when I was completing my studies, I saw Europe as the opportunity. I went and I worked in Brussels, and that was such a great opportunity to be able to do that. Well, that is obviously something that's is quite challenging right now. I uh, won't say more on that. But on the other hand, there is this incredible opportunity that really wasn't such a strong opportunity when I was graduating, which is to work anywhere and to work for any company in any country. And that is really something that's quite exciting. The other thing which has really changed is people really want to be in control of their own career. So actually, very interestingly, we see roughly 50-50 saying that they want to start their own business or they want to work for a big brand. Um, I get that. And what I would say is really interesting here is that big, bigger companies often um, uh, suggest bigger opportunities, but it's not always the case. Um, but it's about the opportunity that you can shape in whatever company you work for. Quite a few people are saying they're employer agnostic. Um, so very interesting on the votes there. We're going to do one last round, and then I'm going to get in and tell you my story. But thanks a lot for sharing that. You've done a great job, by the way. Normally, people click on the wrong thing, and it all goes disastrously wrong. So I'm going to summon you again, and I'm going to ask you, you've got five votes. So if one thing really, really matters to you, you can even give it five votes on a single thing. So distribute your five votes however you want. Uh, what really matters to you? I'm just setting up the question. And I'm going to start it now. So begin your voting. And uh, I'll give you just a minute or so to complete that. But I'm really curious to know 
what is important to you? This, I honestly have no idea what, uh, what everybody's going to say, but this will help me understand what is actually, um, what is actually your motivation when you look for a job? Is it um, working for a business which has a reputation? Um, for example, you know, I want to work for Google. I've heard that so many times. Is it um, the job title, you know, being the director or the vice president of something at some point in your early career? Is it seeing a pathway that you can build your career through a particular company or security in the business that you work for? Or are you driven maybe more for the perks and the benefits, for example, being able to travel, being able to work somewhere else? And of course, one of the big things that employers are increasingly um, focusing on is allowing people to incorporate their own passions within their company. For example, being able to pursue the things which really interest them or really matter to them. And the other side of that is cultural values, looking for uh, companies which align in terms of the set of values which determine what you care about. Um, and this has been... Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, the students are writing in the public chat to say they can't vote. Uh, would there be a reason why? Thanks. Yeah. Um, I thought you may not be able to see the public chat because you're you're sharing. Uh, you're right. Um, actually, there is no obvious reason why. <laughs> so let okay, me. Sorry, end that that's session. fine. No problem. That's fine. Um, uh, I'll just let, let you me know. Answer. Kind of. Okay. Yeah. I just yeah. thought you know okay. that they can't vote. Okay. No problem. Thanks very much. Okay. No so yeah, that didn't work. Okay, not to worry, we'll move on because I think uh, otherwise we'll get very stuck here. I have a niggling idea, but it's not going to be solved uh, live on the call. So thanks a lot. Um, okay, right. So, um, well, we'll maybe revisit that later on. Thanks a lot, guys, for doing that interactive exercise. That's really, really helps us understand, you know, what you're looking for. I can see everybody's hovering around there. We'll try to come back to that. So I thought, um, you know, discussing this conference beforehand i thought uh, i was telling a bit about what my journey looked like and we actually concluded uh, together that this would actually be a really interesting uh, story to tell it's not one i often tell but i think it's very interesting and maybe you can all relate to it in different ways because some of you have, have said well i'm looking for a career and others have said that um that you're, uh, you want to start your own business. So in my personal journey, there's been a bit of everything here, really. Um, when I was uh, at university, I chose to study photographic arts. Now, that's obviously very different to what I'm doing right now. And that's often uh, quite a shock for people. In fact, I have to be very honest with you. And I think this is probably the first time I tell any kind of large audience this. But whenever I meet people in the industry, they often, and you often have um, a kind of elite or elitist or statement um, way of, you know, uh, networking, unfortunately. Um, when I first entered the industry, I had a lot of where did you go to school, which was definitely not interesting. And what did you study? And which university did you study at? So when you enter the industry, you will find a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of, kind of uh, a lot of pressure to give an answer that's prestigious, that's impressive. And actually, I mean, I was very, very happy with the University of Westminster uh, for photographic arts. It was one of the best universities uh, for photographic arts in the whole country. Um, and that was something I was very proud of. But when I started that course, uh, that is what I thought I wanted to do. Um, I went from college to, to university. I went down the BTEC route uh, rather than the A-level route. So already I'd maybe broken with the traditional academic world. Um, but I really loved that creative side of being able to, um, yeah, being able to develop my own creative ideas uh, through photography. But as that moved on, I started to realize that this wasn't quite the direction I wanted to go in. Um, whilst I had a huge appreciation for photography, I didn't feel that it was um, something that it was exactly right for me. Um, and I think I did quite well with it, but it, in the end, it just wasn't the thing that I wanted to be pursuing. Um, so I, sorry, I just see I have a low battery. I have an ongoing problem with a charger right now that just doesn't charge. So I'm just going to make sure I don't die on you. Um, <laughs> I decided to, you know, to, 
to take a break from university because I was so unsure about what I was doing. And uh, I think this was probably the best decision I ever made. I, um, oh, sorry, I don't want the laptop to die on you. That would be quite awful. I, um, when I was uh, studying, I went into a competition with The Guardian called NetJetters. And this competition really changed my life. And what I want to share with you here is that sometimes an opportunity will come about and you have to go for it. You have to go with your gut instinct. And what I did then is I took a break from university. I said, this is an opportunity that I don't think is going to come around again. I entered myself to this competition. I said uh, that I was going to travel around the whole of Europe um, and review all of the low cost airline destinations because that was something which was really, really booming in 2000 and three, 2004. And I was going to show the world uh, about these new destinations that the low cost airlines were flying to and show people, um, you know, that, this, that there's a really exciting new world out there, especially with the expansion of the European Union. There were lots of new destinations emerging. And I took that opportunity to, um, to do that. And I ended up writing a weekly travel column for The, Arti for the Guardian. Uh, when I was just 21 years old. So um, really kind of scary. Uh, I don't think my writing skills were particularly brilliant. And I think I caused the editor a headache by doing that because he had to edit every single week and um, try, to, try to make sense of what I was uh, writing. But I traveled pretty much the whole of Europe and had this incredible experience that, um, that I would never have had if I didn't take that decision. And during that time, I realized the power of the internet because it was one of the first um, things that The Guardian had ever done online. And readers were able to follow that journey online. And I was writing a blog every two or three days. And I quickly realized that with that blog came a huge following. And that was something that I was quite energized to capitalize on. So during my time doing the NetJetters uh, column, I created a website. I don't think. Um, I don't think that's uh, something that probably looks very familiar to you right now, but I created a website called NetJetters. You've got to bear in mind this was, um, you know, 20 odd years ago, <laughs> and uh, or just a little bit less than 20 years ago. And I created a website called NetJetters uh, where I created an, uh, a more detailed review of every single destination I'd been to. I effectively created a travel book online with a calendar showing where I was going. every other Bye guys, I believe um, Nick has cut off. Um, I'll put it up there. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'm sure he'll be back on as soon as he can be. I have to say, though, I mean, I'm really enjoying his story so far. Um, and what I would say is it's always really fascinating, and you'll hear more of, from our other speakers today about their career, their career stories. And every single person has got a different tale to tell, but they all end up at the same place. And I think for, for those of you who maybe still are a little bit concerned, don't know what you want to do, I would say don't stress too much. Um, you obviously um, have joined and are studying travel, tourism, hospitality, aviation, because you are keen to work in that sector and the sector wants you. Um, there are so many different opportunities out there. And actually, as you start your journey, you will um, you will find that you'll go in different directions. And, and one thing that we always hear time and time again at our Future You events is people saying, you just have to make the most of all the opportunities that they give you, that life gives you. I myself have had many different opportunities. Opportunities. I didn't start as an HR person. Um, I actually worked in events uh, for a few years before falling into the HR space and then after that falling into the travel and tourism space. But 
I now know I'm where I was meant to be. Um, it just took me a little bit longer to get here than maybe some other people. So, you know, it's quite exciting. You're at the start of, of your career and, and, you know, it'd be great to have you back here in 10 years time telling us, you know, what your career has been and, and how far I'm sure you would have all come since you did your, your uh, courses at UCB. So there's all sorts of things that uh, that you can be um, excited about. Um, have we have we heard from Nick? Have we had a, a call from him, uh, Richard, Ricky? Have we heard anything yet? Hi Claire, I'm just I'm literally just emailing him now. I've got a feeling that his PC may have died yeah. at some point. <laughs> so I'm just emailing him to see when he can rejoin. And when he does, then obviously he can carry on his session. But if needs be, we can move on to Danny. Yeah, no, that's fine. I can I can do a bit of a segue for now to give Nick a bit of time. I don't want to, you know, I think it'd be great to try and continue with him if we could. Um, I always try and um, and actually sort of, you know, intersperse the speakers with a little bit more information for you guys about the ITT. And I know that your course leaders and your lecturers will have already hopefully told you about a number of different opportunities that we have. Um, and I mentioned our student awards. Um, and again, please do consider doing that. We also have um, student ambassadors at our centres of excellence, of course, which UCB is one. And we are looking for student ambassadors for UCB. Now, we only need a couple of you um, and we're quite happy, depending on, on you know, whichever stage of your, your uh, course you're at. It doesn't matter what year you're in. Um, but what we would ask is if you are interested in potentially being a student ambassador for the ITT Future U programme, is that you need to just send a, no, long, no more than maybe... 100 to 200 words to myself and to uh, to Ricky um, to Ricky just to say why you want to be a student ambassador and then we will then select from that. So um, you know that's another thing that you might be really interested in doing. And again, the, there's more information on that. But as a student ambassador, you would be working with us to help put on events like this. You would be working with the other student ambassadors from all the other um, centres of excellence around the UK. And they have a very um, proactive uh, WhatsApp group and they, they meet probably once a month just online just to chat and see what they're all doing. So again, it's another great way of, of expanding your network with um, your peer group from around the country as well as obviously within your actual um, uh, university um, itself so there are lots of opportunities like that and we're really keen to hear from you as students as the sort of things that you would like us to do for you at future you we've got some as i said some exciting plans i can't announce them all today i wish i could but there will be lots of different opportunities for you to get involved over the years and 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 hopefully will stay with us as you as you embark on your careers um post qualifications so i saw nick pop up just now um I think he's back. I'm hoping he's back. And then I don't have to do any more segues. Ooh. Hi, Claire. That was a, an excellent segue, by the way. I like your style. Okay. Um, <laughs> Nick, Nick was just, he just rejoined, but then I've just checked. And unfortunately, he, I think he's been picked out by the platform, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm still emailing him to identify where he is. And hopefully when he's back, I'll let you know. Okay, fine. Now that that's great. Um, so I mean, maybe what we should do is go on to our next speaker then, because you don't want to be listening to me for for all this time. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome um, Danny Wayne, who's our next speaker. Now, I first met Danny when he was graduating from his tourism degree at um, the University of Northumbria, and I won't talk too much about Danny's. Uh, his his own individual journey but he and i have now been friends for a long time and when future you was first formed and when i spoke i had a meeting with wtm and was asked to put on this event for the first time i contacted danny and asked him if he would get involved he's been involved ever since then and actually he and i work incredibly closely together he's my co-founder now of the whole future you initiative so Danny, great to see you and welcome to ucb future you Thank you, Claire. Uh, can you see me okay? Not yet. I'm trying to share the screen, but <laughs> it's my turn. To <laughs> yeah, wonderful world of tech. I had issues myself, but it's, I seem to be back on track now. But um, not yet. No. And keep filling, Claire. Have you got? Have you? Um, 
just dropping my presentation. Made a presenter. You've got the clip for the presenter, yeah? Share screen? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so one of the things that we did last week, uh, which Danny led on, and I know a few of you got involved, was the elevator pitch. Now, Danny, I hope you're not going to be talking about this too much in your in your bit, and I know you, you're going to um, show people some of what you did, but uh, um, it was an amazing opportunity for people to get involved with National Careers Week last year, uh, last week, and um, really helped cement a lot of the work that Future U does to help you um, you students in progressing and entering the industry. So Danny, I can see it. So I'm going to let you. Oh. Excellent. Okay, that's great. I think you can't see me, but you can see the presentation. And that's well, I'm the gonna, you don't want to see me, so I'm going to go move off now. Great. Well, it's much more important to see the, the slides. So thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Sorry, we're not in Birmingham this year, but I look forward to being back next year. That's for sure. So as Claire mentioned, my name is Danny Wayne. I'm head of membership at ABTA and I've been attending the future events at UCB now since you first started them about six years ago and I always love to be getting involved. So today I wanted to share with you a bit more about my story, my background and really try and bring my CV to life. So one of the things that I hear often from students who are looking to get into the travel industry to try and get on that career ladder and start to develop their career is that they don't feel like they have enough experience. Maybe they feel like it's difficult to get a job. If they haven't got experience, how do I get on that career ladder? So what I really wanted to do today was to talk through all of the different experiences I've had. And I'd like you to think about how if you've had these, whether it's volunteering opportunities, whether it's bits of work experience, even if you don't feel like it's relevant, how you can apply that in your career and enhance your CV. So that's, if you have that in your mind from the beginning, that would be fantastic. Uh, as I'm going through this, feel free to ask any questions. If we do have time, so if you just pop those into the public chat, if we have time at the end, Claire will certainly ask me those. And if we don't have time, I'll be happy to spend some time afterwards on the chat and answer those questions. So whether it's questions as they come up, or even if it's comments, observations, or if you don't agree with me, feel free to share your opinion as well. So how it started for me, well, I was always wanted to travel, always wanted to go around the world and experience the world, love to go on holiday. This is a couple of pictures of myself and my sister there. The one on the left hand side, we were in Mallorca and on the right hand side, that was in Benidorm. So you can see that I've always been interested in three things, travel, fashion and photography have always been three loves of mine. Um, I never particularly enjoyed history at school, so reading books and learning about history was not very interesting for me. But when I go to a destination, I actually experience the destination and start to learn about the place and the history of that city or that resort where I'm visiting. That for me is what brings it to life. And I've always really enjoyed that, as well as meeting people from around the world. And then once you actually start to work in the industry, having the opportunity to visit destinations, experience luxury hotels, the fantastic food and cocktails and all that sort of stuff are all the real perks that you start to have. So my first job was around about the age of 11. I remember going along to a bingo hall that had some broken windows that had been broken into and I was sweeping up the broken glass for my dad. He's run his own business now for almost 40 years. So that's something I've always been brought up around. And I think being brought up in that kind of self-employed uh, mindset and being on call 24 seven is something I've always enjoyed. And I think that kind of instilled into me at a young age that one day I'd like to run my own business. Probably thinking about it back then, I certainly didn't think it was gonna be as soon as it turned out to be. My first actual work experience was in a hotel. So the Golden Eagle Hotel, just outside of Middlesbrough. As you can see there, it's by no means luxury hotel. Um, I did spend one day through that week in each of the different departments. And the great thing about work experience is it's try before you buy. So you don't have to do work experience and then feel like you're stuck in that job or you're stuck in that career forever. So I love work experience because you get to have a go at something, see if it's right for you, get a feeling about it, whether that's working in a hotel, whether that's tour operations, travel agencies, airports, whatever it might be. Um, you will just get that first impression and that gut feeling as to whether it's right for you or not. And all of these experiences build up to make you the person that you are as well. 
Then my first startup was actually while I was at college. So I went to Egglescliff School and I was volunteering on the school council. We needed to raise some money for the new library at the school. So we had a school council meeting, came up with all these ideas. And we, well, of course, because I'm someone that loves sweets, love chocolate. So we came up with the idea of opening a tuck shop within the school. And we managed to get agreement to that. What was fantastic was I got the opportunity to do the ordering of the stock. I was effectively managing the school tuck shop. We were opening at break time, at lunchtime, and we were selling all of these sweets, chocolates. I was eating too many Astro belts as well, which weren't good for my teeth. But it became so successful that we actually got closed down. So we more than raised the money that they needed for the books in the library. We smashed the target. And what happened was actually became so successful. We had students that were queuing around the block and they were late for class. So we actually had to uh, close it at one point. And probably I think the school started to realize that it wasn't great for the health of the students either. But that for me was great. I think I, I got the buzz of the sales. I had the adrenaline of running the business and something being successful. And that really um, spurred me on for the rest of my career. So I then went on to do some paid jobs. And I'm sure that many of you that have got jobs similar to this that would be something that you could put on your CV. Um, so I was a glass collector in a golf club. And of course, you start to deal with people that have had too much to drink. They can be difficult customers. So you learn different skills. I worked in the toy department at Woolworths over Christmas. And it was the, uh, the Harry Potter potion maker was the toy that everyone wanted. But we'd sold out of it back in about August. So difficult customers, upset parents, uh, people, uh, well, and, and upset kids as well. And dealing with people face to face is, again, a different type of skill that you will learn. And then macro, I worked on the tills at macro. So I was taking payments. I was um, sending through all of the items that customers were buying and so on. And so that helps to build trust when you're dealing with money. And I think thinking about all of these different job experiences, work experience that you have, the skills that you've gained from those, and then how you can apply that on your CV. And when you're going for interviews as well, how you can get that across to the person that's in front of you is um, really important when you're looking to get a job. Then I had the opportunity to work abroad. So I saved up all that money from macro when I took my gap year, went to work in America. Jackson Lake Lodge is an absolutely amazing place in Wyoming. I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning to work in the diner, um, in the grill, and then also the coffee shop as well. I was doing a couple of days a week, which was a Starbucks concession. Uh, I'm not a morning person, and so getting up at four o'clock in the morning wasn't exactly my favorite thing to do, but we were working from sort of 4 a.m. until 12 noon at lunchtime. And the great thing was for the rest of the day, you then had time to go out and experience all of the different excursions and activities. And the actual resort that I worked at, they enabled staff to do that free of charge. And the reason was, and I kind of thought about this afterwards, it was very good from a sales perspective. It's because when I went to do the whitewater rafting or I went to play golf or I went on one of the long hikes, I would come back the next morning and then the visitors that were staying at the resort, the guests would ask us, so what did you get up to yesterday afternoon after you'd finished work? And we would tell them all about the different excursions that we did, how amazing it was to experience the local area. And we were effectively selling excursions on behalf of the company, but in a soft kind of way. And that would encourage the guests to then go out themselves and to buy these different experiences and take part. I also loved all of the different people that I worked with from around the world. I was the only British person that was working there. So I would often have guests that were coming in and they would say to me, um, can I have this, that and the other for my breakfast? And I'd say, yes, would you like tomato sauce with that? And they would look at me and say, what? What do you mean? And I would say tomato sauce and they'd say ketchup. And I'd say, no, tomato sauce. And then they would then want me to say that time and time and time again and laugh at my British accent. But what I realized was that was also brilliant for tips and particularly the American guests that came. So we would do whatever we needed to do to charm the guests, make sure they had a great time and to make sure that we also as staff had great experience as well. I then returned to the UK and went to study travel and tourism management at Northumbria University. So a similar kind of course to many of you here today absolutely loved it really threw myself into that and worked extremely hard 
managed to get a first at the end of the four years and I was really proud of that took it very seriously but also made sure that I enjoyed myself enjoyed the whole university experience and it's not just about the academic side of things although that's really important you do also grow as a person you develop more confidence I remember there was one module I think it was MO122 which was all about presenting in front of the rest of the the class and I absolutely hated it. I couldn't imagine standing up in front of people and actually doing a presentation. It just made me feel sick. Um, so I really hated that module, but actually reflecting on that, I think it was one of the more important ones that we actually had um, because standing in front of people and presenting is something that I do often in my job now and have done in my career. Also working in groups with people that you don't particularly like or you don't get on with. I always remember at university, you think, oh, why do I have to be with that person? We don't like each other. They're very lazy or they don't, they're don't. they not interested. And the fact is that you work with people like that once you start working in industry and you do have to find a way to be able to get on with them and to make things happen and to be successful if you're working on a project together. So I know from a student's perspective, it's always one of those things that feels like a real pain but it is a very valuable skill. The other module I remember that I was not particularly interested in was all about business statistics. And I would go and sit at the back of the room. It was always on a Thursday morning and it was Wednesday night was a big night out in Newcastle. So it was the one um, lecture that I always wanted to avoid if I could. And I remember sitting there thinking, business statistics, why do I need to know about this? This is just not to do with travel and tourism. But again, it's one of those modules that actually looking back, I use statistics and analytics and so on in my job on a daily basis. So it was actually really important. Um, and yeah, absolutely loved it. But it was time to um, also get some work experience while I was at university as well. So I managed to get a job at Stanley Bet, which is Bucky's in the west end of Newcastle since being taken over by a different business but that was just for me an opportunity to earn some money I got paid to watch the football watch the golf watch other sports which I really enjoyed and it's just a different type of working with customers working under pressure you had to really think on your feet and work out the bets so it was much a uh, lot to do with your numerical skills and numbers and again just a different experience but another beneficial one I then, as part of my university course, had the opportunity to move down to London to do a work placement for a year. So I did an internship at Planet Holidays, which is a specialist luxury tour operator. There I was working mainly over the telephone. So that for me was different. So it wasn't face to face with customers. I was working both with direct consumer customers and also travel agents as well. So trade partners. And that was really my first job directly in travel and actually learning about destinations. I needed to know about hotels in Greece and Cyprus, taking it all in. And I had the opportunity actually to go out to Cyprus to visit a destination. And we, we got to go and visit um, the whole island, went to Paphos and went to the Elysium Hotel, which is a beautiful five-star hotel. And that led me on to something in a couple of years down the line, which I'll come back to. Whilst that was all going on, I was fortunate enough to win the very first ITT Student of the Year, which are the awards that Claire talked about. So that was the first year that ITT ran those awards, and that was me on stage at Butlin. Yeah, the slide, and 2006, I um, met a lady called Bella, who was the lady that sponsored that award. Um, and she's someone that's really inspired me, particularly to give back and to help younger people to develop their careers. So it was then I graduated and I needed to go out into the world of work and to get a job. Most of my friends that graduated went out and I would say got proper jobs for large businesses, small businesses. But I actually had the opportunity through that trip to Cyprus where I met a lady called Helen. And we were up until three or four o'clock in the morning in the hotel bar drinking. And I said, tell me about your business. And she told me all about Perfect Weddings Abroad. And we had these crazy ideas about how we could open weddings abroad and honeymoon implants within bridal shops. That was where the idea started. And we got on really well. And then her and her husband called me as I was about to graduate and said, look, we'd like to see if you'd be interested in joining the business. And from that, we started Perfect Weddings Abroad, which was a travel agency and tour, opera, tour operator uh, based in the Midlands. So 
just up in Litchfield, not too far, hence why I would often visit Birmingham and um, UCV. And I actually just lived around the corner of uh, from where your campus is, actually. Um, we developed the company into a head office with home workers. We had salespeople all around the UK. We had wedding coordinators all around the world in 40 different countries. And so when you're running a business like that, it is literally 24 seven and you have to do everything from making the tea to taking those really difficult phone calls when someone's got a problem in Las Vegas and it's like four o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, it was so it's something if you do want to run your own business, you've got to be prepared to put the hours in. The photographs there on the right, so the top right hand corner, we actually entered a competition called The Big Idea. It was run by one of the travel trade papers and that was a bit like dragon's den we won hundred thousand pounds that evening and i remember waking up the next day with a stinking hangover panicking because i couldn't remember where that briefcase was with 100 grand thankfully it was fake money um i was a bit worried that i'd left it in the taxi and it was also the same night that xl airways went bust and the whole of the banks were collapsing and it was really difficult time in a way similar to covid as far as the impact is concerned on the travel industry um but we managed to have this amazing achievement and the bottom right hand corner there that's my sister so the person who you saw back on my first slide she actually booked her wedding with perfect weddings abroad and i had a feeling she was going to be the most difficult customer we'd ever experienced but she wasn't she was really uh really nice and um great for our photographs as well and i mentioned that it's often extremely difficult when you're starting your own business and hard work for us it wasn't easy to take money out of the business at first so i needed to look to do some part-time work so we could help to build up the business i managed to get the opportunity to work for training for travel and tft were an apprenticeship provider so i was actually going around the west midlands and observing apprentices working in thompson and first choice shops at the time and helping them to build their portfolio I did a CIM professional marketing diploma when I first moved to Birmingham and that was an opportunity for me not only to upskill but also to meet new people because I was new to the area, didn't have any friends. We launched a side business called Dress in a Box because every single bride that booked with us was worried about losing their wedding dress. So we would um, send them a wedding dress box out and we got to the point where we realized that we were doing this and not making any money out of it. So we actually started a side company and that was really successful actually <laughs> i also did some social media support for good life florida villas and set up the weddings department at travel counselors and all of these different opportunities came from being involved in the company being getting out there doing networking making the most of all the different opportunities and i always say to people you don't get opportunities if you're just sitting at home stuck in your bedroom you've got to put yourself out there I know that's difficult at the moment when we can't actually leave our houses, but you can even do that virtually. So coming along to a conference like this today is a great start. So you're already putting yourselves one step ahead of other people. So well done on that. And it was perfect, but I'd spent 10 years at Perfect Weddings Abroad. We'd built up the company from 30 weddings in the very first year when I joined and we first started it to over 500 weddings a year. We sold 51% of the company to an American business destination weddings we launched we were the first company in the UK to launch same-sex weddings which is something that I'm really proud of I remember speaking to members of parliament trying to get them to agree that overseas weddings would be recognized in the UK we caused some problems in Cyprus when we tried to get weddings um, same-sex weddings in Cyprus if not legal weddings at least we could do blessings within hotels or within various resorts and the Orthodox Church really didn't like that. So we had a lot of pushback and they would try and persuade the hotels not to accept these couples. So we picked a few battles, uh, but that was something that we managed to overcome. We grew the team, the home workers, won the British Travel Awards four years in a row, which is that photograph in the top right hand corner there. And I had the opportunity to visit so many different destinations right across the Mediterranean, uh, through to Mauritius, over across to Caribbean all of the typical kind of weddings abroad and honeymoon destinations. I've been really fortunate to uh, visit. And then in the bottom right hand corner, that photograph was me actually on a fan trip. So I was on a, a trip with a group of travel agents and we went to Jade Mountain in St. Lucia, which was on a BBC Two programme a couple of weeks ago, one of the world's top hotels. And this was me sitting there on my emails 
working away, completely oblivious that I'd missed the most amazing sunset that had just set behind me. And one of the colleagues that was on the trip took this photograph of me and showed me what I'd missed. And that for me was really an eye opener because it made me realize that you also have to enjoy these opportunities when you get them. We're very fortunate in our industry. And as much as you get wrapped up in the day to day and the hard work of the business, you must also really appreciate some of these opportunities and places that we actually get to experience. I then was headhunted and moved from Birmingham down to London. So I spent then the next sort of four years working at Istituto Marangoni. And it took me four years to be able to pronounce the name. Actually, that was when I knew it was time to move on. There I was heading up the recruitment of um, eight schools around the world that specialized in fashion and design programs. I was also in charge of the marketing, the PR and events in the UK as well. That's a company that started in Italy. It's private equity owned, so it's very different to running your own business. And I had the opportunity to travel then to very different destinations, so places like China, Thailand, Brazil, uh, places that weren't particularly wedding destinations, so not countries that I've been to before. So that was fantastic. Got to take part in the fashion cruise around Brazil, which was four nights on board this huge cruise ship with 4,000 people that were doing fashion shows and photo shoots. It was absolutely nuts, but that was definitely the highlight for me. Why did I get that job? Well, it was very much because of my international experience. It's because I'm used to dealing with people, working with people, working within the travel industry. You have to work extremely hard in travel, but you also do um, really have to focus on sales because the margins are quite tight. So there were so many different reasons why that job came to me. And of course, the events part of it as well fit with what I'd done in the past. But I was missing the travel industry and I spotted this job on LinkedIn. I definitely recommend that you all make the most of LinkedIn and I'm going to come back to social media a bit later. Uh, I saw a job for Interhome, which is a Swiss holiday homes provider, started 65 plus years ago, actually in London, but became part of Hotel Plan, the third largest tour operator in Switzerland. And for me, that was the polar opposite to an Italian fashion school because it was uh, actually owned by a Swiss cooperative called Migros. So very conservative, very Germanic in the way that they do things. It gave me the opportunity to finally use a bit of my German language skills that I'd learned at college. And so that sort of <clears throat> challenged me in a different way. It brought me back into the travel industry. And I was also working more as an account manager with travel agents across the UK. Um, increasing brand awareness of into home, the holiday home division, and really working with people that I've built relationships up with in the travel industry, but I'd not directly worked with before. And then aside from all of this, I've been able to do a few other bits on a more voluntary basis. So I've mentored some startups. I always try to give advice and support to whether it's young people starting their career or whether it's people in the industry that are looking to start a business. I'm, um, I'm always really interested in different businesses and trying to be able to help people. So I got involved with a lady called Andrea, who runs Talent Courtyard. She was actually someone that was in my team at Istituto Marangoni. She was a student there, and then she became um, a member of our staff. And she wanted to start a business, so I've supported her since she started that back in September 2019. I've also been involved with the ITT and I joined the board of the ITT back in 2012. And that for me has been a great networking platform. It's been a, an opportunity to meet different people in industry. Please don't tell Claire that I said this, but I became the youngest board director, which was what Claire was before I joined. So she's going to get me back for that a bit later on, I'm sure. Um, but that's something that's had given me the opportunity to speak in front of large audiences. So that photograph was in Split in Croatia, and I was speaking in front of 400 people from across the industry. And again, not something that I enjoy doing. I feel physically sick every time I do it. But how do I get over that? I practice. I write my speeches well in advance, practice them in front of the mirror, try and memorize them, take a deep breath as you go on stage. Always have Gaviscon by my side as well because I get heartburn when I'm feeling sick just before I go on stage. So all of these things that I've tried to train myself, my brain and my body to be able to cope with. So if you do get kind of anxious when you present it in front of people, please don't worry about that. It's very normal. 
And then ITT Future U is something that I've loved. Uh, myself and Claire have done this all around the UK and as you mentioned overseas as well. And by the end of this academic year, we'll have had more than 20,000 students and graduates like yourselves take part in these events. So that brings me on to my current role. And I wanted to tell you a bit about what I'm doing now and also tell you more about ABTA. So ABTA is the travel association. We're the largest travel trade association in the UK. I joined in October 2020. So I joined ABTA just over four months ago. And as you will have been able to work out from that, I started the role during the pandemic. So I did manage to have a couple of days in the office. It was very strange because the majority of my interviews were done virtually. I did manage to have one face-to-face -face interview with my line manager, who's one of the directors, as well as the chief executive. Um, and then once I started, it was pretty much virtual. Um, so I could probably walk down the street and walk past members of staff that I would probably not even realize they're members of staff because in virtual world, it's very different to meeting people face to face. What does my job look like? Well, I'm looking after the whole membership life cycle. So whether that's engaging with the existing membership and we have travel businesses right across the membership, recruiting new members, bringing them into membership, raising the profile of ABTA as well are all things that I do on a day to day basis. And I absolutely love it. I think one of the highlights for me is that I'm meeting different business people every day. I'm learning about their businesses. I'm involved with things like mergers and acquisitions and new startups and all of that sort of stuff is absolutely fascinating on a day to day basis. So ABTA itself has been around just over 70 years now, and we have more than 4,300 travel brands within membership. In a normal year, a combined turnover would be 40 billion pounds. Of course, it won't quite be that this year, but I'm sure it will come back. And we have a mix of principals, which are tour operators, retailers, which are your typical high street travel agents, online travel agents, and what we call hosted agents, which are generally home working businesses as well. We also have more than 600 what we call managed branches, and they are effectively franchises of larger consortium model members and that's definitely a growing area within the market and of course we have employed staff within those businesses and also self-employed home workers which has been a big growth in the travel sector over the last sort of 20 years or so. ABTA is a super brand so we have often uh, well customer recognition of 83 percent but even throughout Covid that stayed around about 79 to 83 percent despite all of the challenges that the travel industries had. We run various campaigns. So travel with confidence is the usual one that you would see in the marketplace, encouraging people to travel, book with an ABTA member. We tweaked it this year to be more about book with confidence, just because we can't all travel right now, of course. The various different brands and logos. So the Travel Association is the main ABTA brand within the travel trade. Travel with confidence is the more consumer facing brand. Each ABTA member gets their own ABTA number and we have ABTA partners that are B2B suppliers. So you, when it comes to travel, it's not just about the actual tour operators, travel agencies, airlines. It's also all of the different support services as well from HR to recruitment to technology businesses. And they are what we would call the ABTA partners. ABTA used to be two separate businesses, so two separate associations. So it used to be the Association of British Travel Agents, but around about 15 years ago, it merged with the logo on the top right hand corner there, FTO, the Federation of Tour Operators. So when we brought together the travel agents and the tour operators, that's when ABTA became the Travel Association and rebranded. We also have ABTA Lifeline, which is our charity, and they do lots of work for travel professionals. So basically, if you've worked for in the past or currently work for uh, an ABTA member, you're able to, as a charity, um, access things like counselling support. There are financial support for individuals. And when we've had failures such as Thomas Cook going bust, we had lots of people that were made redundant and they were able to access support through Lifeline. And through the pandemic, they've been doing some great work in supporting various different types of people. And I would say it's not just people that are made redundant. It's also people who business owners that are going through a really difficult time at the moment as well and everyone in between. 
And then Travel Life is our sustainability certification. So hotels around the world can go through a whole accreditation process and become Travel Life accredited. So you might go to a hotel on the other side of the world and see one of the Travel Life certificates on the wall when you're checking in. So ABTA does a range of things. Often it's known for its financial protection. We do a lot around lobbying the government on behalf of the travel industry, but also it's about raising the best practice within the industry. We have a code of conduct that members need to adhere to and to make it safe and to give consumers confidence to book holidays, basically. Um, so lots of different support services that members can access. What does membership look like? Well, in the past, it was very much binary. So this, I'm sure this is before many of your time, but you would historically in the UK walked into a travel agency, picked off a brochure off the shelf, and then booked a tour operator's holiday. The travel agent would have booked that either through their view data system, or they would have called up the tour operator in a call center and made that booking. And I would say in the past, that was quite straightforward. Now it's extremely complex. And I always describe it as more like Russian dolls. These are how most of our travel businesses and ABTA members look nowadays, and you keep stripping them back and you find another layer. So Hayes Travel is the largest independent travel agency in the UK, but they don't only have high street travel agency branches. They also have the call center at the head office in Sunderland. They have the website. They have the Hayes Travel Independence Group, which then has a number of different managed branches. Holidays Please is a great example because they're close to you in Birmingham, very close to UCB. And I know that they have recruited a number of students and graduates from UCB over the years, as well as home workers and all sorts of different types of models. So we have head offices, we have a head office can then operate a number of branches like Hayes Travel, where they've got hundreds and hundreds of high street branches across the country. They then have managed branches, which are these more kind of independently owned, often franchise businesses. And then OSRs are outside sales representatives, which are self-employed home workers. And as I mentioned, that's been a real growth area. But then even that in itself is not that straightforward. Often you have uh, managed branches of managed branches and OSRs of managed branches, and you could go on for days. So it's very complex, but particularly if you study in travel and tourism, I think it's really fascinating to get your head around all of these different business models and to learn from all of the different people that work in the industry. And then my kind of day-to-day, -day, so member engagement, whether that's in person, well, hopefully, I'm looking forward to getting back to in-person events, but we also do lots through social media, conference calls, and um, so on. We have our main, as I mentioned, the Travel with Confidence campaign, which for the first time we actually involved members in that. So we asked members to be able to submit their videos, and then we created one sort of super video and then the b2c campaigns with consumers which was uh, make more memories was about inspiring people to think about booking their holiday and then we had we were generating leads so thomas cook as one of the active members there was actually uh, receiving leads through that and i can't talk about the travel industry without mentioning covid unfortunately but what has ABTA done? Well, over the last 12 months, it's been probably the busiest year in the association's history, despite the fact that, unfortunately, very few people have been able to travel. So ABTA brought together the Safe Future Travel Coalition, which was a campaign of, I think it's up to about 14 associations now that are all working together to lobby the government. We've had more than 8,000 pieces of press coverage, so you'll often see spokespeople from ABTA on uh, Sky News, on BBC, and so on. We've been supporting members and businesses through things like bond renewals, uh, package travel regulations, which I'm sure everyone's heard about issues to do with refunds, and you might well have experienced that yourself. And the whole value chain has come under pressure within the travel industry. ABTA championed refund credit notes to be able to support businesses, and that has certainly stopped, um, I would say, tsunami of failures happening. We have unfortunately had 24 failures over the last year within the ABTA membership, and those are the logos that are on the screen. Some of them I'm sure you'll recognize, like STA Travel, um, and probably the largest one there is actually Cruise and Maritime Voyages, which is South Key. So we've been processing 42,000 claims, and the claims team at ABTA has actually never been bigger. So that's making sure that consumers get their money back from their cancelled holidays. So some tips for yourselves, for students and graduates. Give solutions, not problems. So when you're working within a business, 
we're always going to have problems. People make mistakes, things happen, but it's thinking about how can you actually bring that solution to your manager and to be able to propose a solution is definitely something you should try to do. Take opportunities, but also make them. Put yourself out there, make yourself feel uncomfortable. That's how you will progress and develop in your career and develop professionally. Don't forget about sales and customer service skills. They're really important. So when you are studying, if you do have the opportunity to get a part time job or to do some volunteering, I always recommend it because that will enhance your CV and your skill set. Harness the power of no. So for me, if someone tells me, no, you can't do this, that is really like a red rag to a bull. And that makes me want to do it. So don't take no for an answer. Act as a role model and give back. I think people underestimate how much of a role model they can be. So for us with Future You, um, representation is extremely important and um, having role models for people to be able to look up to. And don't just think about what's happening here and now, but think about the future and the long game. Where do you want to go in your career? How can you develop your skills to get there? And I've used social media a lot to be able to sort of build if you like personal brand and people know me within the travel industry not only from the jobs that i've had but the kind of things i put on social media i would say working in the fashion industry certainly helped because that is all about how you can kind of get your image out there how you are portrayed but it's not necessarily what's going on behind the scenes so even things like having a content plan, so thinking about what you'd like to publish on your social media channels in the next few weeks. Can you create videos? Are there photographs that you can take when you're at events? And all of these things, it's not, it doesn't happen by accident. You need to have a little think about it. From your perspective, definitely get on LinkedIn and start to interact with people, get involved in conversations, comment, and that's how you will start to learn, but also to build awareness of yourself. And then as Claire mentioned earlier on, we ran um, as part of National Careers Week last week, we ran a sort of not a competition, but set a challenge called the elevator pitch. And this was me giving students the opportunity to share um, themselves and to try to get into an elevator. You've got 60 seconds to get across. Why should you employ me? And I'm going to give this a try. And if I can share this very short video with you. This is actually what we did.
There we go. Wasn't that fantastic? So thank you, everyone. That's the end of my presentation. And with a bit of luck, Claire will reappear and save me. I hope you enjoyed that. If anyone has any questions, then feel free to put them in the chat and I will hang around. I'm here. I'm here. Um, I was just trying to type and do things all at once. Um, what I wanted to say was we got a lot of comments about that great uh, clip of the elevator pitches. Um, all of the actual full length elevator pitches, which are only 60 seconds long, and that, that comp um, compilation that Danny put together are available on our YouTube channel. So feel free to head over there at any time to check them all out. And, and I have to say, I mean, you know, you mentioned, Danny, about how presentations, you know, getting up in front of an audience can be really nerve wracking, and but you have to challenge yourself. And, and I think for all of those students, you know, that, you know, huge kudos to them for doing that because you're putting yourself out there and you're putting yourself out on social media. And that's something that um, we often talk about. And I know that, that the lecturers and parents and everyone talk about is how important it is and how you actually present yourself on social media. It's not to say you can't have fun, um, we like to see characters, we like to see people with a lot of, you know, with really strong characters in our sector, but actually you always have to think about how you um, you actually put yourself out there. So, you know, anyone can have a go at this, you know, you don't have to share it, but do share it if you want. And if you want to do one, please tag us in as well, because we'd love to see it if any of you want to want to put those pictures together. Um, so, Danny, I... Um, I mean, I was, I mean, I've known you for years and years now. And yes, I will get you back for that age comment at some point. Um, but uh, I have I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I think, you know, Nick mentioned, and, and Nick is back, everybody, and we'll be hearing from him a bit later. But um, you talk, you know, you, you've been an entrepreneur, you've set up your own business, and you work for large corporates um, across the thing. Now, there's a kind of there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation there, isn't there, in terms of people who might be really interested in being um, an entrepreneur sitting on their own business, but actually lack the business acumen and the commercial acumen. But then, you know, it, it kind of can you give us your kind of, I guess, take on that? Because people are sitting here and we heard from Nick, a lot of people saying, I want to own my own business. Would you say having done it yourself, it's great to just throw yourself in or in hindsight, would you have done it differently? Yeah, well, I would have done it differently. But I would still have done it, definitely. I know that some people say, our oh, young people shouldn't start their own business. They're not experienced enough. They should wait until they're older. I think that's a lot of rubbish. I think if you've got the passion inside you and you've got uh, a great product and you've spot a gap in the market and you're prepared to put the time and effort into it, then I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't throw yourself into it and have a go. I would recommend that you try and get some support around you. So whether that is a mentor, whether that's a business partner, it's those kind of people that I think are really important. Ideally, having someone that's a financial backer as well, if you want to grow the business, will certainly help. So the only thing that I would say that I would try and change would be to get a mentor or a number of mentors involved as early as possible which going back to when we first started the company, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have the network. I didn't know who to speak to, which I do now. So I've developed that over time, but I would definitely say just go for it. Yeah, and mentoring is something that, that you and myself and, and many people in the industry are really um, passionate about. And, and you know, we, we hope to be able to create more opportunities for those as part of Future You. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people, particularly maybe at graduate level, are sitting there going, but I don't know anyone in the industry. How am I going to get out there and, and meet someone? And who, who'd want to mentor me? And I think, you know, you need to sort of maybe think about different types of mentoring as well. Um, and and a, part, a large part of that, obviously, is your network network and how you network um, at the current time so what's your advice to people at the moment um, about maybe you know reaching out to try and see if they can get people to just mentor them or give them advice in the sector yeah I think there is formal mentoring which is what people think about oh, I need to have a mentor and that means that I'm, I don't know I'm going to have 18 months I'm going to have a structure they're going to sit with me once a month that's not generally how it works but informal mentoring I think can be as important and that can actually happen, particularly to younger people, without them maybe even realizing it, that they are getting advice and support from somebody that is um, doing it because they're wanting to help that person to develop their skills and their knowledge. So 
from a student perspective, it's very much doing it through the university network. So when you have guest speakers that are coming into the uh, to UCB or whether you're taking part in these events, I can already see because I've opened my LinkedIn, it's going absolutely crazy. And I've had 16 connections in like 25 seconds. Um, so whether it's approaching people directly and asking them to be able to give you some advice, you do have to be direct about it. Probably it's not going to come to you without you showing some initiative um so yeah it's just putting yourself out there and it's about making yourself feeling uncomfortable i think is the thing yeah challenging yourself is always really good and 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 i mean you know i would add to that saying um it's great to see everyone um sort of you know really getting out there in linkedin and promoting themselves properly but you know when you're researching roles and when you're researching jobs and you look linkedin is a great opportunity for you to maybe find people that are doing roles that you were really um interested in and reach out to them. I mean, you know, most people will be quite happy to just have that conversation with you or to give you a little bit of advice and let you know how they got in there. I mean, part of what we do at Future You is to bring amazing career stories like like Danny's to, to all of you. But actually, there are an awful lot of people in our industry who really believe in giving back and want to be able to encourage all of you and give as much help to you because you are the future and you are the future of our, our beloved industry. Um, and so, you know, really, really do um, you know, take all this sort of advice around networking, which is critical in our sector. It really is. Um, and, and my sort of maybe final question to, to add on, because we're, we're heading to break time now, Danny, is you mentioned um, when you went to ABTA and you were having all your interviews done virtually. Now, the whole world is changing, um, in you know, as we come out of post-COVID, but, but particularly around the recruitment process. So, Again, you know, we don't know how long we are going to be, at, and, you know, doing a lot of this stuff virtually. And I can, and I do think a lot of it will continue naturally. One of those might well be initial interviews on online. So what advice can you give people about the sort of skills that they need to present themselves positively across, um, across a virtual platform? Yeah. So I think there are some practical skills of considerations at the very least so very simple things like putting yourself in a frame so that the other person can see your face clearly they can see your bodies if you want to show your hands that they can see that also practicing things like how to do share screen via zoom or via teams you don't want to be that person that's in the middle of the interview and you need to show a powerpoint presentation and then you realize that you don't know what the button looks like to share your screen because that can make it very awkward there are some usual tips when it comes to interviews, like always having questions and always being interested and so on. I think when you are um, doing it via virtually, you also need to think about projecting your voice clearly. So do you have the right setup at home with the webcam? Like not everyone has got a really sharp webcam, which doesn't necessarily mean that you, you need to have one. but Maybe if you've got a friend or a colleague that has a sharper webcam that could make it more clear, then maybe you could use someone else's laptop for the day, um, having a microphone, making sure that the tech works. Uh, obviously, you need to look smart from here, but who knows? Don't be surprised if they ask you to stand up and present as well. So don't be just wearing your shorts underneath or pajama bottom because they might try and catch you out that way. It's the kind of thing I would do. Um, I do it. I can say I do it. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's great. Thanks for that, Danny. Really, really good advice there. And, and I think, you know, a lot of takeaways for our audience today on that. Um, and actually, the other thing I would say, um, we, we were lucky enough to um, be given some amazing content from this year's ITT Mentor of the Year, a lady called Jenny Kovach. And Jenny um, is the self-proclaimed queen of being seen, and she's actually what's known as a visibility expert. And she's run a series of masterclasses for us over the last couple of months um, around things like how to be seen and confident when presenting online. And again, those masterclasses are available for you to watch on our YouTube channel. They're quite long, but they really are worth it. And um, we had a lot of students um, watching the first time round who found it really useful. I certainly found it useful and learned things as well. So again, some more um, content for you to, to carry on with there. Um, I'm just checking, there's been a lot of information around LinkedIn, which is great. I'm so pleased. You know, when we first started doing these 10 years ago, Danny, we used to have, we used to ask the question, didn't we, how many people have got a LinkedIn profile? And we maybe would be lucky if we have one or two students put their hands up. And yeah. now 
Oh, we probably have one or two who don't put their hands up. So well done for all of you for embracing LinkedIn. It's phenomenally important. So um, Danny, always a pleasure. I'll be talking to you within hours, probably. Um, but good to see you. And thanks once again for sharing your story. And I know, judging by all the comments, everyone really, really loved it. So we're going to break now for a quick, um, just a five, ten minute break, everybody, just to get up, you know, go and make yourself another coffee or a cup of tea, stretch your legs, get the blood pumping again. And as, we, as soon as we come back, um, we're going to head back to to carry on the fascinating story of Nick's um, career progression. So could we please try and all be back here by quarter to 11, and we'll aim to start as soon after that as possible. So see you all in a minute. And uh, I just want to welcome him back. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fab, isn't it? I mean, Danny was saying about practicing and no matter how many times you practice and how many times you've done these things such as screen sharing and things technology still has a wonderful way of throwing curveballs at you um, certainly I had one this morning when my screen share just went blank in front of me which is why I didn't know if it was working and that was absolutely on my end nothing to do with the setup here um, so Nick welcome back um, now we were halfway through your fascinating career journey um when when unfortunately technology got the best of you but um please great to great to have you back so so carry on thank you i, I believe you can hear me but right now i'm <laughs> i was working fine i did a test just during the break but uh currently it won't let me share my camera but if you can hear me then we have half of me there and i will keep going what a okay. strange uh, strange day um let me just try one last time now that you've dropped off. And I think this is now working. OK, yeah, so I was telling my uh, story. And um, I've shared the link in the main chat. And I will also share it on the screen so you don't absolutely have to be there. Um, thanks very much. And it was really, really interesting hearing Danny's story, actually, because he prompted some, some thoughts uh, or some things that I think I should tell you. Uh, which I didn't necessarily plan to tell you, but I think, you know, um, to really uh, relate to some of the things he was saying there, what I was, uh, I'm not quite sure where it cut off, but what I was saying was um, I started my studies at the University of Westminster. I took a break when I had this amazing opportunity to write the NetJetters column for The Guardian, um, which was a reader's backed journey. And the reason I want to just frame this idea of opportunity is during your career you will encounter different opportunities and in my opinion and from my experience it's important to go after opportunities when they are there for you because of course life is full of opportunities but there's probably been just two really defining opportunities that i've managed to leverage and i would say they've defined my entire career and everything that i'm doing so if i hadn't gone after those opportunities there might be a lot of regrets, um, but I, I always go after things which my gut is telling me to go for. So as much as we live in a world filled, filled with data and data-driven strategies, sometimes your gut is a very good indicator of what's good. I've included on the board, I won't read it to you, but I included throughout this journey my biography that I presented of myself at that time in history. I had to really dig and dig. And um, it's it's kind of crazy to think how things really changed. Back uh, in 2002 and 2004, I was talking about myself as uh, this aspiring photographer who was exploring other, other things to do in life. And that just gradually progressed. I created off the back of The Guardian, uh, my own website, which I had to code myself. Uh, very, very challenging. I'm not somebody who I ever considered to be particularly technical. I didn't study that and I wasn't that interested in that, but I did want to get my own website online. And back in 2004, there were no out of the box solutions to doing that. You had to get your hands dirty. You had to figure out applications like Dreamweaver and you had to do a lot of the HTML coding yourself. Today, those opportunities look a bit different. It might be opportunities related to automation or other areas which you could exploit. But still, although you may not know a particular field or area, if that's interesting and you can see the opportunity, 
you have to invest your own time into understanding how to maximize that. So I even set myself, you know, back when I was, what age was I then? I've actually written it below because, uh, here we go, I was 21. I actually decided that I was going to set a launch date for this website. I was so excited about it. And, you know, so many years later, I've gone through so many different website release dates and campaign release dates that it's kind of strange to look all the way back then and think, you know, we was, I was still in that frame of mind about launching something to the, to the wider world. That was an opportunity that I absolutely leveraged. And um, I didn't have a long-term goal. I just had that feeling that this exposure was something brilliant and that could set me up for new opportunities further down the line. When I was building this, I actually didn't even, I didn't even make that link between the date that I graduated, but basically I returned to university to complete my final year of studies. And I graduated in 2004. It's, it's simply not even there because honestly, that was not a defining moment for me. Um, so everybody's career path will be quite different, but I already knew that I didn't want to do photography and I wanted to explore perhaps that creative side of me, but do something quite different. So in 2005, I created and I teamed up with uh, somebody who was doing a bit of television presenting who I knew, and we created this podcast called iPod Traveler. Now, this was really significant because back then, um, Apple announced that they were going to launch this new thing called podcasts. And it was revolutionary at the time because it was an opportunity to allow anybody to create effectively their own radio shows. And this was something that I was so excited about. And I thought, wow, I can take these ideas that I have, this sort of travel guide website, into a podcast. And so we created iPod Traveler. There were uh, weekly episodes that we were producing. It was a huge learning curve. I had to learn to build XML um, uh, structure for the, for the podcast. Again, something I'd never done before. There were no apps to just do that out of the box. And it was such a huge success. And one of the things that made it a success was A, being first, B, being early, and C, really just being myself in that space. Um, I created, I teamed up with somebody, we loved what we did, and it became a huge, huge success. We didn't do this with a view to being successful entrepreneurs or going into business. We did it out of passion, and the success from a career point of view followed that. So that was a really, really exciting journey. It taught me a lot. It taught me how to create something, how to design something from stretch, scratch. It taught me a lot about strategy and a lot about how the world, your consumers and the business world, react to things that you put out there. So there were so many lessons in that, but also the lesson to not rely on somebody all the time to teach you uh, different things, to teach yourself and to create opportunities where you want to go. Um, this was a hugely successful travel show. We stayed, uh, iTunes had a really big um, focus on on podcasts for a few years and um every time you logged into the itunes store you saw featured podcasts and we were very lucky to be featured uh, almost continuously on the home page of of itunes for about two years um I mean, it was really incredible and we stayed consistently at number one on the um on the travel section which was which was just brilliant you know and we saw the likes of lonely planet and all these other big big brands uh, big publishers popping up, uh, launching podcasts, and never managing to knock us off the top spot. So that was something that also was really driving us and really motivational. And you can see from this logo, yes, that is me. We had a lot of fun with it. You know, we we kind of didn't take it too seriously, and we built up this huge global following of of listeners. Um, you know, which was which was really unexpected. We never planned to do that, but we had about 24,000 subscribers who were tuning in and downloading it every single week when we released a new episode. Of course, by today's numbers, it's probably not that high, but this is back then when there were a lot less, um, there were, yeah, there were a lot less um, people uh, online and consuming things like podcasts. And so this was really an opportunity that raised a lot of interest interest um, amongst the industry. Um, we did a lot of sponsored shows. Um, one of the ones that was my favorite was um, the show we did with Monarch Airlines. Obviously, they no longer exist. Um, they, they 
went bankrupt um, not so long ago, and that was quite a significant moment for the travel industry. Um, but this sort of taught us how to work with business and how to work with brands. You know, for us, it was just fun. But uh, for those brands, it was exposure. It was tapping into a new market through a new medium. And this taught me that, you know, brands are always looking for new opportunities to tap into something, to reach a new community. And this was the blogging back then uh, that really mattered. So in 2006, I was approached by Tui Fly. Uh, which was the German low-cost uh, subsidiary of TUI. Um, and they wanted to create uh, their own podcast. In fact, they approached us and said, we really love iPod Traveler, and we want to do the same for the airline. So that was a big moment for me. I was only 23, this huge opportunity in front of me. I borrowed my dad's car, and I drove to Hanover to negotiate with him. I mean, nobody does this today. Everything is remote. I almost can't believe myself that I did that face to face in person. But somehow it worked actually. We met in their office, I sat down, it was just myself, and I negotiated this idea for a show for, for Tui Fly. And there and then on the spot, drafted a contract, put it in front of them, and they came uh, back to sign the contract. And they said, you know what, Nick, um, thank you so much for coming over to Hanover. <laughs> which was, you know, really exciting as a 23-year-old. I think I was more excited by the idea of it than, than actually what was lying ahead. They said, but um, my boss just told me that this has to be in German because we're a German airline and our market is German. And at that moment, I said, okay. I mean, it was very stressful. I thought, I don't have a clue how I can do this. Um, they wanted the same format, uh, a guy and a girl, chatty and traveling. Uh, but in German. And my simple answer was, yeah, that's not a problem. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I said, not a problem. It will be in German. We signed the contract and then I left their office and I went straight onto Gumtree and I published an ad for a German uh, presenter who would fit the description of what we needed. And within a couple of days, I had a, uh, I, was re I, I had a lot of um, people getting in touch. And one was a guy called Frank Bruckner, who was doing a lot of uh, German uh, sort of dramas and soaps. And he was actually quite well known as an actor. And he said, this sounds so exciting. Um, I would love to get involved. How can we do it? And I explained that I pitched a really, really low price to them because, well, frankly, I had no business experience. Um, and I really didn't have a lot of money, but somehow, that belief in what we were doing was stronger than the money. And Frank said, you know what, I don't care. This is cool, this is exciting, I'm on board, and I can get uh, a female presenter to co-host it with. So then we're sorted. And, and this girl, Emily Bear, who was doing a lot of films, uh, got on board and she loved it just as much as he did. And that was the start of the business that I founded, which is called SE1 Media. Um, I actually got the contract before I had the business. And then I went home, and I spoke to an accountant that was introduced to me and I set up the business from there. So I had no business plan, no business acumen, you could say. Uh, perhaps there was potential. And I created the company. And within a few months, we were booming. People were asking for podcasts. I built the website, uh, again, through Dreamweaver. And next thing I knew, everybody wanted podcasts and we were inundated. That was such an amazing opportunity to leverage that Guardian exposure to build a, a name for myself and to follow what I was passionate about by talking about travel. That led to so many other things that followed that. And I never once hesitated. I just went after every single opportunity that came about. Well, because I didn't have a business plan or a strategy, um, I also didn't really have any investment. And I also didn't have a long-term vision of where this was going. I was taking each day as it came. And everything goes in waves. And one of the things to understand is that, you know, technology and digital trends also go in waves. So within two or three years, podcasting was no longer the thing that every business had to have. And it very quickly uh, moved on. And we had less and less inquiries and there was less and less interest. Uh, we were doing things like financial podcasts, which were really exciting. We replaced all the equipment, um, you know, and this was all self-taught. But at some point I thought, okay, this is not so much business now. And I started to focus on, you know, a career. Maybe I don't want to continue doing the business. And I saw a job advertised, which 
for me at the time was quite difficult to get my head around applying for because the job was web administrator doesn't exactly sound very exciting um and having successfully had a lot of great business for a couple of years the idea of going into a role which had this rather underwhelming title of web administrator was a bit almost humiliating because i felt really successful from everything i'd achieved but at the same time i saw the opportunity there which i just was exciting for me. Um, it was in Brussels and I was living in the UK and I thought I've never lived in another country before and I've always dreamed of that. It wasn't even far away so that was kind of exciting and I went for this job and um, I was really thrown in a deep end because um, the European Travel Commission, which was the job that it was for, um, they were a very small team, five people, and uh, they had a huge responsibility to promote Europe in markets all around the world, from Japan to Brazil to Canada and the US. Um, and they were responsible for the visiteurope.com portal. And when I joined, there were a lot of uh, political kind of turmoil in the organization because um, there had been a huge investment in the previous website, publicly funded, and it needed to move on. It wasn't nimble, it wasn't kind of uh, really in touch with consumers. So I was recruited because of what I had done with the podcast. Um, and, you know, I pitched and sold myself well, but I put myself right in the deep end. I was, you know, out of my depth, but ready to learn and, and work fast. And that was a really, really rapid learning curve. Um, nobody was there to teach me, I have to say. My boss um, had planned to leave her job and effectively uh, she thought that I would be someone who could step into that job. And you know that career moved so, so fast where we had to rebuild the whole visiteurope.com website. You know, that's an enormous task, the consumer portal for Destination Europe. And it was really all on me to take that idea forward. So just very quickly, I figured out what needs to be done to create a request for proposals, to outline and describe what we wanted from the site in incredible detail to put that out there in the market and see who comes back and who would uh, respond to that offer. And it was a five year job that really, really gave me the second wave of opportunities. So I spoke about two opportunities in my career. This was the second one. Um, we worked through a process of a, about a year and a half and we built this new site, which was, um, you know, I have to say this was back in 2008. And if I compare it to today's site, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure which one is better. Um, 2008, this was what we produced. We integrated Street View on every page. We allowed you to discover Europe, but then to jump into those Street View locations of every single major point and attraction in Europe. We reimagined the concept of creating pan-European content so it didn't compete with uh, individual country uh, websites or destination websites. So we focused on, for example, the Alps, the Baltic states, the North Sea. And we went through an enormous editorial process to create hundreds of new pieces of content, um, to work with a design agency to rebuild the whole website and to translate everything into multiple languages. And then a couple of years later, release a Chinese version in China. The the lesson that that taught me, I don't even know where I can begin describing to you. The first thing was working in an international organization with a board of directors from every single country in Europe. In the first months of my job, I had to go on stage and I had to present what I was putting forward as a marketing plan. This is someone who didn't have the experience in that. I had to stand there, I had to prepare my presentation and I had to present it to um, a, a set of directors that comprise 35 different national tourism boards. Very, very senior and frankly, very scary. And um, I can really relate to what Danny was saying because um, I, I, that was something I, I couldn't do. I mean, I was almost ready to cancel the trip because it was something, you know, we had board meetings in different countries as well. And the pressure of preparing that was just absolutely insane. Um, I remember being sick in the toilets half an hour before, thinking, wow, Jesus, I can't do this. I literally can't do this. But somehow I, I also knew that I didn't have a choice. This is what life throws at you. You you will face these situations. 
And if you can find that strength in yourself to just push yourself forward, to put yourself into that fire zone, which you don't want to be in, you will, will, will grow from that. Um, and you will for sure make mistakes, but you will certainly grow from that. And I had a, um, I, I also had a, uh, this is something I never tell publicly. This is even the first time. Um, I have a condition called a central tremor, which effectively gives you a tremor all the time. So thrown in with that really pressurized situation, I also had this exaggerated tremor, which was brought on and made much worse. So I just couldn't imagine, I couldn't even plug in the computer on the stage, you know, it was, it was too terrifying. But I did it and the response was overwhelmingly positive. Um, and I had a lot of fierce criticism from two or three countries which didn't like the idea of this, but I faced it up and I argued my case and I stood my ground and I knew what I wanted to do and I knew that it was the right thing to do. And that positive feedback that I had really drove me to feel more confident the next time and the next time and the next time. And honestly, I've done probably more than a thousand keynotes um, in this 15 years. But for the first five years, every time I went on stage, I was really a wreck, you know, but I still kept doing it because this is where the opportunities uh, come forward. Um, so I threw myself into that and it worked out. Well, I won't talk too much more about my career at the European Travel Commission, but it was a very small organization. And that meant um, when the director, the executive director left the organization, there was nobody to step into that position. So I had this next opportunity, which was to become the acting executive director whilst they recruited for a new executive director. So there's me, 29 years old, and I'm the executive director of the official tourism organization for Europe. And during that time, I could see that the finances of the organization were not in the best state. And so I spent a lot of time building relationships and relationships are really key to your career. We were in Brussels, so I spent a lot of time with officials and MEPs and uh, director, um, people from the European Commission to make the case for what we were trying to do in promoting Europe. And incredibly, um, we managed to increase the budget eight times over just by building those relationships. Um, I wrote a ministerial accord and then I went to uh, Poland where there was a, a um, there was a meeting of all the tourism ministers in Europe. And we had Vice President Tajani from the European Commission present this accord, which I had written just the week before. Um, and again, never written anything like that. And all of the tourism ministers signed this accord. And for me, that was just an overwhelming sense of achievement. Um, I never imagined that I could do that. And especially, coming from that photographic arts background um, where I was almost embarrassed to tell people what I'd studied because it wasn't uh, deemed the right academic path to doing something like this. You can achieve anything and you need to just believe in yourself. And even if others don't believe in you, you have to make them believe in you. So after six months of that, I decided not to go for that job. Um, I had, I can't say too much, but I had two or three of the board members of the organization quite vocally critical saying we cannot have someone so young uh, take this position and based on that alone uh, they weren't going to consider me further so obviously today and also back then by the way that is frankly discriminatory but it's also you know one of the sad realities of the world today is that you will face discrimination in all forms for every reason imaginable, and for me that was um, that was a uh, that was a point of discrimination. I felt it was very unjust. I didn't feel that you know age was actually the issue there, and I had achieved a lot, and I th thought I had demonstrated that um, simply by <laughs> increasing the budget alone was was a quite a strong case. I thought, and the success of the site, but I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get past that hurdle, um, and I decided that in that case I wanted to pursue my own thing. So I withdrew my application and I decided to uh, focus on my own passion, my own ideas. I still had the company and I went back to it and I created the platform, the Digital Tourism Think Tank. I had um, some really great advice from two or three people who said, you know, keep the name focused on tourism, be clear about what you're doing. And um, I've put a few things on the board here, but I can't even begin to tell you the journey since 2012 to today. Um, so just under 10 years of the Digital Tourism Think Tank. 
uh, we very quickly became this global platform for tourism, connecting professionals from destinations over the entire world. And I built on the fact that people knew my name, they knew what I was doing, and they had a respect for that. And I used that as an opportunity to create a platform which was free of all forms of politics. That was my key driving force. I wanted to create a platform to connect the whole industry and to have no politics involved in anything because that was the background that I was coming from. That was the block to my opportunities. And that was something that people really, really responded well to. Um, and today, you know, when I see what we're doing and the comments we have, the comments we have from those that we connect in the industry is, we love the way you do things. We love the way you deliver your events. We love the way you're so frank and down to earth. And that is something that's, you know, quite rare sometimes in an industry where you have a lot of publicly funded organizations. And then with that, a lot of politics, protocol, and, um, you know, and, and not really the kind of dynamic style of working that actually most of us want to be doing. There's been so many achievements over the years. Um, in the first year I launched with an event um, called the Digital Tourism Innovation Campus. Again, going back to negotiation and opportun opportunity, I was in touch with someone through Yahoo that I had met previously. And I actually flew to Barcelona to meet this woman. And I said, I have an idea and I wanna meet you in person and I wanna pitch it to you. I was very, very upfront. I don't think I've ever sold so directly like that uh, since. I sat down, I had coffee with her and I said, look, I have this idea for an event. I have no money and I need your help. Um, and I'm looking for, it was quite a few thousand, I will tell you that, I can't tell you how much. Um, and I need Yahoo to get on board and get behind it. Otherwise I can't do it. And she came back and she said, you know what, we're, we're on board. If you can bring these people here, then we will do the event and we can host it in our office, which was this incredible Yahoo creative space. And really, that was the start of the digital tourism think tank. Getting one person to believe in that idea and back it um, was what we needed. And from there, everything took off. The next year, we were doing um, the Digital Tourism Innovation Campus in Dubai together with Yahoo. And we brought together all of the travel trade from Dubai with their support. And we just continued to produce really, really great events. We started to partner with people like Etoa and run a series of workshops on how to get ready for this you know, huge trend of mobile, which people were still figuring out. We then started to develop consulting. I had just one member of staff through the first couple of years. Um, the money I received from that sponsor, I just put straight back into my first employee. I didn't take any money myself. I just lived off the bare minimum. And that was a really smart move because with one extra person, I could start to experiment with things. And she had a great research background. She studied at the uh, Bournemouth University and she did benchmarking of destinations. So when I was introduced to her, I thought, wow, this is great. We can be a research company and we can really focus on uh, developing what she's done further. And um, this led to so many different opportunities. This is one of my favorites, so I thought I would include it. We went to Greenland and we developed some strategic ideas around how uh, Air Greenland could develop their sort of private charter offer. Um, that meant we had a helicopter for the day and we could fly anywhere in Greenland with that. I mean, I don't need to tell you what an incredible experience that was. But we started to work on digitalization programs, working with hundreds of SMEs around the industry to help small and medium-sized enterprises develop. But at the same time, we continued to develop the events. Digital Innovation Campus came back year after year the destinations who were attending started to say, we really love this, can we host it? So we did the next one in Camp Nou, in uh, the home of FC Barcelona. That was all covered by sponsors and support. And then we worked with um, Telefonica to host it in the Mobile World Center. The next thing we knew, everybody wanted to be part of this. We'd created a momentum that was exciting. And people were saying, we want to host, we want to have your event in our country. We launched the Norwegian digital, digital Travel Conference, which became the biggest travel conference in Norway. And then as things started to move, learning from what happened with the podcasting is that you have a cycle of success and things drop and that's okay. So we started to realize that the Innovation Campus event was losing its momentum. It was losing that freshness. So we relaunched the event as DTTT Global, bigger and more ambitious. We said, okay, Innovation Campus has been great. Let's get the entire world 
to the event. And how do we do that? We'll call it global and it will change people's perception. And the next year we had an event where 80% of the speakers were coming from North America, from Asia, from all around the world and not from Europe. And it changed the whole dynamics. We had people like Brand USA visit California and all uh, like Singapore coming to the event and saying, we love this platform. It's unique and it's different. That led us to create a different event called Campus, which used destinations like the Faroe Islands as a canvas to play and explore ideas. And that just has created endless momentum throughout the years. Um, we've developed a membership on the back of that. We've developed a really great consulting team and the events still continue to be the flagship. Now, fast forward to 2020, and obviously you've got the pandemic. Um, the events are a major, major source of our revenue, but so is consulting. And one thing we didn't expect, and I actually expected the opposite, was when the industry shut down and said, we can't operate anymore, we have no more business, we expected the public sector to scale up, to invest in development and support, to help the industry to re-strategize, to rebuild. And that is exactly the opposite of what happened. So whilst the whole country was putting everybody on furlough and saving their money effectively, saving themselves from bankruptcy, I made a gut instinct decision that this was not the time to put people on furlough. This was the time to actually invest more. So we spent the last year retaining almost the whole team and building new programs to help uh, industries pivot, to help industry re-strategize, to support our members like we've never supported them before, to call them and say, how can we help you? And one of the most toughest learning curves I've ever had is that the industry wasn't ready. The, so the resources we created were brilliant, um, but the industry wasn't ready. The public sector also froze. The public sector put everybody on furlough, which was shocking for us because we didn't think that was right. We thought that the public sector should keep people and help the businesses, but that's not what happened. So as a result of that, we had almost no business last year. We were in crisis. We lost all the money we had generated over years and years of success in an instant. And that's just what happened. But we kept believing in what we were doing. We created an event called X Festival. Uh, as a CEO and director, I was looking at the bank balance every day saying, oh God, I hope you know this has to turn around. We're keeping all of our staff and we're not seeing any money come in and this can only go so far, but we can't disappear right now. We have to scale up. And we created this event and again, just like Global was an ambition to go further, we created X Festival and the idea with X Festival was to go even bigger than anything we'd ever done before. And I'm pretty certain, I can't say it with absolute certainty, I don't have someone from the Guinness World Records book, but I'm pretty certain that X Festival was the biggest event in the travel industry of 2020. We had more than 100 speakers coming from every single corner of the world. And by the way, as UCB are members of our organization, all the students can get access to all the content for free. So do reach out to find out how, if you don't know how. And um, this was really, really a huge success. We live streamed it, we upped our production capabilities, we invested in new equipment, we worked with Switzerland Tourism to stream it from their office because as you've seen here, we don't have the most stable of connections and we continued that hard struggle to negotiate and to build new things. And right now I can tell you that that has paid off because January and February this year, we've had more business than we had in the entire 2019. Just overnight, we've seen a total transformation and it, is reassuring for us to know that if you believe in yourself and what you're doing, this, the results will come eventually and you have to be committed to that and you have to find a way to do that. Today, we have obviously these great events. We have a new event coming and we also have a really extensive membership program, which as I say, UCB um, have full access to, which includes lots of learning, lots of talks, lots of material, workshop, workshops, case studies, template packs, and we continue to do really, really innovative things with online streaming and online workshops, using tools like this to get people thinking differently. We have a membership that's for academia, business and destinations. And we created a call to action for the industry called Support Tourism Impact Real People, 
uh, it's an open source campaign to encourage uh, everybody to wear that badge and support tourism. We have had to downscale because of the situation. We're a team of six. We were previously a team of 10. But you know what? We're actually doing more and to a higher quality than we've ever done in our entire history. So sometimes having more resources doesn't bring you more success. So that's my story. Um, I hope that's been inspiration. I hope that's also shown you that whatever you feel about your academic career and success, um, it's up to you to define the journey and what you make of it. Now, I'm not sure how much time I have uh, because it's been a bit disrupted, um, but feel free to just jump in and tell me if you, um, if you need sort of 15 minutes or something like that. Um, but I thought I would focus now on what matters in terms of getting ahead. So what matters, first of all, is having the right kind of confidence. We get applications day in and day out. Uh, we get speculative applications. In fact, we almost never advertise jobs. Um, and this has been one of the surprising things to us is that we just have a constant flow of applications because we've created a name for ourselves. But finding the right candidates with the right confidence is really, really difficult because everybody's leaving university full of bravado, full of confidence, often a lot of arrogance, to be completely blunt, and it doesn't always leave a very good impression. One of the most difficult things for a potential employer is trying to cut through what you're saying and what is genuine, because everybody oversells themselves. And actually, what I've learned over the years is the best candidates and the best employees are those that are perhaps a little bit less confident and a little bit more transparent and open about who they are. We're actually very cautious and wary of somebody who can sell themselves amazingly. So try not to create the most perfect self that you can be when you present yourself. Try to be very transparent and honest about who you are, whilst being confident about the things that you've achieved and being able to tell the story around this. What we find day in and day out, and it's the biggest challenge, is writing skills. It's the biggest limit to progressing your career, in my opinion, if you want to go into strategy and research. Writing is so important, whether you share an opinion or whether you uh, can draft or communicate an idea. So if this is your weak point, make sure you address that and work on that. Practice and learn. When I started doing what I was doing for The Guardian, my writing was terrible. I mean, it was grammatically poor. It was um, in terms of spelling, it was poor. And in terms of phrasing things, it was poor. But I did so much of it that I learned to enjoy it. And now I really, really love writing. And actually, when people look at what I write, they, they're sometimes like, wow, how do you write like that? It's not something that I, you know, I didn't get brilliant grades. I just did more of it. And that exposure is something that's really good. Um, but it's also one of the biggest challenges. And sometimes it's hard to progress someone's career in the company if they're not able to communicate their ideas in writing, because it's so important. Um, so think about that. And knowledge capacity is really, really key. Obviously, there's the knowledge that's taught to you, which is great. But there's also the knowledge that you develop yourself. And for you to be able to further your career, it's important that you go way beyond what has been taught to you. We always have this clash of, um, of coming across, and this is because we're a small business as well, coming across uh, people who have been taught everything, but they don't have the real experience. They don't have the feeling for what they've been taught. And others that teach themselves and they continue to pursue a topic because it's something that they're really passionate about. We want the latter because it means that they will continue that curiosity in their job. They'll continue to explore ideas about what's possible. And um, it's important to, you know, really refine your skills. So if you've got an, a, a great degree, make sure you take things further by working on something that really matters to you. Um, we heard about LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is a great platform to share your ideas, to share your opinions. Very few young people, I think, use uh, the article feature in LinkedIn, but it's such a great way for you to create your own blog without having to bother with the website and everything. And when you create a really brilliant piece, people pick up on it, people comment on it, and it's a brilliant way of getting visibility. Maturity. Maturity is very, very important. Um, you've got to be humble, you've got to be modest, and you've got to be ready to step up. So that idea of being able to stand up in a uh, webinar or a conference call or a meeting is, is a really key thing. 
you've got to put the right attitude into the work you do and you've got to be ready to stand in front of a group even if that's two or three colleagues and pitch and share your ideas and stand behind them um, this is so important taking full responsibility for the outcome of what you do and also when you get negative feedback which you will get again and again and again in the first few years of your work you'll get comments about you know uh, not delivering or not being phrased in the right way or, or not going in the right direction you need to take it on board and listen to what's being uh, that guidance that's being given to you and work from that and certainly not take anything personally because that's a that's a disaster area um, now the thing is one of the things that always surprises me is how um, we always assume that young people and I say in quotes um, are digital, digitally savvy. And the, the idea that they can teach older generations so much more, what well, is simply not true anymore. One of the biggest disappointments as an employer is the poor digital skills that I often see when we do that recruitment process. And this is a big barrier. So you have to really, really get into digital, embrace the tools that are in front of you that you're using and be incredible at using digital in every way possible. You need to be able to do this because the, the truth is that the workplace that you'll be going into is more likely than not to already be very, very digitally advanced in how they do things, how they collaborate, how they work together. So you need to also be having ideas about, for example, with your peers um, at university, how you can have breakout sessions and workshop and collaborate on ideas already. This is something you can actually bring to the workspace. Now, that's also relating to professional skills. Now, the other type of skill set, which is really key, is innovation. Um, seems to be some background noise. So I don't know if there's some something unmuted, but it's uh, getting a bit of interference. Um, innovation skills are really, really key. Now, during the lockdown, we've actually taken the opportunity ourselves to invest in continuing to learn more about innovation. One of the best resources is IBM Design. It's a completely free, there's a couple of completely free courses you can do, and this will really help you further your career. You can undertake a free course and get a co-creator badge. And this teaches you the sort of soft skills of applying innovation, understanding what a great experience looks like, and being able to uh, learn more about service design so you can help, whether that's your next employer, whether that's in your own business, or whether that's your future clients, help to shape incredible experiences which are based on observational research and on having a human-centered design approach to everything. Um, it involves using tools like Mural, and we see this uh, as, a, as a kind of leading edge uh, skill set being used everywhere. So this is an example of Ilde la Madeleine co-creating and collaborating on the development of new product together with all of the different businesses in the Ile de la Madeleine in Canada. So it's a, just a great example of how communities and businesses are using design. Now, if you can be a champion and a facilitator of this, you will really put yourself ahead in your career because this kind of strategy capability is really, really sought after. And frankly, you can go through that process of teaching yourself with all of the online resources that are available. Um, so IBM is a great resource for that. Now, we use it all the time. So this is an example of um, an idea session, a workshop that we ran with um, some different clients. Um, we integrate um, offline and online technologies. So you can see uh, the guy in the video there, he's uh, scanning the wall to incorporate things into the board. And we create an experience in the strategy process itself. And it's a really, really great way to start thinking about how in your role, in your future career, you can really bring something to that next employer. Yeah, that's um, great, Nick. Nick, I'm really, really sorry, but we are really running over now. And no, I, okay. so can we wrap up? I, I do apologize for interrupting because it is really interesting. But we've got another two speakers to, to fit in. Before no problem. Yeah, so oh, I will just quickly summarize what else is on the board and you've got the link there. So basically you've got four different you know, pathways that you can pursue. There's entrepreneurship, which I've talked to you about. There's the traditional employment pathway. There's intrapreneurship, where you join a company which fosters small startup teams within it. And there's the academia route. And they're all really, really filled with opportunity. So have a look at that. And I've summarized some of the key points there to think about when you consider those career paths. Lastly, growth spotting. 
Um, I've covered a whole series of different areas which are growing in the industry, from both sectors to the type of companies hiring to the profiles that people are seeking. And importantly, I've given you some really key advice on how to keep growing, how to make sure you never stop learning, and how to look at everything with a user perspective. This is all on the board. It's all detailed and quite descriptive. So you can take your own time to look through that. But I hope that will be useful for you. And I just want to say a big thank you for your patience with the earlier technical problems. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate you following along. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Nick, thank you so much. That was honestly, I really enjoyed the mural staff. It was great. You, you know, you really pulled a fantastic present presentation together. And also those great tips at the end. I mean, all of them top, you know, top notch and nothing to add to that. So I'm sorry we don't have a chance to do any questions, but um, I'm sure you're happy to, to maybe answer any that are on the chat if you if you can hang around for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I will certainly get back on the chat. That would be great. Thank you so much. And Thanks a lot. On behalf of IT Future U and for UCB for your for your time today, much thank you. Right. Um, so great, great stuff from Nick there, and uh, despite the little interruption, and I hope you thoroughly enjoyed that. Now, I'm really pleased to be introducing our next guest speaker. Um, Jamie Lee first attended um, a the, well, she attended the very first ever ICT Future U event at World Travel Market when she was still herself a student. And nine years later, she was on stage telling her story. So I'm really, really happy that she's back here today to share that with you. I work closely with Jamie Lee in her role as Executive Director for BAME Women in Travel. Um, and she's got a great story to tell. And um, I'm gonna hand over to you now, Jamie Lee. Are you there? Oh, looks like she's coming online. Yeah, we are clear. Hey, Thank you. There you are. <laughs> sure. Just figuring, <laughs> out, just figuring out the, the screen sharing, um, making sure we've got it working for you guys. Um, can you see it okay? I'm Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Brilliant. I'll mute myself now and over to you. Hi, so good morning, everyone. I hope you can see me. I hope it's loading up. Hi, so welcome. As Claire said, my name is Jamie Lee Avtar. And as she mentioned, I am the executive director for the Women and Travel BAME program. And BAME stands for Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic. Um, so, and I'm also a tourism consultant. Uh, working with destinations and tour operators. So today I wanna to talk to you guys about the steps to carving out a career in the travel industry. Um, for me, I've had a really interesting journey and this is one of my favorite quotes here. And it says, life is a journey, not a destination. And this is really, I, I, this is a quote that I hold really close to me because um, it really has, has directed my entire kind of career journey and my career path to date. Um, I mean, it has been, as Claire mentioned, sorry, I'm, it's, it's sticking a little bit with the PowerPoint. So yeah, I'm originally from Barbados. Barbados is home for me. And that's where my journey and my love for travel and tourism really, really started and was ignited. Barbados is a, a tourist destination predominantly with the majority of the GDP, GDP coming from um, travel and tourism. So I've always been around the, the industry. I've always seen the industry and my parents were very, very much, um, they love to travel around different islands in the Caribbean on group trips and stuff like that. So travel and tourism, it has really been in my blood from very early. Although I slightly wanted to become a media presenter. That was really my goal. But my mom is the one who convinced me into going into the travel and tourism industry. And I don't think she made a, a bad um, choice there now considering that I still get the opportunity to talk and to present to people like I am today. So as I mentioned Barbados is home for me so my first real job in the travel and tourism industry was in Barbados and 
it was, I was about, mm, I think I was about 18, let's say I was about 18. I saw an ad in the newspaper. They were looking for, the, at the time they called them meet and greet hostesses um, for a destination management company. And this destination management company was called, it's called Foster and Inks. It's still one of the leading um, destination management companies in Barbados today. And they handle a lot of cruise they work with the cruise ships particularly, so air to sea and, and and taking passengers. So basically their role is to take passengers from the cruise ship to the airport and vice versa. And then they're all, of course, passengers who will stay in the destination for longer periods of time as well. So we will be responsible for them for throughout that entire process. And then of course, making sure that the crew and everyone on board is safe, secure, all of that. So it, 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 it put me right into the world of cruise tourism. And it was a really exciting, um, I was really excited to get the role. So it was meet and greet hostess. And on the first day of my um, job, I got to the airport, I reported to the airport on time and they handed me a sign and they said, okay, so your job today is to basically hold this sign, stand on the corner on the curb side of the airport and just direct passengers around. Of course I was like, okay, is that what, is that what my role would entail, just stand there with a sign? But I took that, I took that on, I guess, because of my vision and I knew what I kind of in in some way no knew where I wanted to kind of go with my career in travel somewhat so I took that role re on really you know took it on really to, to heart and I would stand on the side of the curbside and I would be chatting to the passengers and you know really interacting and engaging making sure they had a great trip in Barbados and it was probably within like a few weeks that the the supervisor for the airport she saw me and she was like you know what I want to give you more responsibilities and I think this was like in two to three weeks and she was like I want to give you more responsibilities and she kind of gave me her headset and her clipboards and she was like okay you're gonna start me, uh, basically going on board the um the vehicles that would bring the passengers in and just giving them the update in terms of what will happen next so that started there for me I started going on to the buses and introducing bar talking to making sure they had a good trip in Barbados and then eventually she, she moved me onto the air side and the air side is basically where the planes land on the runway and I was I was, was responsible then for going on board the airplanes and making the initial announcement welcoming guests to the to the Barbados and it was a really great opportunity because I got to I got to one engage with um tourists coming to the island and I got to practice my presenting skills <laughs> I didn't know that at the time but I was practicing my kind of presenting skills and talking to individuals um fortunately at that time while I was doing that job I was still at university so that was like a part-time job um to allow me some to give me some extra cash to go partying and enjoying life <laughs> um I then um as I was leave so I, I was finishing university one of the um managers at the company Foster and Inks she she pulled me one side and she said, Jamie Lee, we are going to have an opening for our junior cruise operation executive in the office. And I really want you to apply for this role. And I was like, OK, sure. And I applied. And luckily enough, I, you know, I'm not really luckily, but your my determination, my hard work. They saw the passion. They saw my enthusiasm. They saw all of this great stuff from having that role at the airport as a meet and greet hostess. And they knew that it was something that they wanted to bring into their organization. So it was offered that role when I finished university. And that was why I say my first real job, my first real paycheck <laughs> every month straight out of university uh, was a great opportunity for me. Getting to work inside the office, it gave me, I was able to see the logistical side and the operational side of the cruise and tourism, the cruise industry. And I'd say that that really ignited my passion then for marketing. I had I had always drawn to marketing in my coursework, but having this role really, really made me want to understand consumer behavior, really want to understand what made consumers choose a particular destination over another, made me want to understand how to build a brand image. And that's when I kind of decided that, you know, I wanted to go overseas and do some more to further my studies in that area in marketing particularly. And I went to Bournemouth University, um, which was a really great experience having the chance to, you know, um, 
to, to study to study there. Uh, during part of that course, actually, I was you were allowed to basically do a year's internship. Now, this was a big stretch for me. I saw it as a great opportunity coming from Barbados and coming into the UK to be able to expand my knowledge of the UK travel market. But of course, that's extremely challenging as a you know young graduate. How are you going to get into a role? So I thought, well, they're offering a year's internship as part of the course. If I can find an organization to basically so, um, give me this role, that would be amazing. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about the world travel market, um, but it's a huge trade show that happens every year barring last year um and it happens every year since so basically we're all the destinations to operate is everyone in the travel industry they all gather for meetings they're great um, they're amazing sessions on different uh things happening in the travel and tourism industry and it's a huge it's a really great platform to kind of branch off um, and to find out where you want to go in terms of the travel and tourism industry and to make new contacts. So I decided the, the class was actually, I came in September. I came to the UK in September 20, 2009 and World Travel Market is usually held in November. So the class was taking up students to the board of, to, to the world travel market they were there was a itt funnily enough <laughs> future u conference that was happening they were taking students up and they attended this amazing itt future u conference at wtm and it really sparked and it really kind of gave me all the kind of enthusiasm that i needed to kind of push forward and i left that conference that day and I decided to walk around in the um, the actual trade show, so go to the different booths at the trade show. So I went to uh, at least 15 different destinations, and I just went, approached them, and was like, hi, my name is Jamie Lee. I am going to Bournemouth University, and I'm looking for an internship role. Um, I, and I just explained to them what I was kind of looking for, and I did that to about 15, uh, 15 or 16 different destinations. I At that time, I came across the Caribbean Tourism Organization, and I met a lovely lady there. Um, her name was Veronica St. Louis, and she actually... So she said to me, yep, we are looking for an intern. If you take your email address, drop me an email with your CV and all your information, and I'll see what we can do. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so I did just that. And probably by the, the December, I was in London. I had gone and met with the director at that time. And basically, um, I met with the director and had and was offered the position to be an intern for one year with their organization. Now that was a bit risky for me and a bit challenging being a struggling student <laughs> um, and then deciding to do an internship which really just covered your stipend. But I tried to look at the bigger picture and then I also had to move to London, uh, which was a bit of a challenge because I have had accommodation in Bournemouth. I now had to look for new accommodation. I had to like, how am I gonna fund this new accommodation? So it was a really challenging time, but I knew that the opportunity that it would provide for me in the future would be worthwhile. So I kind of really stuck it out. I looked for odd jobs to do um, to ensure that I kind of kept myself afloat. Um, but that opportunity opened up a whole nother door, which we'll talk a bit more as we go further into the presentation. So after I left university and finished uh, my internship and everything, I landed what I like to call my dream job. Now that didn't just happen just like that. There was a process of going to multiple interviews, going to the third interview, the second interview, the third interview, um, and, and, and not and being re not rejected, but not being offered positions and job roles that I thought I was, what I was well suited for. But I land, I was able to secure my dream job. And how I got this opportunity is I decided after it was taking me so long, I really needed, my parents really couldn't fund me 
staying in London anymore. So I needed to have a job. So it was really important for me to find work. So I decided, okay, well, I'm being, I'm not having any success going the, the traditional job route. At that time, LinkedIn was relatively new. Um, you know, it was relatively new um, platform. I went onto LinkedIn and I started searching for travel companies and tour operators because I knew I wanted to work for a tour operator. <laughs> I knew I wanted to work for a tour operator. Having worked with destinations um, and seeing destinations through my internship and understanding the kind of ecosystem, I knew that I wanted to work with a tour operator. And I, so basically I went online and I started Google searching. And I don't know if many of you, there's a, in LinkedIn, there is an advanced search setting. So you can really narrow down who you are looking for. So I put in like managing directors of travel companies, tour operators, all different titles. And one lady popped up on there and it was Sarah Malin, Prestige Caribbean. And I approached her and like I approached multiple people. I had a standard email that I would send and say, hi, my name is Jamie Lee. You know, I'm a young student, just finished graduating. And I had a whole spiel in there. You know, that elevator pitch that um, Danny talked about earlier. I put that in right into them. And she actually came back to me. <laughs> she came back to me and she was like, oh, well, yeah, we are definitely looking for someone to assist with marketing and stuff like that. It would be great to meet up. And I met her, we had a coffee and the rest is history really. <laughs> and the rest is history. And she's still to this day, a very dear uh, mentor, a mentor to me and a dear person to me. But this, uh, this working with Prestige Caribbean, they were a luxury tour operator, boutique tour operator focusing on the Caribbean region. And what was great about working with them is that because it was boutique, because it was a small, small operation, you got the opportunity to put your hands in so many different elements of the business. <laughs> um, and it really gave me a deep understanding of tour operations and how it all works. And then I say it's my dream blog because I got to travel all over the Caribbean. Uh, in these pictures I'm here, I'm like in Betque and St. Lucia at Jade Mountains, the same place where um, Danny was not looking, not enjoying the fabulous views there and you know I really opened my eyes it helped me to build my network even more and it gave me amazing opportunities to to travel as well I think that's an important element of working and being in the travel and tourism industry as well and then life took an interesting turn. It really did take an interesting turn. Um, I fell in love, first of all, and stayed in the UK even longer. But then I had my son who was born really prematurely while I was working for the tour operator, tour operator Prestige Caribbean. So that kind of changed and shifted my entire life and my entire career and where I kind of planned on, and what I planned on doing really, because he was in the hospital for a really long period of time, um, four or five months, and then came home on home oxygen. So I had to rethink, you know, my strategy. And it really was during that time while I was in hospital for months and months on end, you know, that I started to brainstorm and think about what my next move would look like. And I started reaching out while in the hospital. I know it's, I think it's kind of my coping mechanism. I, I've realized now that my coping mechanism in things seem a bit tough is to work. <laughs> I learned that during last year during the Corona crisis, <laughs> but, um, I started to like work while I was in the hospital and I started to think about, okay, what could I do? How can I use the skills that I have? How can I use the contacts and the people that I know to actually, you know, make some money to survive? I've got a young child now who is going to be really ill, but I can't continue to do the job that I was currently doing. So I started working with destinations and tourist boards and tour operators as well. So I started doing a lot of freelance work. So that was the point when I decided, okay, well, I can freelance. I know people, I can I can contact them and tell them that I'm doing a bit of freelancing and see who bites really. And I got the great opportunity to work with brands like the Sri Lanka training program. We relaunched their entire training program in the UK market. And that gave me a, a, a hands-on experience of working with the travel trade working with a destination to kind of influence the travel trade to 
see the potential of a, a particular destination and to ultimately make bookings and to encourage their clients to book with them. So I loved working with the Sri Lanka training program and it opened me up to a whole nother region that I hadn't previously worked with before having worked predominantly in the Caribbean. I also worked with the Haiti Tourism um, Board. They were in 2015, they wanted to, they were doing it. They had a really active minister who wanted to really push um, the travel and tourism industry for Haiti. So I did a lot of work on the PR angle for them. And then Barbados, which is home, I continue to do various different small projects, smaller projects, working with them on different campaigns. So that was an exciting part of my journey. And then I started to believe in me. And it's all, you know, and it goes back to that first quote that I put out there. Life really is a journey and nothing actually happens before it's time or before it's due to. And every little thing that happens prior to that or what we, what society kind of deems as failures are actually learning learning um learning blocks i always say that you know a feel it's not it's not really a failure it because for me personally looking back on some of the things that society would consider failures are actually the things that have defined my career or defined my life to date so i started to believe in me once i was doing freelancing and contracting because that gave me i guess the opportunity to practice and to train and to and to see different opportunities as well. So believing in me, I launched my Be Distinctly Different, which was a travel marketing and PR agencies. And we managed to get some clients. <laughs> that was a big show. <laughs> we did manage to get some clients. We worked with the Lanterns Collection in um, the Lanterns Collection in Sri Lanka, the Oceans Hotel Group in Barbados, uh, Party Hard Travel, and some other agencies. And then we did a lot of work with destinations. But it was during that time that I, I would say that I launched, that I decided, I saw because of working with the, as a freelancer, I saw, I was able to see like gaps in the market and be able to pinpoint, okay, well, you know, this particular destination, they, they are particular hotel, they're fantastic, they're boutique, but they don't have the kind of funds to basically promote themselves in the UK market. And I developed the Travel Media Loop, which was a subscription-based PR agency, which sounds really crazy, <laughs> crazy now, but it actually works. And um, basically we, we came up with a flat rate and linked, I teamed up with a PR, a girl who kind of really specialized in PR. We developed a subscription rate we had our subscription rate a monthly subscription that or anybody who joins would have to pay and then as new stories or opportunities pop PR opportunities came in we would show them we would we put them forward to our to the clients that are on the subscription list um, and if they wanted it then they had to pay the additional cost to be featured and do all that great stuff and that worked incredibly well for a period of time and then we moved. I, I also launched during that time something called In the Travel Know, which was a podcast. And we had over 3,000 travel trade. So this podcast was really directed to the travel trade. And just as I think it's Nick, and Nick said, you know, podcasts at one point was, it just, they just blew up every organization, every company wanted to have a podcast to speak to a particular consumer group. So knowing that destinations, they want to connect with the travel trade, they want to talk to them directly, I wanted to bring authentic, uh, authentic twist on storytelling by, by bringing tourists, bringing the tourist boards onto my podcast, sharing stories about the destination. And we worked with Barbados during that time, we worked with Grenada, and um, I interviewed some amazing people, including the uh, president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association on that podcast. And then one of the other great things that we did is the travel marketing toolkit. So we basically, because I am knowing that destinations and, sorry, hotels and 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 people that are in the travel industry sector within destination that they are they want that global knowledge and they want that global experience from someone who is in the marketplace I developed this toolkit where I then went into it basically was a workshop where we went into destination so like we went to Barbados and we did it for hotels and um some of tour operate tour tour guides and attractions in Barbados and we ran that travel marketing toolkit and you'll see Claire here in one of my pictures as well <laughs> Claire's been a big part 
part of my journey. And I think this is probably around the time that we met Claire. Um, the, the, I launched the tra Travel Talk, which was um, a series of events for the travel for the travel industry and we basically would team up with destinations team up with a really cool agency or an agency who was doing something really phenomenal in terms of marketing branding you know sustainability whatever it was we would team up with them and hold these amazing evening events where you could come drink wine listen to some gain some real real knowledge on how your destination could be could could, could improve and then also we give the destination an opportunity to spot like that to um, um, the travel industry. So those were some really kind of successful events. And as a result of all of that hard work and developing, you know, creative solutions for travel companies, I was named as one of the tomorrow's travel leaders for the 30 on the 30. And I think that really opened up a whole nother level of opportunities and things that, you know, um, that I could do. So be able to spot opportunities. One of those opportunities, I, I really do believe this is so important as uh, anyone really working in the travel and tourism um, industry because we're so fast paced and fast moving and things are constantly changing. You have to be able to spot opportunities and spot them quickly. Um, for me, as marketing is really my background, understanding consumer perception. And now I work with brands, helping them to kind of attract and engage um, Black and people, Black, Asian, and people of color, really, to their organizations, to to their um, to their to their brands, really. Uh, I actually launched some groundbreaking research in the UK, African, Caribbean diaspora because I saw that destinations, particularly Caribbean destinations, weren't speaking to their Caribbean or the African diaspora. They were only speaking to, you know, one homogeneous group, um, but not speaking directly to them, but were losing out a huge, but it was a huge, they were losing a huge advantage here because, I mean, right now there's a recent study where the Black traveler, they spend some close to 109 million, billion, sorry, US a month. So that was a huge market that they were put, ignoring. So I decided to team up and I gave it a shot. I reached out to the Voice newspaper and I said to them, you know, I've got these contacts, I've got this information and I can pull this together. Would you be willing to partner on this um, to do some research? I'm sorry, the Voice newspaper is the largest African Caribbean newspaper in the UK. Um, so teamed up with them to do a survey to get some to get some real consumer insight into what makes there, what makes the African Caribbean traveler choose a particular destination over another? And I was able to secure like a holiday prize from St. Lucia. Um, Sackville Tra SN Travel, sorry, pr pr um, provided the flights. So, and that campaign, and that gave us over just over 2,000 responses for that survey. And that was all from me kind of knowing, seeing that there was a market in terms of being a Black traveler and how can destinations really connect with them. Caribbean calling. So funny enough, funny enough, and, and life went a full circle. Uh, once again, I was approached by the Caribbean Tourism Organization to join them as their business development manager. Um, they had seen the work that I had done previously with my marketing agency be distinctly different um working with different the tourist boards and to operators and basically wanted me to come in and help them to revitalize the cto uk chapter really um for those who don't know so the caribbean tourism organization they are the overall um marketing agency for uh, the Caribbean region. So we work with close to 52 destinations, worked with close to 52 destinations in the Caribbean. Um, my role, I was responsible for their UK chapter, which is the private public sector arm of the organization. So I worked with the hotel partners, destination partners, tour operators, um, hoteliers. I worked with close to 70 of those um, throughout my time. And I was responsible for the managing them, one, and the recruitment and retention of new members, as well as developing cooperative partnerships, events, marketing campaigns, PR campaigns to promote the Caribbean region to the UK market. 
Um, one of the things I'm most proud of, I mean, during that time is the few, but one of them is, you know, I relaunched, we relaunched their, their Caribbean.co.uk website, um, completely giving it, adding in new monetization, um, streams to the website as well. We launched the first diaspora media event because I wanted to really connect the diaspora media with the Caribbean and tourist, Caribbean tourism destinations and organizations. And then lastly, we also launched, I launched the first Caribbean integrated marketing campaign for the UK market here um, in 2019, um, which was a, this was a great opportunity and a great chance to get to do something like that. But during my time at the CTO, it was, it gave me a lot of great opportunity because we were a small team to really put my hand in and come up with creative solutions to how can we promote the region and how can we promote um, the destinations and our partners specifically. So my current role, so here we are now at Jamie Lee today. Um, my current role is executive director at the of the BAME program for women and travel, a role which I started in the beginning of January last year, just after the, I left the Caribbean Tourism Organization. And it's been an exciting journey so far. Um, we had Corona right in as soon as I started, which has which was a bit of a, like, oh, what's happening here? But it, but it has been an exciting journey. So to give you a little bit about women and travel, yeah, we are a social enterprise, basically dedicating to empowering women through employability and entrepreneurship, through travel, tourism, and hospitality. So basically in short, we support women through training and mentoring programs. As I said, I, I, am speci I deal specifically with the BAM program and we have recently launched, uh, sorry, last year we launched our com committed membership to, as a result, really, of the unfortunate death of George Floyd last year, and then the events of the BLM movement during the summer, we wanted to provide brands because we were being approached by travel companies wanted to know, okay, well, this has happened, what, what, what are the actions? So we wanted to give brands an actionable solution that they could take to, um, help to drive for greater diversity, racial diversity, particularly within their organizations. So we created our committed membership. And right now, we I am really, really happy to say that we have a number of amazing partners who we work with, including the NATA, Google, the University of Surrey, World Travel Market, Leeds Beckett University, and Oddly Travel to help to drive for greater diversity in the travel industry. And we basically work with these organizations to develop initiatives and programs to to increase the level of representation in terms of job representation within industry, to showcase and highlight amazing talent from a BAME background in the industry as well, and to develop what I'm most excited about is some resources that the industry can utilize to drive for greater diversity in the industry. Uh, two of those projects which we launched that was specific is our BAME High Flyer program. So we started in October last year our BAME High Flyer list which is really uh, about highlighting amazing trailblazing women in the travel and tourism industry from a black and Asian background. And we have some amazing women on that list. And you guys should definitely check it out because it's really inspirational. We also launched our podcast called Breakthrough to Excellence, which once again, it is all around that concept for me about seeing is believing. And if we, if we are able to kind of highlight and showcase these different black or these different Asian or these different minority ethnic background women that you can see as students that this is possible for you if you are also from that kind of background because previously that was missing and I can remember very clearly having a conversation with Claire when I myself was looking to become more commercial in my um in my outlook, in my in my in my job, in my career, I wanted to be more commercially driven, and I I reached out to Claire because it was for me. It was a lack of being able to see individuals who like looked like me in those positions and who I could really approach. You know, that would be able to relate to me. So this is really important for me in terms of helping to highlight and to showcase these amazing ladies in the industry. And if there are any men out there, if you are looking for someone, a mentor or someone, I can also help to direct you in the right direction as well. 
but please do check out these the list because I think it's super inspirational to read that list and these podcast sessions are amazing you have some ladies who will really share their stories and their journeys from where they started to where they are now and yes, yeah, so I was a little bit about me, and I wanted to, I put this slide in here because um, it's because this slide really talks about the evolution of travel restrictions. And I know you all are travel students, and you know, having seen at the beginning of last year, March 9th of March, really, so one day away of the, that was yesterday, really, this year, um, how the world and travel and tourism pretty much shut down and I think this 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 map and this graph really kind of highlights that and it must be a scary time for you because it was a scary time for me ultimately I took two weeks to just lie in bed bed asking myself what was happening to the world <laughs> um, but we had to pull ourselves together and we know that the travel and tourism industry is extremely resilient and it is excellent at bouncing back so I would I would say not let's not be worried too much in terms of is there going to be careers or jobs for me in the travel and tourism industry just know that the past and from past crises which we've never experienced anything to this level but from past crises it does show you that the travel industry is extremely resilient and that we will be able to bounce back so here are my steps that I personally have used to help me to jumpstart my career in the travel industry. So the first one is all about to starting to plan. So some of you might have everything already planned out and mapped out. You know what kind of, you know, everything that you, your next steps, what you want them to be. But some of you might not equally, you know, have decided on what that kind of career path might look like, or you might want to be thinking about changing that career path. And I think a great way of finding a, a new one or to find out what your interests there are and to planning that is to take some time to start searching for what you think that dream job could look like. You know, start doing some research, start looking on different, um, some of the recruitment agencies to kind of read the job roles and you know see if the, is that something I'm interested in and just note down put a list down of all of those kind of job roles that you think of, is, is of interest to you I'd also maybe say go online and you can find these um, job match quizzes so you can find some different quizzes that will help you to the, the job match quizzes basically help you to choose it helps you to give, it gives you a list of different careers based on the interests that you kind of selected. So first of all, make a list of the careers that you'll be interested in. Look online and maybe do a job quiz. And then also start looking on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great source of research for, I, I believe, uh, and other great stuff as well. So in terms of how you can plan and plan your career. Next up, I think, gather experience for me this is really important and this was a defining thing in my in my career really because all of the volunteering all of the internships all of these things that i did um they were able to then they and they were able to then help me in my future career um uh, not only through building connections and networks but then people being able to see okay well this girl you know she's she does that she you know people being able to see your work Work, that you can actually get the job done as well is really important. I mean, when I say gather experience as well, for me personally, when I start that dream job that I spoke about earlier, when I started that, she took me on on a part-time basis. So I was doing like three days a week with, her, with that company at the time. But I had the opportunity to come and do an internship with the St. Lucia Tourist Board. And I said, yes. Um, even though they were not paying me, I said, okay, let me go. And while, so while I was working, I was doing three days a week as a, a part-time with a travel company, but I was still also doing an internship with the St. Lucia Tourist Board at the same time. And that really did make, a, to this date, that makes a huge difference because I'm connected to them. I know the individuals who work with them, me and the current director, I mean, we are good friends. So this kind of, it helps you to develop your relationships and to build your network. So gather as much experience as you possibly can and expand your network. This is really important. Um, there is a saying, I hope I can remember it now, um, which, um, oh my goodness, I say this saying so much and I've forgotten it now, but basically, you, you know, you need to have a network in order to 
basically move forward. I think sadly, and I heard this statistic re recently, and I think I said it's 70% of jobs, people receive jobs based on referrals, which tell you, tells you how important expanding and building a network is. And okay, don't get scared when I say expand your network. You're thinking, okay, so how am I gonna expand my network? I'm a student coming to local school. How is that even possible? And I'd say for you, the first step is to look at things like trade associations. So similarly to ITT, uh, future you joining these kind of trade associations who will, can open up networks for you. Um, we've got things like Travel Massive where you can go online, sign up, and you become a part of that network. Uh, women and Travel, if you're a female, becoming part of that our community where you get to interact with ladies from across the travel and tourism industry as well. Um, those are a few ways that you can help to expand your network by volunteering your time is another great way. And I think I heard Claire speak earlier about the, don't want to get the name wrong, but the student, student ambassadorship program. How great of the opportunity for you to go and expand your network through that platform. Um, so these are just things that you can start to think about. And, and, and it's not only just about expanding your network, but also think about building those authentic connections. Because I think a lot of the time people, you know, in this world where you want everything right now, they want to meet you and meet someone and then they want you to instantly give you their contacts. No, it's about building relationships, volunteering your time, offering value to individuals so that they see you, you as, as the first point of contact when the opportunities do arise. Be digital disruptors. Now, I know if I ask a poll question, <laughs> and I probably can ask you guys, you know, to drop how many of you have social media platforms? You do have, you guys have the Instagram, you guys have Facebook, you have all the tools available to you right in your hand to become digital disruptors. And you have the knowledge as well. And brands will be looking for individuals like yourselves, um, as we, especially as we start to rebuild and restore the travel and tourism industry, to come into organizations with creative solutions, creative ideas of how to connect with consumers online. So this is a great chance for you guys to look at your social platforms and your social profiles and see how you spend so many not much time on them. How can I use this to be of value to me? And I think that was something that I did really early out. You can find me on Instagram at, at the Travel Marketeer. And I came up with the, at the Travel Marketeer um, years ago, um, because I wanted almost like a fame name, a name that stands out online and it really connects with what it is that I do. Um, and I created that platform and I was sharing at the time, I was blogging about things from social media. I was just sharing my thoughts and my perspectives on different things. I shared them on LinkedIn. I shared them all over the place. And before you know it, people will start reaching out to you from blogs and different areas oh would you mind writing a piece would you mind would would you want to do this and would you want to do the and, and for features and for different things all from taking the initiative of developing my social platforms posting engaging content uh, and doing things and using it to be a value to me versus um just to be <laughs> just to be online just to be posting um i used it to my advantage and to really develop yourself as a thought leader as someone who okay this person knows i guess she knows what she's talking about so i really say to take some time i think you guys have a real unique opportunity here to really if that is what you're interested in how can i use that to really push brand your 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 own individual brand and building your own personal brand which i won't go too much into today because i feel like that's a whole nother topic but developing your own personal brand is going to be 10 times more important now than ever before and think outside the box this is i guess one of my favorite things like it, it really i do believe i'm thinking outside the box i have so much to do that i've actually imprinted it on my hand as well. Um, you have to kind of think outside the box. As I mentioned, the travel industry is constantly, you know, changing. Things are moving at a very rapid pace. You have to be able to spot opportunities, thinking outside the box, like going against the, um, against the grain. So that's going to be really important for you guys as well. And then lastly, look at finding a mentor. You know, mentors are really important and it, it's not necessary. It's not necessary that you have a 
in some cases, you want, yes, a physical mentor is fantastic, but if you don't have access to a physical mentor, somewhere that you think is a mentor, we have YouTube. We have all of these amazing platforms that you can go and listen to TED Talks. So TEDx Talks are a great way to find people and to learn their stories and to hear from them and to learn from them, reading amazing books that are reading books by people who you might admire. And then when you want to find them, I mean, I'm sure that the ITT Future you have you can reach out to them about a mentor. You can equally reach out to women and travel to talk about mentorship as well and to help you find a mentor because those are individual. A mentor is really great because they've got the experience, they've got the knowledge, the know-how, having done it before, and they are able to offer you such great insight that will save you so much time and so much stress in your journey. Uh, feel free to shout out, reach out to me online if this is something that you are definitely interested interested in. And in wrapping up, you know, today's conversation, I just want to say, guys, be willing. You have to be willing to travel industry. You have to be willing to embrace change because things are constantly changing in the travel industry. And you have to be able to evolve quickly and adapt. You have to be creative, innovative, and it's pretty it's a pretty competitive industry. And to be able to, to be at the top of your game, you have to have a constant flow of new and original ideas to differentiate you uh, and to differentiate your business if and differentiate business. You know, travel is a fun industry, no matter what area of the travel that you work in, but because you're essentially bringing people's dreams to fruition for many people. But for that same reason, it has to be done with care. And I wish you all the best of luck with your studies. Um, and I hope all goes well as you go into the job market. <laughs> Jamie Lee, you are an inspiration. You always have been ever since uh, we met all those years ago. Um, and thank you for the shout out. It's been such a pleasure working with you. And I look forward to continuing to work with you over the coming years. And I just want to also say congratulations because you were named this week as one of the most 20 most influential women in the travel industry by Travel Pulse, the podcast. So congratulations on that. And it was thoroughly, thoroughly deserved. And uh, Jenny Lee is also um, a proud ambassador for ITT Future You. So thank you for all that you do. Absolutely incredible. Now, we are running over time now, so I do need to move on. But there's so much stuff in the chat, Jamie Lee, that maybe you could uh, maybe just stay on for a couple of minutes and maybe um, just, just make some comments in the chat. Great. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, our, last, our last presentation today is actually one I prepared earlier. Um, we mentioned Travel Massive um, and we mentioned the name Matthew Gardner already with, in, in Jamie Lee's talk just now. Matthew um, is, um, again, um, someone that we've worked with closely over the years and he sits on the ICT Education Training Committee, but he's currently working um, as as head of marketing and external relations for IAG Cargo. So a very interesting career story. So we're going to go straight into the video and then a very quick wrap up after that. Ricky, over to you. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome someone I've known for
Well, there we go. Thank you all so much for staying with us. Um, I hope you found that really interesting. Matthew was was um, annoyed that he couldn't be here to um, to speak to you all in 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 uh, person. But obviously, you've seen the Travel Massive link, and do do go on to Travel Massive and register. It's a fantastic site, and we're delighted that we have such a great relationship with them at Future U. Um, I've just posted in um, a few little bits and bobs as we now are very quickly wrapping up because I know you all have um, you you want want to break before the next session. I just want to say a massive thank you to UCB and in particular Ricky for helping me put today together. I hope you found it as informative as I do. I mean, I know all of these people, and every time I hear them speak, I get inspired by the energy and the passion that they all show for the industry. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all hopefully in person soon. Um, but thank you so much for having us today. I'll put my LinkedIn um, address also on the chat in a sec. And um, please feel free to reach out to me. And one very quick other piece of information, which is that we are just about to launch a new education and training portal to complement our Future You and ITT websites, which will have all the information about things like our awards, as well as career guidance and resources. So we hope you find that of use. And Ricky will be sending that information as soon as we launch so ricky over to you thanks very much claire yeah just a final note to say really pleased with the attendance from everybody and in the live chat and also just a final thank you to all the speakers today so obviously nick claire of course uh we had jamie lee and danny and then finally matthew gardner and just to let you know i've been making notes as we go along I'm learning from these guys as much as you are today. So yeah, thank you very much, Claire. And also Sabath, who has also been really integral in organizing the conference this morning. And then just the final thing is that the employability fair will be running from one o'clock onwards on the same platform. So you can hopefully practice what you've learned today in terms of attracting those recruiters and uh, networking. So. Other than that, thank you very much, Claire. I don't know if Sabah, if you wanted to say anything to finish off. Yes, please. Um, again, obviously on behalf of Ricky and everyone as well, thank you, Claire, all the speakers for today. It's been absolutely brilliant this morning. Loved every single one. Um, very informative, very insightful. So I hope these students have enjoyed it. Um, and also thank you, Ricky, of course, for arranging alongside with Claire. Uh, guys, as Ricky has mentioned, we do have the employability fair this afternoon, so please do not leave the conference. You're more than welcome to meet yourselves and go off to have a quick cuppa or a quick snack or lunch. We are joined with, with um, quite a lot of employers for this afternoon who are taking the time out to speak to you guys in regards to the opportunities that they have available um, from hospitality to aviation. Um, you know, we do have quite a wide range, so please, please do. Uh, stay on board just um put yourself on mute for us and that'd be fantastic so yeah so over to you guys thank you very much claire that's great thank you and i just very quickly want to address one thing on the chat if that's okay which was um uh, about a question around placement internship volunteer opportunities with our with our speakers uh today it is tough out there at the moment um people are finding it very difficult to offer things like that however that means that you need to use all the advice you've been given today about networking getting in touch with people because actually if you build relationships with these businesses and all the businesses that are going to be in the fair this afternoon you will be first um to hear about any placements and volunteer opportunities that there are out there and i just wanted to hopefully um that will answer that question for now brilliant okay time for a break i'm sure you're all very tired and need to have a slight break before the employability fair so me and Claire will love you and leave you and uh, enjoy the employability fair later this afternoon. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Ricky. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Hello and good afternoon everyone, Sabbath here. How's everyone? You're back from your break now. 
Hope everyone's had a good break. Uh, ready for the afternoon session. So yes, I'm Sabbath, my colleague Yasmin join, joining us today as well. We both work for Hired. Um, some of you guys may have seen Hired based in Moss House on the ground floor. Uh, so we both work as employee engagement and alumni officers in there. Um, so yeah, okay, good. good. It's a great to read that you're all ready and energized for this afternoon. I'm ready to speak to the employers that are joining us as well. Um, so no further ado, we're going to start off with um, Marriott Hotel. With Charlie. So Charlie joining us today at one o'clock. So she's going to share her journey regarding Marriott Hotel. And then we follow on with the other employees that are joining us as well. Thank you. Charlie, now made you presenter. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Great stuff. Fab. I'm not, I'm not sure why my camera's not working. It should be on. No, that's fine. Not to okay. worry. We've made you present so you can go through the slides. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Uh... Oh, there I am. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, I'm Charlie Papworth, the HR manager um, at the Forest of Arden Hotel, which is part of uh, Marriott International. Uh, Marriott is the um, world's largest hospitality company. And our ethos um, for this year and going forward is to be the best um, hospitality company. So I will start with uh, my journey and how I um, got to this position um, within Marriott. Um, so originally I actually wanted to be a solicitor um, and I did my GCSEs and my A-levels um, I actually worked in hotels to fund my legal studies and um, I did an MBQ level two in reception um, and during the nine years whilst I was doing all of that I then went on to do my LLB law degree at Nottingham um, Trent University and then um, I went on to complete my law practice certificate at the Anglian Ruskin University. Um, and then from uh, there, I decided that um, hospitality really was where my passion lied, uh, like, lies even. So um, I'll talk you through my career um, within hospitality. So I started at 16. I started um, for Devere um, and I did weekend housekeeping. That was throughout my GCSEs and my A-levels. Um, then I worked on reception. I loved it so much I decided to take a gap year. So I worked on the reception team before um, finishing my A-levels and then going on to university. Whilst I was at university, I stayed as a casual. I used to come back and work in the summers and over Christmas and at weekends. Um, so I finished university in 2019 and I was promoted immediately to the trainee team leader position on reception. Um, so it kind of uh, made me think again about what career I wanted to go into because I was enjoying my role there so much. Um, within a month, I was promoted to reception team leader. And then in three months, I was promoted to reception manager. I was also trained as duty manager. So um, at the age of 21, I was in charge of the whole hotel, which is a 169 bedroom hotel. Um, so it's quite a lot of responsibility at quite a young age. Um, that's the hotel that I started in. Um, as you can see, it's quite a large hotel. It's based in Norfolk. Um, it's quite famous for its golf course. Um, and it's quite near Thurston, um, Thurston which is uh, a Christmas destination that maybe your grandparents or your parents would know about. But people would come to the hotel to, to go and enjoy the Thurston experience. Um, we were also very big on weddings during the summer months between April and October. You would have three weddings a day, um, especially at the weekend. So it was a it was a beast of a hotel to work in. Uh, and after all this travel and work, I decided that I would take a gap year and I would um, go traveling because um, I'd lived and worked in Norfolk my whole life. So I went to all of the below countries, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, all of the below. Um, and I think I couldn't recommend it enough. Uh, as an HR manager and um, a recruiter and a, you know, a person who has done a gap year, I think it really um, it broadens your horizons and gives you people skills and um, skills in confidence and negotiation, uh, things that you might not get you know, just from a, a textbook or a classroom. So I couldn't recommend it enough. And when I see it on CVs, I, I think of it as a, as a positive um, thing that you've, you've done in your life, accomplished in your life. Um, 
So the law practice certificate, I completed my LPC uh, and during that it was uh, two day a week, um, but you had 40 hour contact time. I also worked at Dunstan Hall for 40 hours to um, support my studies. Um, I then, when I finished did a uh, temporary role, uh, it was a temporary role for a uh, recruitment agency for Aviva. So it's a really big company in Norfolk that deals with insurance, but I worked for the legal indemnities um, department. Uh, I then, that was only a temporary position, so I went to work for the NHS um, and I was a human resources assistant and that was a fixed term contract, but Aviva actually contacted me during this time to say they'd created a full time position for me. So um, even though I love the NHS, I went back to work for Aviva for um, the full time role. And then from there, I got um, a position for Lise Pryor, which is the leading um, solicitors firm in Norwich, um, because that, that was where my career um, and training was taking me, is to become a solicitor. So um, I actually interviewed for a reception manager role because of my experience um, in hospitality, and I actually got taken up to the managing director as well within that interview, and I was offered um, a position to work directly for him. Which was great. Um, I then decided whilst doing that that law really wasn't for me and that I really missed hospitality. So although I loved law, I felt like hospitality was more suited to my personality and I had just a massive passion for it and I really wanted to get back to it. I actually worked part time in the evenings whilst I was at least prior at um, a local pub that had opened in our village, but it had been uh, done over, spent, uh, some, uh, an owner spent millions of pounds on it and turned it into a gastro restaurant. And I worked there in the evenings and then he offered me um, the general manager role, which I couldn't resist. So I took on that role and um, I did that for 18 months. Um, as you can imagine, hospitality does take over your life a bit. Um, and after doing it for 18 months, I decided I wanted a bit more of a work-life balance. So um, I tr decided to combine um, my luck my ambitions um, for working within employment law and also hospitality to work for select recruitment. So I started in the hospitality recruitment, did that for 12 months, and I then got some experience covering temporary commercial desk. I then went to the owner and asked if I could um, start up and develop a legal permanence desk, which he allowed me to do. Um, he then asked me to come back onto hospitality and, and run that department, so I did that. And then I relocated from Norfolk to Warwickshire um, because my partner has a job up here. And um, when I went to have my notice in at Select, they offered to open an office for me. So I moved up to Leamington Spa and I opened my own office and I did hospitality and uh, legal recruitment. And I did that for a year. And then I decided I missed people. I was working by myself um, and I saw this role come up for Marriott. And Marriott is quite similar to Devere in terms of um, their ethos and um, what they represent and the sort of hotels um, that they have under their, under their belt. So I interviewed for the HR officer role and they decided to instead offer and create a position called HR lead. Uh, and then I worked here for two months and I was promoted to HR manager. And then... From there, it was August, September, October, November, five months. I was then asked to be multi-property HR manager, where I was covering Breadsall Priory and the Forest of Arden. Unfortunately, um, as you're all aware, um, COVID struck and I was unable to travel to Breadsall Priory anymore um, because of limitations in terms of travel and expense. So I'm now based solely at the Forest of Arden again. So unfortunately, Vicky isn't here to speak to you all um, because she's on furlough at the moment because the hotel, um, as I'm sure you're aware, is closed. But I'll go through Vicky's journey as well. Um, again, Vicky didn't start off being, uh, you know, wanting to have a career in hospitality. She wanted to do a PE teacher. She went through her qualifications, did her GCSEs and her A-levels. And since being at the Forest of Arden, she has completed her CIPD level three. In fact, she got the certificate last week. So that's fantastic. She started at 17 um, at Hilton. She did weekends and evenings, and then um, she became a team member for five years whilst um, doing her studies on the side, and she finished university in 2014. Um, she was so interested and passionate about becoming part of um, HR and she knew that's where she wanted to be. She volunteered one day a week at Q Hotels, which now actually owned Devere. Um, and once she finished, she was offered the position at uh, Marriott in HR. So she interviewed for HR assistant in 2016. 
Vicky's uh, uh, win, wins a lot of awards and she's an ample em employee and we all look to Vicky for um, her successes that she's had throughout her journey um, as part of Marriott. But she's won Associate of the Quarter after four months. She was nominated and won Associate of the Year after 12 months. Um, since I started um, 18 months ago, I promoted her to HR coordinator. And as I said, she's completed her CIPD and she's now um, HR officer. Um, so in terms of the Marriott journey and the, the roles that we cover within the HR department, um, in 2019, um, our roles included looking after recruitment, um, engagement, uh, promoting and creating an environmental committee. We promoted um, a healthy hotel, so looking after mental well-being and making sure that we looked after our associates in terms of making sure they had water and fruit rather than having crisps and um, fizzy pop available. We created Wellness Wednesdays, so our door is always open on a Wednesday. You can come and see us for a cup of tea. Um, thank you Thursdays. Every Thursday we would take a little gift and a card round to all the staff to thank them for, um, for their week and for everything they've done over the past week. Every month we do payday treats. We come up with a theme for the um, canteen um, and we provide... Uh, like a Mexican theme and we give them treats and we decorate the canteen, we put music on and we all celebrate working at Marriott for a month. We also have a gift called You've Been Mugged, so an associate will recognise another associate for something amazing they've done and they will fill a mug with whatever they think the person would like, so chocolates, biscuits, something healthy and they will then leave that on their desk or leave it in their department and um, that person will know that they've been recognised um, anonymously. We created shadow hours, so um, for example, someone in front office didn't understand why someone in housekeeping couldn't do something, so what we then did was created shadow hours so that people on front office could go and work in housekeeping for an hour and understand their role and vice versa, and we did it across the whole hotel, it was really successful. Um, we offer Trinity uh, placements, so there's a University of Trinity, and um, they come in and they work here for 12 weeks on a voluntary basis, and um, we also offer Kickstart and Apprentices. Um, when, once you start at Marriott, you're offered essential skills, you're offered mental health training. We have course of thought, which is promotion of um, menopause and being able to talk about that amongst, um, amongst the staff. We conduct prison recruitment days, so we assisted um, prisoners with their CVs and how to get back into the workplace. We also assist Prince's Trust, so we will allow volunteers or apprentices um, to apply or work at the hotel. And, and we also offer um, session days where members of the Prince's Trust can come here, learn how to make a cocktail, learn how to make a bed, learn how the hotel works. Uh, we also have a relationship with St Basil's, um, which is getting um, younger um, homeless adults into work again. Um, that was a really good scheme that we that we created. We also work with rugby and Solihull College. We promote um, roles and apprenticeships at job fairs. We also do quarterly lunches and awards. So as with what Victoria had, um, she was promoted, she was nominated for employee of the month. And she would then be invited to a lunch and then be put forward to to doing that at the end, to becoming uh, employee of the year at the end. We also offer art of, art of hosting. So art of hosting is each week um, the HODs get together, the heads of department, and they decide if a story of an associate where they've gone above and beyond, which story um, deserves the five pounds that we awarded and the recognition. So for example, um, you would notice that um, a child was getting frustrated, they didn't have anything to do, so then they would go out of their way to find activities and present that to the parents at dinner. It's sort of stories like that. Um, we have long service awards. If you actually work within Marriott for 25 years, you're given um, a year, uh, card, which allows you to stay in any Marriott hotel across the world, complimentary for 365 days. But at, at each in interval also, five years, 10 years, 15 years, you get awards and recognitions. So they, they really um, value their employees. And every five years, there's a, an HR conference. There was one in October. Where we went to Lisbon where all HR um, members, managers meet and discuss their plans going forward. So 2020 was a bit different. Obviously, the hotel was locked down. We were dealing with furlough leave. Unfortunately, we had to do collective consultations. We, from that, we had to do redundancies and reduced hours. Um, we also had to manage um, a golf tournament. So 
immediately after lockdown, we held the European golf tournament at the hotel. Um, so we went from zero to 100% occupancy within a day. Um, actually, the staff did amazing. And I think they really enjoyed the buzz of having the hotel full again. Um, we have task force. So, for example, I'm sure most of you know of London. London remained locked down. So a lot of the associates who work for London hotels came up to here to help us out over the summer. Recruitment, we had a freeze. However, this week we have posted jobs. So please check out our um, our Marriott Careers job page because we have vacancies um, at the Forest of Arden at the moment. We have eight in total. We have seven and ones going live today in greenkeeping. So please have a look. Uh, this year we've had to enforce holiday. Um, so in order to ensure that in the summer we have adequate bodies at the hotel, um, we've ensured that everyone takes 40% in the first quarter and obviously we're not open. So um, it makes sense that we've, we've done that for this year. So the roles and responsibilities of um, HR is to li liaise with HODs. We attend a 10 at 10 meeting every day. Um, we look after all recruitment and um, we do an engagement survey once a year. So this year, obviously, we haven't been at the hotel. So we've done a temperature check. So we've sent out a questionnaire to all associates and they've then said um, things they're worried about, things they want to improve on, things they've missed. And then we've got together with the HODs to discuss how we can and um, get everyone back to the hotel and that everyone's in a, in a really good place um, so we can work really hard moving forward. Obviously, we deal with disciplinaries and um, we have different levels at the hotel. So note to file, level of concern, verbal warning, written warning, final written warning. And um, we have lots of engagement practices. Some I went over earlier. So welcome Wednesdays, thank you Thursdays, you've been mugged. Um, with the healthy hotel in terms of um, taking out the vending machines and promoting water and fruit, we actually got to a titanium status. So it was really, uh, really good uh, policy that we undertook. We also celebrate every every day there is to celebrate Act of Kindness Day, Tobacco Awareness Day, Pancake Day. Um, and we have an ARC committee. So it gives the associates um, the power to and tell us what they need and what they want and how we can communicate and how we can go about achieving that. Uh, we have a canteen, so every day um, staff are allowed to have a meal and even during lockdown, Marriott has provided all associates with five pounds so they can go out and buy their own lunch to make sure they're looked after. During, um, when we came back from lockdown last time, we did feedback forums because there was um, conflicts between the kitchen and front of house team because we've got short you know they're not as many staff as there was before and with the covid regulations and um, there was a bit of conflict so what we did was make sure that um we talked to each other and i think sometimes chinese whispers create bigger problems than are actually there so um we give the associates and um, the power to communicate with each other and that's all for my presentation today so thank you ever so much for listening to me and um, has anyone got any questions Thank you, Charlie. There's quite a few questions in the public chat from a few students. I don't know whether you're able to see them. Um, uh, Start off with Tanya. Tanya Mia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me just have a look. What time was that sent? Uh, I, so I think Tanya just mentioned how she's been at the Marriott Hotel once and how you know big oh, yeah. and stunning it was. And then it's following on to Tia. So she had. A, Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, with roles this week we've launched um, the vacancies we have. So if you go onto the Marriott Careers, if you just type into Google Marriott Careers, um, and if you put in Forest of Arden, our um, seven vacancies will be on there. And they are all permanent full time. However, um, we are looking at fixed terms and casuals for the summer. So you just watch your space with this. In terms of um, work experience um, and shadowing if you send your CV through to myself um, then I can certainly have a look at that obviously the hotel's closed now so so bear with us but um, yeah that's something definitely we'll look to um, in the future if you also um, have a look at kickstart because uh, and um, well, not Trinity but kickstarts they they provide sort of apprenticeships that Marriott deal with so have a look at their website as well um, I'm just reading the question sorry 
yes, we do offer graduate positions. We have a program called the Voyager program. Again, if you look online, it's uh, all the information's on there, but it's called Marriott Voyager. We've just had a lady actually who completed her Voyager program and she's just been offered the front office supervisor position. And um, so it's where you work in all different departments. So you'd start in front office and you do housekeeping, uh, food and beverage, engineering, you do everything in order to complete that Voyager program. I think it's a little bit like an apprenticeship, but it's Marriott based. Um, Shawnee, if uh, does Marriott. Uh, again, I don't think we offer one year placements, but we would offer placements. Um, we certainly look at a one year placement, but as standard, we use Kickstart and the Voyager. Um, yeah, of course, I can share my email address. I'll, I'll share it with Sabbath has it, but I, I will share that. Um, no problem. I'll put it in the to put it in the chat box. Uh, yeah, so Noreen, if you have a look at um, the Voyager program, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, they will be running again. I'm just not sure if they have um, the open vacancies now, but it's still be worth applying because obviously the hotel will open again. We're going to be open from the 29th of March for golf. Um, and then obviously following government guidelines, um, we'll, we'll open as soon as we can. Oh, so I put my email address. Thank you. <laughs> No worries. Was there any more questions, guys? Is that everyone's questions answered? Anyone else have any further questions for Charney? I worked at the Forest of Arden before conference. Oh, okay. So some of them are graduate. Yeah, yeah. you're in all the graduate questions. Have a look at Voyager. It's a really fantastic program. Okay. Okay, great stuff. Thank you so much, Charney, for your time. No uh, worries. For your informative PowerPoint. Um, we do wish you all the best and obviously thank you for everything. No um, worries. Students, you guys can contact Charlie directly with any questions that you may have after. But of course. Thank you, Charlie, thank you for your time. No worries. Enjoy your afternoon. Bye. 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 So we now have Nick, um, Nick, uh, Nick Davis. Uh, we have actually worked with him for many, many years. Uh, and he's always attended our ITT conference um, on a yearly basis. And obviously this year um, we've actually, you know, got this uh, PowerPoint online. So whilst I'm uploading uh, Nick's presentation, Nick, did you want to introduce yourself um, and say hello? Sure, yeah. Thanks, okay, yeah. I hope you, hope you can hear me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. It's it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you virtually. Um, but yeah, just to give you a, a brief introduction to myself and my background as well. Um, I've worked in aviation now for coming up to around eight years. So I've worked in, in flight operations, I've worked in uh, airports. Um, my most recent employer before the Royal Aeronautical Society was for a business jet company. So I was working in their operations team. So I was um, managing their fleet of private jets um, all, all over the world and uh, doing uh, flight planning, crew rostering, and all sorts of other things, managing the aircraft maintenance schedules and things like that. So sort of doing all of that um, stuff in, in the background, um, whilst the crew and um, all the engineers do, do all the work on the ground, I was sort of the person in the office doing all the, all the background stuff. Um, I have a undergraduate degree in, in geography and I also have a master's in aviation management. Um, I completed that a little bit um, later in, in my career. So I, I actually worked for a number of years before deciding to go and study my master's. Um, so I just felt like there was a bit of a gap there, um, particularly in my, my knowledge. Um, so I was able to go back and study aviation academically as well. My um, role at the society um, is um, very much careers skills and education based so i've um, come into something very different at the society from what i was doing before but still well within the um, aerospace and aviation industry um, but if anybody does um, or is interested in working in in flight operations whether it's for an airline um, or whether it's for a sort of um, the the business jet market or whether it's working in operations at, at the airport um, I'm more than happy to to have a separate conversation with you guys afterwards. I can again share my direct email address with you in the chat, and I'll happily carry on that that conversation with you. Um, but we'll we'll start off now, or I'll, I'll kick off by telling you a bit about the Royal Aeronautical Society, and um, so tell you about who we are, um, what we do, 
and also how you can get involved with us. Um, and I'm also going to give you some really useful insights as well into sort of the current situations that the industry is facing at the moment. So I've got a, um, a really useful slide that hopefully will give you um, a snapshot and an idea in terms of where the industry is heading, particularly um, post COVID. Um, as, as we all know, um, it's many, many sectors have been affected, but aviation in particular is probably um, has had the, the most impact or the, the pandemic has had the most impact on aviation. Um, so um, I'll just cover some information. First of all, giving you a bit of an introduction to the society as well as some useful hints and tips. And then I'll take some questions at the end. So we were formed in 1866 and the Royal Aeronautical Society is the world's only professional body that's dedicated to the entire aerospace and aviation industry. So that makes us slightly different to other professional bodies is that we aren't exclusively engineering. Um, so we have members from all over the world. We have a membership of over 25,000 individuals, not only in the UK, but all over the world, working in all sorts of different and diverse sectors, whether it is engineering, but whether you are a pilot, whether you're an air traffic controller, whether you're cabin crew, or whether you're working in operations, or you're even working in something niche like aviation law or finance or something like that. Um, so we really do cover all aspects of the industry. And we essentially provide you with the tools to network with your um, peers and also industry professionals. We encourage you to get involved with us and help, and you know, this will help develop you as a professional within the aviation and aerospace industry. And we have a number of platforms and tools available for you to sort of expand your knowledge as well. And that links in with our commitment to learning. So we are what's called a learned society as well. So we provide lots of opportunities and lots of platforms for you to develop your knowledge and become an expert um, in the chosen area that you're interested in getting into within the industry. We also um, run a number of events um, that you can get involved with, and I'll tell you a bit later on how you can do that. But we run a program of conferences and events, usually around 400 plus of these a year. Um, a bit different uh, over the past year or so as a result of COVID, we haven't been able to run a lot of our events at our branches and our headquarters in London. Um, but we have converted an awful lot of these events to online. We have a new virtual conferencing platform and events platform so everybody can access all of our events virtually now. Um, we also have a huge network all over the world of other branches and divisions. So our headquarters is in, is in central London, in Mayfair, but we also have 37 other branches here in the UK. So in the Midlands, for example, branches that off the top of my head include Coventry and Wolverhampton. So we have two branches there in, in, in the Midlands. I'm sure there are others, but I can't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, so, and then we have 67 other divisions worldwide as well. So wherever you are in the world, you know, wherever you end up working, living, studying, you'll be able to connect with a Royal Aeronautical Society branch or division wherever you are. Um, and, you know, you can attend their events, um, you can support them, you can volunteer with them. And I'll tell you again, it's sort of a bit more about that um, in a second. So we really are um, a global organisation. We have lots and lots of events and things that you can attend. Um, to really sort of expand your networks and expand your knowledge. So I thought I'd cover um, a bit of an elephant in the room that's obviously probably on the minds of a lot of people at the moment, particularly those of you who are interested in going down an aviation route. Um, as we all know, there's um, been a lot of talk in the press and the media about aviation and how uh, severely it's, it's been affected. So um, I just thought I'd give you some useful hints and tips in terms of where you guys can go to get an insight and get a build a picture of what the industry landscape is actually like here in the UK. Um, so when you are searching for jobs, whether it's placements, whether it's graduate schemes, whether it's apprenticeships or whether it's direct entry jobs, um, you've got a select number of websites that you can go to um, to locate companies locate organizations within the industry that could potentially have have vacancies 
So these are um, multiple different trade bodies for aerospace. So these are the organisations that are responsible for lobbying with the government and things like that. But their websites are really good platforms to go to, to build a picture uh, in, in terms of the, the landscape of companies that are actually out there under, underneath that subsector. So if you, you, some of you may have heard of Airlines UK, but this is the trade body for all UK registered airlines. So this is where you'll be able to find not only the main players within the industry, such as EasyJet and British Airways, but also you might be able to find those cargo carriers, um, charter companies like Titan and so on. So it will just give you that one platform, that one website that you can go to, to perhaps discover companies that you may never have heard of. And when you are doing your research into finding those, those graduate roles or, or jobs, um, you'll be able to narrow down your searches a lot more, much better than doing a typical job search on, on those sort of job search websites, you know, like Indeed or Total Jobs. This will give you a much um, more sort of dedicated and targeted search. And it's, it's the similar picture for like the BBGA, the Airport Operators Association, the LLA and so on. So the BBGA, they actually have a huge directory of companies and this, this sort of sits under the banner of the, the sector that I used to work in, particularly business jets. Um, so they have their 2021 direct, directory of companies. So, you know, that there must be well over 100, 150 to um, 200 uh, companies within their directory. So, you know, use these as a platform, use these as sort of a one-stop shop for you to go to to locate companies that might essentially have vacancies. And these are the sorts of things that you'll come across as well. You know, I've taken a few screenshots here. So, you know, it will give you sort of map views and you can click on each of the, um, the, the icons and it'll tell you about that company. It will give you an idea in terms of their capabilities, so what they specialise in. Um, so again, it just helps with your research. It might help narrow down companies that you might want to research, but that you might also want to contact as well to see if they do have any opportunities or any vacancies. So let's talk a bit about the, the overall impact of COVID because it is vast and, and really uh, indiscriminate. So um, I thought I'd share this slide with you and this is all publicly available. So if you're interested, you can just go on to the Eurocontrol website. Um, they have a COVID-19 dashboard um, and they've got some really interesting data and insights into the potential recovery for the aviation sector. So all publicly available on Eurocontrol, but I just thought I'd, I'd share some of these with you and give you a picture about where we're potentially heading. So, so we were quite optimistic sort of in the summer last year that we were potentially going to see something between scenario one and scenario two. But as we've gone on throughout the year, particularly here in the UK, um, we're seeing uh, more and more predictions now coming through that we're probably going to be looking at something within scenario two. So some of the figures here do look a little bit alarming, um, but we've got to remember that 2019 was a record year of growth for the aviation industry. Um, and you know we're predicting at the society that hopefully if all goes well, um, the recovery for aviation will start to pick up this summer. Um, but albeit it's still going to be quite a lengthy process, it could take up to 2026 for the in industry to fully recover to 2019 levels of growth. As we've seen, a lot of airlines have had to completely restructure. They've made an awful lot of staff redundant, um, but we are predicting at the Society that hopefully by the summer, um, particularly, you know, we're already starting to see this at some airports, as well they are they are predicting a lot of traffic in the summer and you know i've seen a lot of airports start to advertise those seasonal vacancies such as within security customer service roles and things like that over the past few days uh, particularly after the the prime minister's announcement earlier in the month so you know things are definitely looking up but it is still going to be a tough road ahead for the industry um we're seeing an awful lot of airlines you know, um, our chief executive gave an update to staff earlier today saying that, you know, airlines like Lufthansa, you know, they're losing something like a million pounds a day. Um, and in, and in, in airline speak, you know, that is absolutely horrendous. Um, and it, it's 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 a little bit concerning. 
So I think we are going to see, we are going to lose probably some more airlines. We're seeing Norwegian at the moment, they've cancelled some big orders with Airbus and Boeing, for example. So, you know, the industry, particularly the airlines, um, are not out of the woods yet. Um, but, you know, there is definite hope there, particularly now we do have vaccines and it, and it seems to be rolling out quite well, particularly here in the UK. So we're seeing lots, lots of things come through that are more positive than negative at the moment. Um, but in terms of the, the recovery, that is going to affect the job market. So there is going to be less opportunity over the next few years, I'm sorry to say. But, you know, there will be um, still opportunities out there. We're seeing British Airways. They are still recruiting for their sort of commercial and finance graduates, for example. So a, a lot of airlines and um, companies in the aviation sector are still heavily recruiting, particularly early career professionals and graduates as well. So, you know, there is still that, that, that opportunity out there. So how can you get involved with us? So um, you can join our Young Professionals Network. So we have over 8,000 individuals in our YPN um, and they have their own dedicated activities. And what you can do all sorts of different things within the YPN. So you can volunteer with us. So we run a volunteer recruitment program each year. Obviously, over the past year, we haven't been able to run this, but hopefully in the summer when we might be able to return to some face to face events, um, we will be recruiting volunteers um, and we go all over the world with our volunteers. So it's not just in the UK. So it's an opportunity for you to come with us to um, other 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 countries. We attend major air shows all over the world. We're hopeful that in November this year, the Dubai Air Show will actually be running. So, you know, we probably need 50 to 100 volunteers with us um, during that time. So a lot of the air shows in the UK have announced they are being cancelled during the, the summer. But hopefully later in the year, um, we might see a return to, to even more events. So you have that opportunity. You can become a member of our separate committee. So there is the Young Persons Committee. They run their own conference each year and then other dedicated events. Um, so they run their own um, competitions, lectures, conferences um, and other activities as well. If you do decide to become a member of the YPN, then um, you can join a local branch. So I mentioned a couple of branches in the Midlands area, such as Coventry, Wolverhampton. Um, you have the option to perhaps sign up and join that local branch if you wish as well and contribute to their output. So this is really great to sort of put on your CV as well to showcase that you've got involved in these activities on a, on a community and local level as well. So it, it enhances your employability essentially as well by getting involved with this network uh, or getting involved with a society in general. We offer a free careers advice and guidance service as well. So again, um, at the end, if anybody wants to contact me to arrange a separate conversation, whether it's with myself or with another member of the team, I'd happily do that. We also have a separate careers website as well, which is careersinaerospace.com with loads of free information, advice and guidance on there as well. So we also give you access to develop your knowledge. So we have lots and lots of resources, including our monthly aerospace magazine, blogs. We have the National Aerospace Library, which is the biggest library in the world dedicated to this industry. And we have a huge collection of, of online materials within that library. So it can help you within um, your studies as well, something to utilize alongside the resources um, at UCB as well. I've already mentioned about volunteering with us. We have multiple opportunities, so not just within our Young Professionals Network, but also within our events team, um, our publications team, and also membership teams as well. So if you are interested, again, you can contact me um, if you are interested in, in signing up to volunteer with us. And then we have a huge collection of on-demand on materials. So we really encourage you to use all of these, these resources alongside your studies, but also carry on when you're working in the industry as well. So you can sign up to the free student affiliate membership. So those of you who are studying full time, um, you can sign up and join the society for free as a student affiliate member. You will then be able to access all of our materials, um, all of our learning materials. You'll then also be able to start to volunteer with us and attend our events, whether they're at our headquarters or whether they're at one of our branches or divisions all over the world. 
So you can sign up by going to aerosociety.com slash student, or you can scan the QR code there with your phone. Doing my best NHS test and trace act there, but you can sign up using that um, Q QR code there, and that will take you directly to um, the form, which will take five or 10 minutes to fill out. And then we will activate your membership on, um, on your behalf within the next few days. And then you'll be able to get involved with all of our um, events, activities, and volunteer with us and access the careers uh, guidance and information as well. So I'll just leave you with our social media handles there, guys, if you want to give us a follow, keep up to date with everything that we're doing. And I've popped all the three email addresses there. So if you're interested in the, the Young Professionals Network for careers advice and membership, there's the three teams there that can help you. But again, you're more than welcome to contact me directly. Um, and I'll pop my, my email address uh, into the chat as well. Um, if you um, wanted to contact me directly to arrange a separate conversation. So thank you very much. I know that's that's very brief, but I think some questions have, have come in. So I'll gladly take thank any questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's quite a few questions in the public chat. So starting off with, if sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, Sergio. Um, so above my comment, so you'll see it just there. So starting off with that one. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a look. So, um, so I think we've got one here. Um, yep, I've got it. So, how do you provide? Yeah. So, do we provide um, placement schemes for second year? So, we um, aren't an employer um, as such. We're we're here to we're here as the professional body to give you that advice and information in terms of not only where to find jobs, but also where to find perhaps placements and things like that. Um, and by getting involved with us um, to sort of enhance your employability and your professional career development as well. So we don't provide placements ourselves, um, but we are able to provide that guidance because we, we have links with over 250 industry partners. So we are able to provide that sort of information from our partners where there, there could potentially be placements. So the, the best thing to do um, would be just to drop either myself or the careers team an, an email. Um, so the um, just careers at aerosociety.com or, or myself an email um, just to say that you, you are interested and then I uh, in sort of finding a placement. And then I can go away, do some digging with our industry partners and, and sort of come back to you with what we find essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to, to do that as well. Um, so I think we've got another question here from um, Hemanth. Apologies if, if I've pronounced that incorrectly. Um, how to approach a career in UK av aviation as an international student. So, yeah, you know, it obviously depends on what you want to do. Um, where a lot of international students do find um, uh, they will find a barrier is is if they want to work in defence um, or any um, sort of aerospace or aviation companies where you have to be security cleared. Um, usually, a lot of a lot of companies, you know, whether you, you know whether you want to work for um, a defence aerospace company, you, just, you take the likes of BAE Systems, for example. You know, they are a huge defence contractor here in the UK for aerospace. Um, usually, they like you to be a British national or have five years residency in the UK. Um, so that can be a barrier. But if you want to work in commercial aviation, um, then that's that's not uh, that shouldn't be an issue at all um, if you're not um, a, a UK national. Um, so a couple of other questions here. So um, from Alexandra, so how about uh, first year starter in aviation? Do you offer any apprenticeships or part time jobs? So Again, we're not the employer as such, but we can uh, provide that information and um, advice in terms of where to find apprenticeships or any part-time jobs as well. So you're more than welcome to contact me if you want to arrange um, if you want to arrange that conversation. That's absolutely fine. Um, so let's have a look. Um, so I think that's pretty much it if anybody's got any other questions let me know i'll pop the my direct email address into the chat um so you can contact me directly if you wish
Thank you for your time, Nick. Yeah, if you could put your email in the chat box in the students yeah. directly. Thank you. Yeah. That was a great presentation. It has been recorded. The students can watch it back afterwards as well. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Sabah. Thank you, everybody. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Our next speaker will be Sergeant Andrew from the Royal Air Force. Andrew, are you able to hear us? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, should be able to see my camera. If not, no worries. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, we I'm can. I'll, leave, I'll hand it over to you. Cool. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sergeant Andrew Chambers from the Royal Air Force. Uh, by trade, I'm RF Police. Uh, if we go to the next slide. There's a couple of pictures, uh, just the various things I've done throughout my career. Uh, I'll give you a bit of an overview just so you uh, know where my uh, knowledge is coming from. So the top left photo, the picture of the four of us sat on the back of the aircraft, uh, that is taken in uh, Mozambique. Uh, I was there on a humanitarian mission uh, after the country got hit by a cyclone a day, which took out uh, parts of their airport, a lot of their infrastructure. Uh, we took a load of shelters, food, water, uh, blankets, all that uh, good stuff to help them get back on their feet and start the recovery process. Uh, it was quite a good trip. It's probably one of the most rewarding I've done. Uh, with my career, I've managed to get to 49 different countries around the world. Um, and I'd probably say majority of that is doing humanitarian stuff or training uh, other militaries around the world. So I've felt... I've had some uh, really good experiences and got to travel uh, quite a bit. Um, the top right, uh, that is, uh, I got awarded uh, a commendation. So I was on the Queen's Birthday Honours list in 2016. I did a bit of work with uh, UK Intelligence and SA19 of the Met Police uh, just to look at the terrorist uh, threat to uh, UK military. Um, it was a really good piece of work, really interesting, getting to work with uh, other agencies. Uh, did open my eyes in the way other people work and the way organisations uh, interact differently. So it was a really good experience for me. Uh, and then the bottom ones, uh, that's they're a bit of me uh, and the rugby that I've managed to play. Um, one of the best is I played at Carla Farms Park, which is the bottom left picture. Uh, it's a professional rugby stadium. Um, we've, we've been in the RAF, they've helped me... Uh, to get all the way up to uh, semi-professional uh, standard in rugby. Um, so, yeah, so they are really positive and pro any sort of activities that you do outside of work as well, whether it's sporting, adventurous training, or even we even have a, our own e-games team at the minute. So there's loads of opportunities outside of your work as well as within your work. So uh, this slide here is a slide of all the roles. I'm not going to go into all of them because there's a hell of a lot of information. If there is anything on there that I don't cover or that you want to find out more, jump onto our website. All the information's on there. Um, we've even got a YouTube video, so you can go look at them to see people actually doing the different roles. But I'll just cover a bit of a pre on all of the different areas just to give you a bit of an overview. So you've got the technical and engineering. Um, as it says, these guys are the guys responsible for making sure our aircraft work, our vehicles working, our weapon systems are working, uh, stuff like your ejector seats, parachutes, uh, life rafts, all that stuff are working and in good working order. Uh, so they'll do everything from your mechanical, all your electrical stuff, uh, woodworking. They're even doing 3D printing of parts now for the aircraft. So they're really developing them and bringing them up into uh, the modern technology. Um, are what you used to be called like information technology guys, all our computer guys. They all fall under the cyberspace communication specialist role. Uh, these guys do everything from setting up your computer all the way up to doing soft, software writing, uh, app work, app creation, ethical hacking, uh, and all that sort of stuff, and cybersecurity as well. So they get into quite a lot of uh, interesting work. Um, then you've got the medical uh, side of stuff. Uh, we've literally got every role you can think of in the medical field. And the reason we've got this is if we were to go to war and we had to set up a field hospital, we could operate it. And because of this fact, a, a lot of our medical staff, uh, they get sent to NHS hospitals around the country to work in various departments to get real-time experience. So although uh, these people are in the Royal Air Force, 
they're actually working in in your local NHS hospital, uh, seeing normal people. They're not just restricted to military personnel. They're working on normal people, uh, just everyday customers in that department, uh, treating them for whatever illness or ailments they have. The only two types of doctors we don't have is children, because there's no children in the military, and also cancer. Um, if anyone in the Air Force was to uh, get cancer or get diagnosed with it, they would then just fall under the NHS uh, umbrella because it is quite a expensive um, area to uh, field. So we leave it to uh, the NHS who have got the specialists and all that. Um, so then, yeah, we've got our support agencies in the middle. So these are the guys who look after anything that's uh, legal for us. So if we've got any concerns, uh, we've got uh, our legal officers, uh, which in normal civil civilian street, they're your lawyers. They're the guys who look after the law side. Chaplain, uh, chaplain, whatever faith you you are, uh, we have chaplains or imams or whatever head of that uh, the religion. We have got them. Um, you may not have them at the unit you're based at, but you will have access to them. So whether you do it virtually or uh, uh, by other means, uh, they do open up their facilities. Uh, we do have physical training instructors. These are guys responsible to make sure that we are maintaining our fitness levels and if we were to get injured or that, they help us with our recovery programs uh, and that side of things. Uh, next, we'll look at the intelligence. These are the guys who look at where we're going, what's happening in that area, local culture, local religion, all this information. So then when we actually do go into that area, we're not going to cause offence, we're not going to upset people, and we're going to conduct ourselves in the correct way because every culture, we all have our own little things, uh, little ways of doing things. So by having the intelligence guys, they'll look at all sorts uh, to make sure that when we do go in, we're fully aware of what we're going into, uh, what the local uh, culture is, and just how uh, how it works in local areas because everywhere is different. It doesn't matter what country you go to, everyone operates slightly differently. Um, the force protection guys, this is where my role falls under. So you've got uh, our police inside. We're responsible for anything that's police related and also anything that's security related. So make sure all our aircraft and personnel are going to be safe uh, wherever they go in the world. Um, this is what I do as a role. So it's quite interesting to get travel to some weird and wonderful places. Um, one of the trips I went to is I went to Ukraine uh, with uh, Gavin Williamson, who at the time was Defence Secretary. It was quite an interesting trip. I not really considered going to Ukraine, but whilst there, uh, the little bits I did get to see, it's a beautiful country and it's quite an amazing place that, to be honest, I wouldn't mind going back to to holiday to see a bit more. Um, so yeah, so that's the RAF Police. The RAF Regiment, that's the infantry role in the Air Force. These are our ground fighting specialists. Uh, so what the infantry does in the Army, the RAF Regiment do for us in the Air Force. Uh, and then you've got a firefighter. These are trained to the same level as your everyday firefighter. The only difference is these also then get additional training how to perform that role uh, in uh, combat locations and also on aircraft. So they do get that specialization a bit a bit more training to give them a bit more uh, niche skill, sh skill set for the environment they're going to have to work in. Um, the Air Ops guys, they're the guys who make sure the pilots have their flight routes, make sure that uh, they're communicating with during the whole process from taking off whilst in the air and then landing again. So you've got your air traffic control guys who come under the air ops. Uh, you've got the guys who will uh, look after them when they're in the air, talk to them, uh, give them any mission updates if there's slight changes uh, and all that stuff. Um, they literally look after, make sure the aircraft are able to do what they need to do to try and reduce uh, what the pilots having to do so they can focus on their main uh, role. Uh, the logistic guys, these are the ones who make sure our people, our equipment, are all where it needs to be. So they will make sure whether it's got to get from one location to another in the UK or overseas, that is getting there. So you've got our movers who will look after loading and unloading of our aircraft, whether it's people, uh, kit, tanks, helicopters, they're the ones that make sure that it gets loaded and it gets uh, sent to the right locations. Our drivers, they're, they're the ones who will move the kit around. 
The drivers are also responsible for uh, the refueling of the uh, aircraft as well. Uh, so they can uh, uh, drive fuel tankers, coaches, everything really from a car up. Um, then you've got our air ground steward there. Uh, probably the closest thing we've got to cabin crew uh, on our uh, passenger transporter. They're the guys who will look after us, make sure we're all okay, make sure that if anything was happened, that we, we're going to be uh, sorted. So they effectively are uh, the cabin crew for the Royal Air Force. Um, and then last but not least, you've got the air crew. So you've got your pilots um, and the remote piloted aircraft system. There are drone pilots. And then you've got the weapon system operators. So the pilots and the uh, remote piloted aircraft system, they're responsible for flying the aircraft, whether it's an actual airplane or whether it's a drone. And then the weapon system operators, they're the guys who look after the back end of the aircraft. So whether it's like the weapon systems, um, the loads getting put on, all that sort of stuff. They're the guys who are responsible to look after it to make sure it's get, it is done correctly. And it's just to reduce what the pilot's having to worry about so the pilot can focus on the flying of the aircraft, make sure they're getting to where they need to be in one piece and safely. So that is the end of it. There's a few uh, links on there. What I'll do now is I'll uh, answer a few of the questions. Um, Cool. So, where do we start? I think it's. Uh, Would you like me to? Read? Oh, you got them. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's just taken a little time to uh, load up. So, Tanya asks, "I've seen so many adverts on Royal Air Force, and it's so interesting." Yeah, um, we have got quite a uh, busy uh, pu publicity uh, at the moment. Um, the main push for us is we're trying to ensure that our recruitment is a true reflection of society. So we look at recruiting everything from uh, females to individuals from uh, different uh, environments. So, yeah, um, we are pushing. Uh, we're trying to increase the amount of females in the Air Force uh, because we were the first military in the UK that uh, females could do absolutely every role. So because we only opened up like the last role, uh, not too long ago, uh, we're just trying to push to try and get a bit more females to just increase the uh, female numbers into the Air Force because we identify that everyone's got their own skill sets, uh, male and females, uh, skill sets are slightly different and you need a broader range of all skill sets. So we are increasing it. Um, on our last intake, we had, uh, I think it was 29 females on the course out of 100. So uh, in my eyes, the figures are going in the right way. And also, um, more importantly, we're trying to also increase uh, our BAME figures as well, which uh, our target is 10%, uh, which, uh, I'm, well, from the figures that I've been sent, we're hitting as well. And all we want is to make it a true reflection of society, because at the end of the day, we are uh, just normal people, uh, but we want to give everyone the opportunities uh, and I think with the adverts that we are pushing out, we're just trying to educate people at what opportunities are available with careers in the Royal Air Force. So, next one. Um, Matteo, um, is it Stimac? Uh, hello, Andy. Does the Royal Air Force offer any one-year placement options at the moment? Uh, unfortunately, we don't offer placements or opportunities like that. Uh, if you join us, you join us for a career. However, Yes, we're going to give you a 12 year contract initially, but if you just stay for three to four years, that's perfectly fine. It's like any other job, you can leave early. Um, obviously, we don't really want you to join to be with the intention to leave after a couple of years. However, we're not going to prevent you. We want you to join and to have a successful career with us and uh, take on all the different opportunities that are available. Um, however, if you one, you can join the RAF reserves whilst you are, are at university. Um, if you just Google um, RAF reserves or as you're a university student, you can, uh, if you search for university air squadron and find the local one to you, it's quite similar to the reserves, but they also help you uh, get into the RAF after university. So that might be an option for you, Matteo, to look at the university air squadron. Um, hopefully that helps. Okay, so 
Next one. Uh, Adabi, can European national apply for a position or is it only British nationals? Uh, so we do have residency statuses for the different roles. Uh, if you've been in the UK for five years and you uh, do get British uh, citizenship, uh, you do become eligible. Um, we also do take uh, Commonwealth um, uh, citizens as well. Uh, so what I'd suggest is if there is a role that interests you, just have a look at it, uh, have a look at the residency status and to see if you meet the criteria. I mean, it is a bit of minefield, but everything's on the website uh, just to try and help you out. So you, you may find the answer on there for you. Um, OK, so Melissa, are there any age limits? Uh, there are age limits. Um, we've got some roles that start at 16 and then obviously some that start a bit older but in general if you guys are going to be at uni so you're going to be above the age of 18 so all the uh roles are pretty much open to you the only roles that probably aren't are going to be like uh the legal officer or the doctor because you've got to be qualified in the roles obviously you're going to need to be i don't know how long their uh, degrees last so you're going to be like 22 23 whatever uh, by the time you finish your degree so you will be that bit older but in regards to if you're wanting to join when you're older in life, uh, you can actually join the Air Force up until the age of uh, 48. So there is quite a big window for you to join. Um, so if it's not something you fancy doing straight away, you can do later in life. Uh, I didn't join until I was 20. Uh, however, I've loved it and it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, Tanya, yeah, 16. Uh, it is young, but you do get some uh, kids that are mature. And because uh, you can't join until you've collected your GCSEs, uh, there's very few that actually are just turned 16. So they're all starting to get closer to 17. So they are a bit more mature. Um, but yeah, uh, during the application process, we do assess them on their maturity levels uh, just to assess sort of how they're going to cope with the basic training and moving away from home so it's not a case of oh we'll just have them we do sort of assess them before we let them in uh, so sometimes we do say to people look go away come back in 12 months uh, just uh, get a bit more life experience just a bit more maturity uh, so it's not a case of yes although it is open from 16 we we are a bit cautious we don't want to take the 16 year olds because it is quite a big change However, you do get some really mature 16-year-olds who excel. So, it, yes, it is young. I totally agree with that. But some people know what they want to do and they do have that maturity and they meet uh, our sort of standards. So, yeah, I, I do agree with you, though, Tanya. It's a bit, it does sound a bit young. Okay. Uh, yeah, what is the joining process in the IF? Uh, well, simply just go on our website, find the role that interests you. Uh, and click apply. Once you apply, you'll get invited in for a bit of testing. It's a uh, psychometric testing, so it's simple maths, English, bit of science, uh, memory test, and that. See how you perform. Once you've done that test, it, uh, your results will give us uh, what you're eligible for. If you've passed for your uh, role, perfect. You'll then go on to our uh, interview. Pass that. You'll do a medical. Pass that. You do a fitness test. Pass that you're pretty much in. It's just a case of us uh, applying for a slot on the training course for you. Um, it's kind of a, it is a simple process, but on average, it takes about six months. Uh, so it does give us time to properly assess the candidates to make sure that they've got the correct maturity and the correct um, motivation to join the REF. Um, hopefully that answers your uh, question there, Yad. So, um, Melissa, would you be required to do some kind of initial fitness training? Uh, if you do prepare, it is advantageous. If you jump on our website, uh, we have a 12 week training program called Fit for Action. I'll just double check, I've got it here. Yeah, nice little uh booklet. It's called Fit for Action, it's a 12 week pr training program that's been designed to take people who have done zero fitness to being able to uh have a relatively good chance of passing our uh, pre joining fitness test. So if fitness is something that you're concerned about, jump on our website. There's loads of help. You don't need to join a gym with this. There's all stuff that you can do with just a pair of running trainers, a T-shirt and shorts, a bit of running, a few exercises, and uh, that's it.
all the exercises are fully explained how to do in it. There is some diagrams uh, which shows you how to do it and perform it correctly. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully if fitness is something that you're concerned about, hopefully look at that and it'll put your mind at ease or it's something that can uh, help you to uh, just improve your fitness to make sure you do meet our standards if it is something that you uh, want to uh, want to pursue as a career. Um, okay, so uh, Yasmin's posted our uh, application uh, website. Our oh, cheers, thank you for that. Um, Kaylee, I just looked at the University Air Squadrons and there are different unis. Do we have to attend that specific one or the one nearest to where we study? Uh, so the way it works with the University Air Squadron is, yes, we don't have one at every uni. Uh, just find one that's close to your university and you can join. So most universities will be affiliated to a University Air Squadron. So if you just go on, find the one that's closest to you, have a look at the ones and it will tell you what links. Uh, all the contact details will be on there. Um, and it's a good place. Uh, if the RAF is something that you're looking to do uh, post-university, it's a good place to sort of set you up because they can help you out with the interview process, uh, all the application process. And the other thing is they do a lot of visits to sites and uh, you'll get to visit people. So you get to see what all the different roles do so you can better understand what role it is that's probably going to suit you. And you might find something that you've never thought of before, but you think, you know what, that's actually really interesting. That's something I wouldn't mind actually doing as a career, something different. Uh, and the University Air Squadrons, um, not at the moment because of COVID. However, once the COVID restrictions uh, do ease, they do visit all our units. So they do get the opportunity to go to our units uh, in Cyprus, uh, in Gibraltar and around the UK. So they do get to do a bit of travelling as well. So it's uh, some good opportunities there as well. Um, I think that is the last questions that I can see on my screen. Uh, but what I say is uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you do want any further information, jump on our website, have a look. Everything's on there. Uh, if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy for you to uh, get in contact with uh, the organisers of this and they can forward on uh, questions to me. Um, and I'm more than happy to help that way. Or just contact your uh, local career office. A few guys, there's one in the city centre. Get in contact with them and uh, they'll be able to help you out. But no, thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully I've been of some help. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, would you be able to put your email address in the chat box just in case students would like to contact you if they have any other questions, if that's okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, <laughs> Okay, everyone, so our next presentation will be City Year. Unfortunately, the employer is having some technical issues, so I will be going through the presentation on her behalf. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I will go through them for you um, as much as I am able to. Um, so I'll start going through the slides. So City Year. Um, City Year is a youth and education charity which empowers 18 to 25 year olds from all backgrounds to tackle educational inequality through a year of full time volunteering in schools. So they have a leadership development programme but it, with a difference. So they're recruiting 18 to 25 year olds and volunteers gain leadership experience to boost their career prospects while making a difference to children's lives. So why is, City, why is City Year here? So educational inequality remains one of the biggest issues facing the UK. Children are trapped by a lack of money and by a lack of belief in what the education system can offer them. City Year UK helps children overcome academic challenges and gives them the skills to deal with emotional and social issues that come between them and their education. So what will City Year give you? So it will give you a fresh challenge, new friendships and fun. The chance to develop a range of new skills, a boost to your CV, making you stand out to employers, a year of practical work experience and work shadowing opportunities, access to a mentor to help support your professional development, up to £4,400 a year towards living expenses and the opportunity to inspire school children to reach their full potential. 
So what will you do in school? A typical day in school would be 8 a.m. start usually, where you'd have breakfast clubs and fun exercises with the pupils. Um, 9 a.m. would be in the classroom with learning. Um, 10 a.m. would be a usual break time. 11.30 a.m. would be one-to-one -one support with you and a student. 12.30 p.m. would be lunchtime. And 3.30 p.m. would be after school clubs. So it is quite a, a fun packed day as well. So leadership development, you'd have learning, training and, and coaching sessions, careers guidance and interview skills, unique work shadowing opportunities, access to leaders from within public, private and voluntary sectors. You'd have a lot of networking opportunities and your own tailored personal development plan, access to a mentor during your time with City Year. So this is just some of the things that some volunteers have said from the top. One, it says, I did City as my placement year and it was an unforgettable experience. It gave me a sense of purpose and I learned to believe in myself. And I also came away with skills that will support my future. And the bottom one, what drew me to City Year was the opportunity to develop my leadership skills. I gained so much knowledge and experience and I feel like a new and improved version of myself. It was a genuinely life-changing experience. So life after City Year, what our volunteers did next? More than nine out of 10 volunteers are in further education, employment or training within three months of graduating from City Year. And you can see from the pie chart the different sectors that um, students have moved into once they've com completed their volunteering with City Year. So entry requirements, you have to be 18 to 25 years old on the day you start with City Year. You have to be able to live or be able to commute easily to Greater Manchester, West Midlands, Coventry or London during the year. You need to be allowed to live and work in the United Kingdom. You need to do a complete DBS check and you need to have the commitment to make a difference to children's lives and to want to help them on their journeys within education. So to apply, applications are now open for an August start date and you can use that um, web address to find out more information on their website interviews are currently all held online as well and it will be starting in august 2021 so that is the employer's email address if you would like to get into contact with her with any questions you have but i do have a video to show you that will give you a better idea of what city year is like i will just upload it now <clears throat>
I hope that gave you a bit more information. I'll just check if there is any questions. Sorry, I am a bit of a fast talker. Um, but the presentation will be made available to you and I've put a link to the website in the chat box as well, which will give you more information on the programme. How many days a week is it? I believe it is full time, but the website will be able to tell you exactly how long it would be and um because it is a year long program and if you do email Chauvin should be more than happy to help you with any questions you may have so I hope that was informative and I gave you all the information that was needed and if you do have any questions as I say please email Chauvin before we go on to our next presentation Thank you, Yasmin, um, for that. And thank you to everyone so far who are listening. Um, we are halfway through now and not long to go till we finish our um, you know, afternoon employability fair. Ravi from Wetzel Consulting will be joining us shortly. So if I give you guys a couple of minutes, we are quite ahead of schedule. Um, yeah, maybe a couple of minutes, grab a cup of coffee, drink, tea, anything, toilet break, whatever you guys need to do. And I'll rejoin you guys in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hi all. Are you back from your did you have a quick cup of tea or make a cup of tea or coffee or grab a drink to keep you going? We just got the last few employees now who will talk through their opportunities. And uh, you can, you know, you can hear about more about um, what they're offering to a student. Uh, so hoping you guys are back and refreshed. Um, we are joined by Ravi from Betza Consulting, who has um, supported many students uh, from UCB in the past. So, so Ravi, I'm more than happy to pass it over to you now. If you wanted to unmute your mic, and be presenter as well. Hi, Ravi, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Oh, but yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Is it okay if you could talk a bit more louder? More louder. Maybe more closer to the mic? How about it now? Yes, much better. Is that okay, guys? Can you guys hear Ravi well? Yep, yeah, I think that's all fine. Thank you. Okay, how many minutes we have? You have around ten, around ten minutes or so. All right. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. This is Ravi Vetsa. I'm the founder and CEO for the Vetsa Consulting Services Limited. Uh, we have an office in Coventry, but we operate globally. Uh, what do we do? And let me go to the next slide. So we are a boutique. IT consulting and business transformation services company. Uh, what do we mean by IT consulting? We provide technology advisory and consulting services to various size and scale businesses from a small SME organization till very large organizations like Centrica, ZF, etc. We provide uh, consultants in the digital transformation, digital technologies, building applications very quickly. Uh, the computer applications very quickly for various purposes across the businesses. And we also help the businesses get their IT infrastructure in a cloud environment, a private cloud within their company or public cloud like Amazon or Microsoft, etc. So we provide technology solutions for solving business challenges be it a hospitality industry or retail industry or bank, investment banking, manufacturing, so on and so forth. And we also help businesses in process consulting in terms of how they can deliver their business better. How can they do more with less? We help them deliver the business through structured project management and applying techniques like Lean and Six Sigma 
and flexible ways of working. We also do training, coaching, mentoring services for various businesses. Let me go to the next slide. It's another summary of various services we provide for businesses from consulting in creation of strategy or improving a business process or leveraging technology, the digital stuff, software for various purposes of the business. It could be customer relationship management where you manage uh, gathering the data of the customers to how do we follow up with them, how do we take feedback from them, how do we manage the all aspects of managing customers to a business. Tool, building any custom solutions for the business, developing very rapidly in a flexible way. We use uh, latest technologies like Internet of Things, sensor-based, devices-based softwares. For example, if there is a conference room in a hotel, and the temperature is nice, which everybody feels good, and there could be some sensors, which will take the temperature of the room. If it gets hot, then the sensors will send the information to the software. Software control the temperature to cool the room to normal temperature again. That is called Internet of Things in a simplistic way. And we provide a lot of automation solutions, various businesses again, and doing the testing. So, in summary, our value proposition really is apply industry standards based on the industry sector which you're working on, apply the best practices using our knowledge and experience our team has, delivering the best outcome for our customers, our clients, through our capable team. What opportunities we can provide? We can provide work placements in the area of IT, sales, marketing, social media, administration, could vary anywhere from three weeks, four weeks to up to two months. And we can also offer some apprenticeships in the areas of software development in IT. And also we can provide some apprenticeship in the areas of operations and general business administration. I can promise you one thing, all these opportunities will really kind of help you learn with excitement, right? So that's why we said exciting opportunities for learning, working with us. That's really kind of what I want to really talk to today. So you got my contact details here. And if anyone interested, you can email to the email ID given here and Saba also will have our contact details. So Thank just to you, summarize, perfect. we are a tech consulting business transformation company working across various industries with global customers. Any questions? Thank you, Ravi, for that. Um, there is quite a few questions coming in the public chat right now. There's, there's one question from a student, um, Matteo, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Hello, Ravi, does your company uh, offer any one-year placement options at the moment? Well, one year placement is more like a job, isn't it? So uh, depending on the individual experience and expertise, I can certainly consider that. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, a few students have said thank you, Ravi. Thank you. OK, that's that's all it was. I just wanted to ask in terms of your business type roles you have, you know, with social media, marketing, because a lot of the students uh, who are in the conference today are from the business background. Um, how many days is it, or are you quite flexible, um, or, you know, how how is it in terms of your company? No, we are flexible in terms of the timelines. Uh, we can offer work placements anywhere between two to three weeks to up to two months. And uh, if things work out well, we might offer long-term opportunities as well. Did I answer your question, Sava? Sure, yes, yes, it is. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask at the same time. Um, <laughs> okay, a lot of the students are saying thank you, that's perfectly fine. Um, if they, if, if obviously, if they have any further questions, they're more than happy to contact you on the email address that's on the slide, guys. So anything else, if you, you know, if you are interested, you know, if you want to do some sort of work placement or experience, you're more than welcome to contact Ravi directly. 
um and then we could take it from there but thank you so much for your time ravi it's a pleasure being there thank you. all the very best everyone thank you take care bye bye okay so we have the next company from even break um kiana are you in the conference by any chance because i can't tell sorry i can't really tell who's in the conference um in the meantime i'll upload a presentation um yes, I, I am here yeah i'm just oh, brilliant brilliant <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay yeah. excellent that's great i'm just going to upload your presentation kiana in the meantime you're more than welcome to, you know, uh, put on your camera or, you know, however you wish to set up what this is uploading for you. Okay, that's right. Um, I'll just start sharing my video. Um... Okay. okay, just uploading the slides and I'll make you presenter. Fantastic, thank you. There you are. Great, awesome. Um, so is it all right for me to start? Is that okay? Yes, perfect, thank you. Great, um, so thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Gianna and I am Transit Engagement Manager at Evenbreak. Uh, Evenbreak is a, is a platform um, for disabled candidates and inclusive employers. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what opportunities we have for you. Um, so I'd like to start off with the social model of disability and a dozen brilliant reasons and um, so that's basically our ethos um, and our thinking behind um, our, our whole business and then I uh, want just to mention a few opportunities that you could find on our platform and support as well. Um, so I will just skip past this video because it's not working um, but if you'd like to have a look at our I am campaign video and um, it's on our YouTube channel and social media but um, basically what the, the video's message was is that disabled people are the entrepreneurs and um, we are in every aspect of the workplace um, and it's important to sort of bust these myths about disabled people um, and what they can and can't do in the workplace. So we are based on the social model of disability and that means that we think it's the barriers in our society that disables people, not their impairment or health condition. And so really for us and our message is that we have to remove those barriers um, in the workplace so that we can access talent um, that disabled people offer. And I think a really good example of that is looking at how we communicate. So um, a lot of us can read text on, on paper or on screen, but if someone has a visual impairment, then they might need to use the Braille alphabet um, on paper, or they might need to use special software um, to to help with the on on uh, laptops. So following on from this style of thinking that um, we have to remove barriers, um, our CEO Jen Hatton has actually written a book called A Dozen Brilliant Reasons to Employ Disabled People, um, and this book explores. The, the skills that disabled people bring to the workplace over and above other non-disabled candidates. And everything, all the points made here, they are actually backed up by facts and statistics um, and evidence. Um, so I'll just go through a few of these. Businesses who are inclusive um, benefit 
because first of all, they have a wider talent pool. Um, and when they have a wide talent pool, it means they're more likely to find um, the right person for the role that they they want. There is increased productivity um, amongst disabled candidates in the workplace. And this is really interesting because usually there's a stereotype that disabled people are perhaps less productive, but it's found that it's actually the opposite. There is reduced absenteeism and fewer health and safety accidents at work. Um, again, that could be linked to management skills um, from lived experience as a disabled person. Um, the Purple Pound. So if you haven't heard of the Purple Pound, that is a 249 billion pound spending power in the UK alone that disabled people and their families have. And so if businesses hire us and they know um, they have insight into what we want from them, they can access um, that large sum of money and they can profit from that financially. Um, and disabled people are also more creative and innovative in the workplace, possibly because we have to live in a world that's not made for us. We are constantly trying to look at rebuilding the system and thinking out of the box. So again, lived experience leads to that additional skill. And finally, there's increased workplace morale because other employees feel that yes, this this workplace values um, my talent and my expertise. There's some wider benefits. Um, I would definitely say read Jane's book. Um, it is usually targeted towards employers, but I think as candidates, it's really useful to know um, what you're bringing to the workplace. And so our job board is the only AAA accessible job board in the UK um, for disabled candidates. Um, and we have thousands of vacancies that are updated regularly. Um, so I've listed some here. We have opportunities with Financial Times, RNIB, Fashion Matches, um, and some other opportunities that I thought might be interesting um, given uh, the background of your studies. Um, so head of talent management, um, head of trust and safety project management, business management associate, workplace and travel manager, and program and operational readiness. So lots of opportunities with different companies and if if you are looking to work with a specific employer or if you're looking for a specific opportunity and then keep checking and um, because we do update very very regularly um, and again just some of the employers that we work with include uh, big names like Heathrow, NHS, RNIB, Bulb, UKTV, Amazon, Depop, ITV, HS2, Financial Times, Carnival UK and the Wellham Trust. Um, so really across a wide range of sectors. Um, if you'd like any help in sort of applying for these opportunities, we have recently launched our brand new careers hive, which is your go-to for careers coaching and advice. Um, obviously, from your university, you'll be able to, to access lots of support as well. So our support is not supposed to um, take over that, but it's just meant to complement um, any services that the, the university and the other organisations um, that we partner with already have. 
and just some of the organizations that we worked in partnership with um they offer one-to-one -one support so have a look at, at their um at them on our partnership page so yeah thank you very much you can register with us um to keep up to date and we'll send you um highlights in our fortnightly newsletter fortnightly newsletter with um vacancies and if you have any questions um about opportunities or or support that we can offer please do get in touch and uh, my email is on here it's kiana k at evenbreak.co.uk thank you very much Is there any questions at all? Is there time for questions? Thank you, Kiana. There is one question actually which I wanted to ask was, is it free for students to register? Absolutely. So um, our uh, business model is that everything we do for candidates is free. And the only time we will charge is for employers to advertise or doing consultancy or events with actual employers. Great stuff. And uh, you got a few thank yous in the public chat from a few students um, saying thank you. I have another question. I know you mentioned that you're working quite closely with quite a few large organizations. Hmm. Can you give an example of a few companies you're working with um, that are offering business type roles, maybe events? tourism travel sales maybe marketing yeah i mean definitely in terms of uh travel we had um carnival uk they're not they've actually stopped advertising with us just recently i think because of the current um pandemic situation um but we did have carnival uk and um, i'll just i'll just go back um to this slide so again um i was thinking about this before the presentation sometimes the companies that advertise with us so for example facebook um they might not be i don't know if if your students sort of think about facebook when they're looking at management or business um type roles but they, they did have um a few few of those types of roles so Really, I think our unlimited advertisers. Um, if you go on our front page and just look at the, the list of unlimited um advertisers on the front page, they tend to advertise across all sectors. Um, and management and business roles, um, are usually a part of that. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, is there any further questions, guys, for Kiana? Do you guys have any other questions for her? Um, obviously, Kiana, we do have a lot of business students here as well. So hence why I asked that question. But I'm sure if they have any more questions, we're more than happy to contact you directly. If you could pop in your email address in the public chat, that'd be great. Yeah, no worries. I've just done that. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about um, sort of business and management roles. I would say that it really... Um, it, it, it's very fast paced the way that sometimes we put jobs on a platform so i would say um keeping up to date with our newsletter and registering because sometimes we'll we'll get a job um and it's only up there for one or two weeks um, and then it changes all, all the time so yeah thank you thank you very much uh thank you everyone for listening and obviously thank you for to kiana for her time um, we have been working with Even Break for a good year now, and they offer fantastic vacancies, um, especially obviously with those um, you know individuals that have um, you know like a disability or anything like that. They do support those sort of you know students or individuals um, into jobs vacancies. Um, so it is fantastic. So do make sure that you um, go onto the website, or if you have any questions, drop uh, you know Kiana a quick email with any questions that you may have. 
So, so far, guys, thank you very much, uh, of course, for staying on and for listening this afternoon. So I know you all, your majority of you, have had a really long day. We've had a conference in the morning with a variety of speakers, um, you know, from Claire to Nick, you know, all of them, Danny, so all of these guys who spoke in the morning, had a quick break in between. Uh, this afternoon so far, we have had Charlie from Marriott Hotels. So if you're interested in the in, in that sector, hospitality sector, do give Charlie an email. Then you had Nicholas from the Aero Society. Again, if you're looking to volunteering or enhancing your you know experience or your knowledge, um, do drop Nick an email. Then obviously we've had Andrew, Andy. You know you can call him from RAF, so the Royal Air Force, who have loads of vacancies. Um, so a lot of um, you know vacancies in various areas from tourism, aviation, uh, you know business. So we do have quite a few uh, vacancies with them as well. So do make sure you go to the website. Uh, obviously, City Air, unfortunately, um, Shaven couldn't um, join us. So Yasmin kindly went through the presentation on her behalf, but she had a few technical issues. So that's more school education related. However, you know, you can um, still volunteer regardless of, you know, which sector you want to go in. Um, then you had Ravi, who briefly spoke about his company and business IT type roles that he's got available on a voluntary basis. And we've just had Kiana now from Even Break, who spoke about their opportunities as well. So we are going to be, um, hopefully, Enterprise Rental Car will be joining us soon. We are ahead of schedule, as I mentioned before, and then we'll be finished off with University College Birmingham, the marketing team. Enterprise rent car have really good year-long placements as well as internships, and uh, for final year students, um, long-term, you know, full-time um, job opportunities as well. We have had Enterprise rent car come, you know, speak to our UCB students on a regular basis. Even recently in February, we just had Jamie um, speak to students in regards to assessment centers and you know how assessment centers work. Um, so hopefully he will jo be joining us shortly. But before he joins us, um, I just want to kind of go through, obviously we were meant to have duty space and obviously time slots. We couldn't have Enterprise Hive join us today. So I thought whilst we've got a bit of time, a quick five minutes if I can go through the services and what they offer. Has anyone, um, have you guys heard of Enterprise Hive, um, you know, any of you guys, or use Enterprise Hive services at all? Do you drop it in the public chat and let me know what's it doing that. I'm just going to quickly go on the UCB website and see if I can um, share the details as well. But I did mention to them that I will kind of go through what they offer. Um, so, yep. So no, okay, so no, no, no. Anyone else? Have you heard of Enterprise Hive? Um, just trying to see if I can find their website. Don't know why it's not showing. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So Enterprise Hive are based within Hired. Okay, uh, they're not obviously part of Hydra, they're, they're mainly part of business school and their services are open to all of the students across the university, not only business. And they support students uh, who are looking to start up, um, you know, like a small business or, you know, like or have or has an idea of um, starting up um, new. Um, so this is Enterprise Hive, guys, I'm talking about. So the services that are based within UCB. So obviously you've got your hired services, you've got your finance team, you know, you've got your marketing team. So Enterprise Hive is another asset um, that we have within um, UCB. So they support students, um, you know, looking to start up their own business, financial support, where to go, events, um, you know, get involved in competitions, etc. So if you would have an idea, you know, you want to start off a business, or you know need any further support in terms of funding, or want to get involved in the Be Seen project, um, they can support you with that. Where you can book an appointment, uh, you could book an appointment, and you can speak to them in regards to you know your ideas, and they can obviously speak to you in regards to um, you know how they can support you as well. So you can book an appointment by going to the UCB website. So I was actually trying to look for the uh, but the, the link. I'll post that after. Um, but yeah, so you can kind of speak to them in regards to that, um, and you can book an appointment, you know, at any time. And they are supporting online at the moment. Um, but really, really, really good service for you guys to kind of use. 
Um, but I will post the link shortly uh, in the public chat. But before I do that, Jamie is here. So Jamie, I have, I have actually briefly mentioned you and how you've supported UCB students in the past. Um, so thank you for joining. I know we're quite ahead of schedule at the moment, so. Hello. Hi, how are you, are you okay? <laughs> Yeah, re really good, thanks. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. So, Jamie, what I've done is I've just made you presenter. Um, if you want to upload your latest presentation. Yep, yeah, brilliant. Uh, okay. Yes, click on the plus button at the bottom left hand corner and you can upload your presentation and you should start uploading. Um, right, so got Jamie here from Enterprise Event a Car. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have worked very closely with, with you know, with these guys um, on a regular basis from, you know, advertising vacancies, supporting students for getting to placements or, you know, uh, graduate schemes. We recently had Jamie speak in one of the business lecturers, Sangeeta's class. So, you know, if you um, part of Sangeeta's class, he was there on Monday uh, to talk about opportunities and he's here again today to talk about enterprise. So, yeah, Jamie, I'm assuming you're uploading your presentations right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm just having those, those ready tech issues. Bear with, just, 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 if you just keep talking, I'll be with you. I'll be with you shortly. Absolutely fine, not a problem. Also, you not to mention, um, Enterprise will be doing their um, final year. So, finally, students that are looking to get into a graduate scheme or looking for a graduate scheme, um, Enterprise Enterprise will be hosting um, interviews at, uh, in April. Uh, towards the end of April, I've forgotten the date now, but that this will be advertised um, in the next week or two. So if you are interested in getting into the graduate scheme or, you know, knowing a bit, bit more about, um, you know, what they offer, etc., they will be, um, Jamie will be hosting that hopefully online. So we'll be selecting around eight to 10 students in regards to that. Yeah, so that should be good. For some reason, uh, Sabath, it won't, it won't let me drop my um, presentation into the, uh, into the cloud, cloud folder. Okay, no problem. What I'm going to do then is, if I download it for you, um, in the meantime, I'll upload it. I'm just trying a slightly different method. Two seconds. I think this, one, this might work. No worries. If you add it into there and then click on upload, then that should upload for you. Yeah, I'm just going to try that now. Two seconds. I tried to just drag and drop, but it wouldn't let me do that. So I'm just going to. Actually... No, no, that's fine. You have to um, upload it from your documents. Yeah, I'm just going to grab it now. No worries, that's fine. Thank you, Jadine. Yep, that's fine. Jamie's going to talk through the uh, the you know what they offer. Um, so if you bear with him, he will go through the opportunities that they'll be offering. I will. Well, what I won't be offering is is technical advice on computers. Um, because I, I'm struggling here. Hang on, two seconds. That's fine. Have you managed to add it on? Click on upload. Yeah, it's not letting me. It's it's just not accepting the um the document for some reason. No worries, Jamie. If you start talking about the organisation, yeah, I'll upload it for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Right, let me just come off that then. Um, can close that down. Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being with me. Um, and for the record, it's 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 a nightmare. This whole uh, online tech tech based stuff. So it's sometimes. Sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't. So for those that haven't met me before, my name's Jamie Wolf. I work for Enterprise um, Rent-A-Car. I worked for Enterprise for 18 years and done lots of different jobs. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how you get into Enterprise and the kind of journey um, you'd expect to be on um, should you sort of join us. So we, um, we offer two main positions. Um, the first position we offer is a graduate management trainee. Um, position so you essentially join as a as a graduate and we put you onto a fast track development program with a view to get you up to a managerial position very quickly and um, we also have a, a placement offering as well which is a 12-month placement but obviously you need to have that that built into your course to, to do that so if you've got any questions on either um i can answer questions for you as we sort of go through go through this really quick whistle stop tour of of, of the enterprise opportunities so who, who are we, um, Enterprise? We are a, a multinational um, global entity, and we operate in, um, i to remember that slide, we operate in 90 countries, and we turned over 142 billion um, in revenue in the last 12 months. We've got over 100,000 employees and 1.2 uh, 
Um, here we go. Brilliant. I, I think I've got everything right, you know, as well. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to present some. Brilliant. Okay. All, fine. All yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Svath. Um, yeah, 25 billion annual revenue. Top mark. I got that right. And um, we're a family owned business. We've got over 100,000 employees, 2 million vehicles globally. That's incredible. And we, own, we own every car and myself and, and bus, um, camper van, you, you name it. We've, we, we've we've kind of got it. Um, so oh, hang on, I've, I've gone big screen. I can't see my presentation. What's happened there, Sabath? It's fine. If you click on, um, I think on sure. your camera. Yeah. The top, top right hand corner. It's like arrows. Click on that. I think. Is that one? You gone big? I don't know what's happened there. I'm bigger. Um, okay. No. So can you still see my presentation? No, your presentation's gone off. Okay, let me try and do that again. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, let me try to do that again. You can carry on talking in the meantime. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um. So. So. Yeah. So. And the reason why I share that is because not everyone realizes that when you actually see, um, when we actually see, ah, presentations back. Uh, let me get that. Let me put that back up to. We can see that now, can't we? Can you can you guys see that? I can't tell from my side. Yasmin, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, that's fine. As long Perfect. as they can see it, that's fine. Is it is it big or is it is the camera big? I can't tell from my side. No, it's perfect size. Okay, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, brilliant. I don't think I can move it on though. I've got, I've lost my little buttons to move it on. Yep, you can should be able to do it now. I've got it. Right, we're, we're good. Um, okay. Um, so um our values who are we um and th these are really important because when you're applying to any position you need to understand the values of the company you're applying to because it really helps your application um and helps you um position yourself and align yourself with the company um so our values are, are on there but there's, there's a couple of values that i'm, that I'm just going to pick off the slide because you can you can read the slide yourselves and um, the two that really resonate with me is our doors are always open and that is in relation to um, the d diversity um, initiatives we have and the fact we have such a diverse workforce. Um, we have a really big manifesto on our diversity strategies. But someone said to me the other day, Jamie, what does diversity mean to your enterprise? And I have a very, very simple, easy answer. It, you can work at enterprise and be your best self, whatever your best self represents. And that's really important and critical, I think, in life to be able to be yourself um, and be your best self at that. So. So we really do welcome anybody into our business. The, the other um, key key um, uh, founding value which, which I like to talk about is the the um, the fun and friendly enterprise, a fun and, fun and friendly place where teamwork rules. We work with such amazing people, and we have a um, every enterprise depot we walk into is full of fun, friendly, talented individuals, and it really is just a nice place to work. Um, it really makes me feel. Um, happy and some of my best friends are all enterprise people um, and we just seem to attract people that have this out outgoing personalities and that really want to be part of a really dynamic sort of fast-paced workspace so what is the career offer in enterprise so everybody starts at, at, at the same point so everyone joins enterprise at the same level so i joined i came through the door enterprise 18 years ago as a graduate management trainee and and all the people I work around side did the same. So we all start in the same place. Within 12 months, you, you would look to be progressing to um, a management assistant. And then within 12 months to, um, to um, 16 months, assistant manager. And within two years, a branch manager, manager of your own depot. Then you're in charge of a team of graduates and a really, really responsible position. Now, within that, um, you can then diversify, move your career on. So if you wanted then to move on to be a, a regional manager or an area manager, you could. Or if you wanted to move into, say, finance, marketing, human resources, etc., you can also do that. And that's what I did. I um, I progressed from branch manager to regional manager. I managed a region of enterprise where I looked after lots of stores. And then I then went back to my roots and went back into human resources. And I've worked all over HR, all over the UK for enterprise for the past um, six years having done around 11 years in the operational division so you really can do what you want but you've got to be sort of prepared to to sort of start up start out on that general sort of graduate management sort of path 
Okay, so what what could you expect to be doing in that in your in your in your sort of time at enterprise? What kind of sort of skills will you, will you learn? Um, so you'll learn management skills. You'll learn about um, how to be a leader, how to um, sort of talk to your team, develop your team. Because quite often our graduate managers are probably only one one or two years older, and sometimes younger than the team that they actually manage. Um, so it's really interesting to watch that dynamic grow. So we'll learn. We'll teach you how to be a people person and how to sort of get the best out of your team. We'll also um, teach you how to run a business, business management. We'll, we'll teach you how to run a successful profit center, how to really manage um, those those nuanced um, aspects of business. Uh, and, and we have people that have never run a business before. And in two years time, they're actually running a business and doing it really well. And um, market will teach you how to gain new customers. That might be through amazing customer service provision, or it might just, just be through going out marketing and gaining new um, external clients um, for enterprise. Um, sales will teach you how to generate sales yourself and also motivate and manage your sales team. And then the, the last and really important one, customer service. Um, my customers today, are you, are you wonderful people um, fr from, uh, from UCB? And your customers on a different day, my customer on a different day, might be somebody else. But whatever job you do at Enterprise, there's, there's stakeholders involved, and we want to give the best level of service we can to those stakeholders. So it really, um, it really is a broad offering. Now, in terms of, of, of um, the vehicles that we offer, and I, wish, I always like to share um, to, to, to share that slide later on, but you can hire anything at Enterprise. You can hire a golf buggy, a Lamborghini, a refrigerated lorry, a tractor, um, literally electric cars, normal cars, you name it. And we really are the all-round transportation provider. Now, this slide's an interesting one. I always share it because it shows what 12 months looks like at Enterprise. Because people often say, well, what will I do in my first year? It's quite a hard thing to explain to somebody what you'll do. So that is what you'll do. And I'm not going to read every point up because I'm going to run up 10 minutes. But what I can assure you is it's very structured. It's very, you're very guided and led because we're conscious. You've just come straight out of university. So you need that help and support. You need to be able to um, be sort of nurtured and coached along the way. So we do offer that support. You'll be given a training mentor and you'll be also be given a mentor in the brand. So you'll be get lots of support. Um, there's a slide on the vehicles. You can hire literally anything enterprise. When I joined enterprise 18 years ago, you could only hire a car and a van. You can now hire anything that you want. And we do really pride ourselves on the fact that we go to companies and organizations and say, let us sort, sort out your travel solutions. And that is the travel solutions for everybody, the employees, the transportation of goods and services, um, and even employee discounts and benefits. Um, okay, diversity. I spoke about this earlier. Now, we really are proud of our diversity initiatives, and we have a long relationship um, with the universities in, in Birmingham uh, and, and with yourselves. It, it really, really um, is important to us to source talent locally and um, to work in that local sort of Birmingham area. And in fact, if you're not from the area anywhere, in fact, in fact, because we want our local stores to be staffed by local people that represent the local demographics. It's really important for us to, to, be, be, able to be able to show um, how, how, we, how open we are to every employee from every um, every background and walk, walk of life. The other thing about enterprise is you can do anything you want at enterprise. If you join and you've got a passion for a dog charity or um, an LGBT charity, or any charity for that matter. If you want to get involved with it, you can. And you can do it on work time. That's the beauty of enterprise. We, we actually encourage and endorse that kind of um, uh, involvement at a grassroots level. Um, application process, it has changed. It used to be quite a lengthy process. It's now changed and been watered down to um, a, an online provision. So what we do now is you put application form in, um, you have a phone interview, then a video interview, so cameras on, mics on, looking at the screen, giving your best self. And then after that, if you're successful, you'll go to a local operational depot, meet with a regional manager who's a senior branch manager. And then what, what you'll do there is spend an hour and a half with the staff, learning about what the staff do, and then an hour with the two senior managers and go for a, a traditional interview. But it's actually quite an enjoyable experience if you approach it in the right fashion. Um, if you need any help with any applications now or in the future, um, 
there's on the QR codes and, and I'll put I'll pop a link in the chat and, and so Bath will no doubt share that with you after. If you register your details, if you do apply for a position, I can actually help you with your application. Um, and if you let me know you've applied, I can get you past that first phone screen and straight in front of a, a recruiter for an interview if you've got like, the, the basic competencies that we look for. So do take advantage of, of that. Um, awards, we've won loads. Um, the ones we're, there's none we're the, we're the most proud of. We are a, we are a Times Top Hundred Graduate Employer. That's a really prestigious list that's hard to get into, and we've been in there for a long time. We're also a top fifty place where women want to work. Again, really really important to us, um, and we've got lots of diversity awards for both our graduate offering and our placement um, offering as well. So that that last slide that's got some connection details um, for myself and the company. Um, and then I, I think I have, I've let, if we, if we negate the technical issues, I've left it open now for questions. Um, so I'm just going to get up the questions in here. So I think I've, I'm going to catch the questions. Thank you, Jamie. The questions are in the public chat starting. Yeah, the I've got them. I've got them. Um, right. So I think this is the first question from uh, Judine. There's a manager. Uh, management grad scheme require applications to have previous leadership experience now i'm going to say to that how much leadership experience would can we expect someone to have at maybe a younger age in their career now we're not expecting people to have led teams and be managers but you can show your leadership in so many ways and um, you can show leadership as part of teamwork at university you can show teamwork as just as, as part of an entry level position like within a within a Working at Costa, Costa's Coffee or Tesco's or wherever it may be, it's about how you how you explain the fact that you haven't held a leadership position, but you've shown leadership within the positions you've held or the experiences you've had. If if, if that's clear, um, so yes, yeah, so you don't need to have it, um, but but you but you do need to you do need to be able to to position position yourself and the question is, isn't it a uk company um but we're in america we're, we're an american company we're family owned by the taylor family i've met the family they're amazing um and we're uk based now we've got a huge uk presence but we are a family owned american business um that's going to scroll down now to some more questions and um, would international and national relocation opportunities be available if so would this be um, at the point of completing the program or during so Yes, great question. So I, I've had the privilege of moving around the UK with my role. I'm now based down near Cardiff, but I'm originally from up near Sheffield, up north, and, and I've lived in Nottingham as well. So I've lived in three different cities over the past 18 years, and that's been through promotion and, and moving around. You don't have to do that. Um, that was my choice to do it because I, 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 I like moving around and starting up new kind of part walks in my life. In terms of inter international, um, it's quite difficult now for people to go and work in places like America and Canada with the restrictions, not COVID, just in terms of work restrictions. But European opportunities um, are increasing all the time. We, we have a, quite a few UK employees that, that decide they want to go and work in Europe and, in fact, do then go and work over in Europe. So there are some um, opportunities, more so, I'd say, based in the UK um, in terms of moving around. When can you do that? Anytime, really. But... Um, it's probably better to do it once you've got a couple of years under your belt. Um, but if it's, let's say if you lived in Birmingham, but you wanted to work in Cardiff, you could. Just make sure you make it clear that when you're applying for the position, hey, when you speak to your recruiter or myself, hey, I'm based here, but I'd like to work here to start with. So, again, you can really choose um, where you want to sort of work to. And um, what countries is Enterprise operating? Well, we operate in 90, 90 countries, nine now. So lots, lots of countries. The best thing to do is to jump on our website and have a look. And um, so, so Bath will kill me if I list 90 countries and run over time. Um, is it possible to change location after the first year? Yeah, it is actually. You can even change it within your first year. If you want to relocate, all you do is you approach your manager, you say, I'd, I'd like to relocate. Um, uh, and then you fill a relocation form in. You, that has to be signed off by your manager, and then that gets submitted to the, the location you want to move to. And then they will then look at your application, um, and then and then grant it uh, as and when it was as and when it came it came to the, to the time of moving. Interestingly, this isn't in your first year, but as you progress, we have an amazing um, relocation policy. 
um, which actually offers a lot of support, um, both financial um, and in, in terms of helping you find somewhere to live. And I've used that service um, three times over the past um, six years, and it really is an amazing um, amazing service and something that really is quite unique to that sort of family owned own business I think I think it really shows it really shows how much we care about employees the fact we help them kind of move move around if you like um okay let's have a look at see got any other questions so my, my screen has just dropped off um what is your most memorable experience while working at enterprise oh my goodness I've had so many that's a great question by the way that would be a great question um to ask in an interview, you know, that is really, you've, you've, you've got me there. I'm having to think. Uh, most memorable, um, I think moving to Cardiff, I've got four kids, beautiful wife, four kids, and I moved all the family down to down to Cardiff um, sort of four years ago, started a new role with people I didn't know, and that really was a really sort of big life-changing experience for me. So that really was memorable. So yeah, that's probably, probably mine. Great question, by the way. That really was a good question. What are the benefits of working with Enterprise Rent-A-Car? So the benefits, I talk about the three Ps, okay? Now, if these aren't relevant to you, I apologize, but I think one or all of them will be relevant to you. The three Ps, these are my benefits, okay, the three Ps. Before, um, promotion, yeah, so promotion, A, and people. They, they to me are the, the, the three big benefits. You, the, the pay in the package is fantastic. You can really you can really accelerate your earnings um, if you're successful within the graduate um, roles. Um, but also the benefits that come with that are also really good. The people are amazing, and the progression is incredible. We promoted 98% of our so 98% of our global promotions over the past two years came from enterprise stock. We only go outside of the company for tech-based based promotions or law, legal-based promotions where you need specific skills. So it really, really is genuinely um, a company where you can really progress your career, your career um, and sort of, sort of move on. Um, do you have to have a driver's license? Yes, you do. You need to have a driver's license um, to start with us. You could apply to us without a driver's license. All we'd say is you need to make sure that you've got that license when you actually um start with us and the reason why i say that is because so many people's um driving tests etc have been sort of put back or or put on hold due to covid that we've got a lot of people in the application process that would have had a license by now but haven't so we kind of have thought about that so we say you can apply without a license but you would just need to have um have that license when you start with us if that makes sense um uh, um but it is a fundamental part of the the job at, at that early early stage of, of your sort of development and learning. I've just popped in the chat and that's your link. If you couldn't grab the QR code, that's a link to register with us. Um, and does that have been normal or auto? Great question. Um, so if you drive a automatic for medical reasons, then that's fine. But if you if there's not a medical reason why you drive where you've only got an auto license, you would need to be able to drive both, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Um, great questions, by the way. I always get great questions from 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 the, from, the from your your students from from your um, amazing um, university because you you're very employable students because you've often done such wonderful things other than just study and and, and get get educated. I can see a couple of people typing still. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Um... We do have another question. Do you, what if we have a European yeah, license? Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, European licenses are absolutely fine. Um, yeah, European license is fine. Um, as long as, long, what we say about the European license, because they're a bit nuanced with all different countries and stuff. What we say is if you can drive, if you're, if you're entitled to drive in the UK with your license, then, you, then that, that license is fine for us. Um, and I'll leave that for you to determine whether or not your license is valid for for, for UK use. Um, but any like in the, more sort of specific questions like that, just just jump on the on the little link that I've popped in the chat. That's the tiny URL link, and then we can communicate and, and I can answer any questions with you. But yeah, no, no, great. So, and thanks very much for having me on this um, this wet, wet and windy uh, Wednesday afternoon. Thank you for your time, Jamie. It was great as always. Lovely, brilliant. So I jump off now.
Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, lovely, lovely. See you later, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Um, now we will have Sam from our marketing team, and she'll be discussing the um, courses that we have available once you do finish your course. Sam, are you in the conference? I can pass it on to you. Yes, I'm here, Yasmin. I think my camera is just warming up. <laughs> yeah, it's <been> so, <laughs> good. Well, so hi, everybody. I hope the conference has gone well this afternoon um, and you enjoyed the speakers that you've been listening to so far. Um, so my name's Sam. Um, I'm the Senior Schools Liaison Officer here at UCB. So a main part of my job is to kind of go around different colleges um, and different schools as well to kind of talk about the courses that we are we have on offer here. Another part of that is to kind of speak to you guys, so our current students, whether you're a current college student or you're studying an undergraduate degree with us at the moment. So I'm here just to kind of talk about that next step, that progression in terms of the other courses that we offer as well. So you might be aware of our new school structure. So we have the School of Business, Tourism and Creative Industries. And then we've also got School of Health, Sport and Food. So today I'll be talking more about the School of Business, Tourism and Creative Industries. So that's kind of the departments that are in that school. So you've got the Department for Business, Marketing and Finance and then Hospitality and Tourism. So you'd already be studying on a course in one of those departments. So kind of looking at that next level of progression. So if you are a college student with us, these are the next steps. So the undergraduate courses that we offer. And also some of you might already be on these courses if you're an undergraduate student at the moment. So we do have a range of courses um, within this department from our new business management degree and um, also our relatively new finance and accounting course. So that started, I believe, last September. We've also got our brand new computer science course as well, which is starting again this September. So both the business management and computer science are brand new courses for us. We've then also got our marketing management and we also have digital marketing, which is on the next slide as well. And then events management and our business enterprise as well. So as I was saying, the digital marketing is also another undergraduate course that we offer. And then the football business management. So this um, doesn't normally sit, it doesn't sit within this department, but I still wanted to kind of mention it as well today. Um, just for those that may have an interest in the sports industry and want to go down that route, then we do offer the football business management as a two year foundation degree as well. So all of these are available on the website and you can find out more details about them. I'll pop the link to our A set of courses as well at the end of it so you can kind of find out more details. And if you do have any questions along the way, just pop them into the chat box and I'll answer them at the end as well. In terms of those students that are currently on one of our undergraduate um, degrees, we also do have a range of postgraduate qualifications. So you can see here the kind of the postgraduate courses we do offer um, after you completed undergraduate. So the thing with our postgraduate degrees, the majority of them are accredited by the University of Birmingham which is very similar to our undergraduate degrees as well. However, you can also um, complete them. It's more flexible in terms of how you can complete them. So all of these are available full time or part time. So, for example, if you're looking at a full master's, they tend to be um, take you about one and a half years to complete a full master's. And that's if you're doing it full time. If you're doing it part time, then it would take you about two and a half years to complete that. The only kind of exception to that is our finance and accounting degree and um, postgraduate degree. Um, and that for full time, it's one year and for part time, it's two years to complete that one as well. The other thing to note as well is that they do um, have optional up to six months placement. Um, the only exception, again, is finance and accounting. So there are opportunities for placement, but it's not so much as a block or kind of set um, as the others are. But those are all optional, so you don't have to do those if you don't want to. So those are kind of the areas that you can go on to. If you are currently studying an undergraduate degree and you want to know which courses you are eligible for, I do have a list of courses you can progress on to. Um, so if you want to know from your course which courses you can progress on to, just pop it in the chat box and then I can um, show you the spreadsheet so you can have a look at that in a second.
Moving on, so then we have our Department for Hospitality and Tourism. So those that are studying at college with us, um, these are the range of undergraduate degrees that we have. So obviously we've got Aviation and Airport Management and the International Tourism Management. So if you're currently studying maybe cabin crew and going on to travel and tourism, or you're studying our travel and tourism level three, then those are really good kind of progression routes that you can go into at university. We've also got a range of hospitality courses as well. Um, so especially if you're studying our hospitality with events or our food and beverage service at college level, then these are the kind of courses that you can go into. Currently, our hospitality with events management, tourism management, they are separate degrees. However, they are looking at combining those and maybe looking at different pathways within that. That hasn't been confirmed yet, but any details will be on the website of that merge um, and kind of further details about the different pathways. But that's just to give you an idea of what we're currently offering within the hospitality sector. Again, a lot of these have placement opportunities as well, so you can gain that. Um, industry experience as well as developing your knowledge as well um, and then we've also got our international hospitality business management if you're looking more um, about overseas and international um, tourism industries as well. So moving on to the postgraduate level these are the postgraduate courses that we offer um, in the hospitality and tourism department. Again, same with the timings for full time and part time. Also, the placement opportunities as well are the same as what I've mentioned before. And these are really good progressions from those that are kind of currently studying like our aviation and airport management. Getting that level seven qualification in these areas um, is advantageous for you looking to um, get a career and a job out at the end of university as well. I've just seen that Jaden's put international tourism business management. So if you're studying that undergrad, let's have a look. Yeah, so there's a range of our postgraduate courses you can go on to from the International Tourism Business Management. So you can look at things like our enterprise management and um, finance and accounting, gastronomy and food sustainability um, global meetings and events management, hospitality, tourism management and then international hospitality management, international tourism management and also PGCE. So there are a range of different postgrads that you can go on to from that degree course as well. If anyone else has got any, oh yeah, aviation airport management. Yeah, same again, wide range. So you can go on to the aviation management, enterprise management, finance and accounting, global meetings, and then the hospitality or tourism management, international hospitality management, international tourism management, and the marketing management as well. So again, you look at the majority of those in those departments, the majority of those you'll be able to progress on to. Um, so that's really good that say if you're doing aviation at the moment um, but you want to progress in maybe marketing and that's an area you want to go into or even the finance and accounting and want to progress into that then that is an option for you as well. So in terms of kind of um, the finance, so whether you're looking to go to um, to start undergrad or postgrad. So this is predominantly for undergrad students. We do have a student finance booklet um, and that's got everything you need to know in terms of applying for finance and paying for your degree course as well. I'll pop the link to this um, booklet in the chat box afterwards as well, so that you, if you are interested, you can pop into there and read that. We are also offering um, some webinars in student finance because it now has opened for September 2021. So we are running some webinars as well and I'll put the page there where you can find out further information. In terms of funding for postgraduate courses, um, so English students that are looking to study a full master's are eligible for the postgraduate loan from student finance. So what that means is if you go onto the course page, you'll notice that it says master's at MA or MC, MSc. 
um, and that's a full master's programme. However, there are PG dips, which isn't the same level, it's slightly lower level, and you wouldn't be able to get um, the postgraduate loan from student finance for those. And you can see that's what I've put here. So if you're planning to study a full MA, but if you're exempting any more than one or more modules, or you're looking to do the postgraduate diploma, you won't be eligible for the postgraduate loan. So that's really worth noting in terms of if you're looking to get the loan from student finance. Also, if you're looking to do a PGCE, um, then you wouldn't be able to get the postgraduate loan. What it would be, it would go through um, the undergraduate package for student finance. So the course fees for PGCEs are exactly the same as undergraduate. Whereas if you're looking at po other postgraduate qualifications, it's £8,000. So that is slightly cheaper than the undergraduate. Um, but with the PGCE, it comes under your undergraduate finance. So you'd look here if you're looking to do a PGCE. We also have some fee waivers for those that are looking to progress from undergrad to postgraduate um, courses with us. So if you achieve a first class honours degree awarded in the previous academic year, you can get a discount of £1,200 on your tuition fees. And that's for UK and EU students. So that's a nice incentive to make sure you're looking at your grades and kind of achieving that first um, classification. Also, you can get a £600 discount. So if you don't quite get a first class honours, then you can still get a £600 discount if you progress with this onto postgraduate um, straight after your undergraduate degree as well. But also, if you do want to find out more information about a particular course, um, and just find out more about what we offer, kind of the support available, want to look at the admissions to see if you're eligible for those courses, then we do have two open days coming up. So if you're looking to progress to undergraduate, we have an open day on Saturday the 27th of March and that's 11 till 3. If you're interested in progressing to postgraduate, our next open day is Wednesday the 21st of April and that's 6pm till 7.30. You can see the link there. Um, for the open day so you can find out all the details there. I'll also pop that in the chat box so if anybody does want to look on you can do so from that. Yes Miss, we do offer PGCEs. We only offer primary PGCEs though so we don't offer PGCEs in secondary education. And also if you want to um, request a prospectus as well so this is our brand new um, postgrad prospectus so it's nice and shiny um, and you can request a digital copy and that's on the website as well uh, if you just search for request prospectus then you can have a look at further details about the courses in there and then we also do have this new initiative called postgraduate chat ah oh, thanks Shen I'm glad you like it we've been <laughs> it took us a while to design that one um, so we have postgraduate chat so that's where you can actually chat to one of the postgraduate lecturers so on each of the course pages, you'll see that there's a banner um, asking if you want further information or to kind of clarify anything. And that's where you can actually book in a time slot with the lecturer. So you'll see their availability and then you can book um, a web chat with them. And at any time that suits you and they're available and you can book that in yourself. So you don't have to then email them and try and get in contact that way. And then you'll just have a phone call with the lecturer and staff. And they can tell you a lot more about the courses and what you'll actually study on those postgraduate courses as well. So it's definitely worth kind of getting involved with that and having a look on the website. We also have our Unibuddies. So we have that for undergraduate students and also our current postgrad students. So you can chat to a current student that is um, studying one of the courses that you're interested in, find out more about it, what they find interesting, what they're enjoying, um, and kind of get a feel for what it's like to study at postgraduate level here as well. And that's all available on the website. And yeah, so we have a live chat on the website and that's available Monday to Friday, nine till five. So if you do have any questions, you can get in contact with us at any time. And one of the advisors is more than happy to kind of help and um, let you find out more information about it. You could have put our school liaison um, email account as well if you want to drop us an email and got any questions about the postgrad or undergraduate options here at UCB. 
And then that's also our direct number, um, which I'm actually looking after this week. So if you've got any questions, you can always give us a call as well. Does anyone have any other questions in terms of what they can progress on to or the courses that we offer? I've just seen Chung your um, questions. So asking about student finance for international students. Um, so there isn't student finance for international students. Um, I do have the page where it's got about the fees for international students. Um, and let me get that for you. There you go. So all the details about international fees are there. So you can have a look through. Braille? Thank you, Sam. Questions? No problem. Um, yeah, there's there's one more question. Good one. Jaden, so it tends to be um, you'd need to get a 2-2 two -two or above um, to progress on. Um, some of them are two ones as well. Um, so it's worth having a look at the individual entry requirements. But that's normally what we ask for. Well, thanks, everybody. OK, great. Thank you, Sam. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you can um, use the email address that is on the screen. Um, for any questions you may have and take a look at the website as well because we have a lot of information on there about postgraduate school that you may want to go on to um we'd just like to take this time to thank you for attending today and listening to the conference and the employability fair um sabbath's here now as well so we work within hired we are the employee engagement and alumni support officers so we're the ones that um conduct all the careers fairs for you and we are here if you have any questions about any employment opportunities that you may be searching for and we'd be able to pass you on to the right person within the hired team to assist you. So Beth, do you want to add anything? No, so that is just a thank you once again for your time um, and of course for joining for the whole day today. So we hope you found it informative and insightful um, and I hope it went well. So any feedback do let us know. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you. And the session has been recorded as well. Thank you. Thank you.